because if uh, we have a quorum, I think we'll just go on with the meeting. And I'm sure that Supervisor Madrone will join us shortly. All right. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, September 15th meeting of the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors. Uh, this is a virtual meeting pursuant to Executive Order N29-20 by uh, Governor of California. And um, I would like to begin the meeting by asking you to join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so with that, I'll go to uh, CAO Nelson. Are any changes, modifications to the agenda? Good morning. Uh, we have some modifications to the agenda today. Supervisor Bone is pulling the following items for discussion. C10, the fire services ad hoc appointments. C13, bid authorization for the Humboldt County Correctional Facility Accessibility Improvement Project. Item C18, Garberville Library's closure and temporary relocation needs the following corrections. The last sentence in the first paragraph in the discussion section, the library will be handed over to the contractor on September 21st and not September 14th. The second to last sentence in the second paragraph in the discussion section, library services will reopen on Tuesday, September 22nd and not the 15th. The last sentence of this paragraph, the bookmobile will stop in Garberville the first four months, or the first four Thursdays of the month starting Thursday, September 24th and not the 17th. Uh, these corrections are due to wildfires and evacuation orders. The Department of Health and Human Services is pulling item H2, the update on the general relief voucher program, and we'll bring this item back at a later date. Item H3, approval of the Goslin subdiv subdivision was inadvertently placed on the agenda as a departmental item and should be moved to the consent calendar. That concludes the modification for today's agenda. Quite a few modifications. Thank you, CAO Nielsen. So again, to reiterate, uh, C10 and C13 will be pulled. There are corrections on C18. H2 will be coming back at a later time and H3 is moved to the consent agenda. So that will bring us to the consent agenda. Um, we'll, uh, welcome a motion. I'll move that we um, approve the consent agenda. Can you remind me of the two that were removed? Uh, C, uh, the, okay, so C10 and C13 are uh, moved for discussion. All right, uh, minus C10. And, and then... Uh, and then H3 is on the consent agenda. Okay, so uh, I move that we approve the consent calendar minus uh, C10 and C13 with the addition of H3. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Thank you, Supervisor Bass. Um, with that, I'll open it up to public comment. Is there any public comment on our consent calendar? Estelle, Kent Sawatsky, top of the morning to you. Good morning, Kent. Um, I don't believe you can move that to consent when it's already been agendized. There's people who may want to speak on the topic. I probably won't, but I think it's totally improper to put something on consent without the public. I mean, they're looking at your agenda and they're going to see it somewhere down in the meeting. They're not going to be ready to comment on this now. So I don't think you can do that legally. I think it's a lack of transparency, possibly a violation of the Brown Act. You may wish to reconsider and talk to your counsel. So I would like to go ahead and uh, speak on, uh, oh, Rex pulled one or two of them there. So I'd like to speak on C9. It's your, uh, it's your item, which was basically a, a meeting, a summary of a meeting. And it was the Board of Supervisors met to basically consider a public employee performance evaluation position of county administrative officer, that's C9. And I don't know what your policy is, but I made comments before that meeting, multiple comments. You didn't have a quorum. Were those comments repeated to the people who later participated in the meeting? 
uh, your report out was there was no action to report. My request during that meeting, I also had a few other comments, which I guess I'll have to redo some other time. I won't have time now regarding what you can and cannot do when I speak in the public forum. Uh, you can't chill me. Uh, but basically, my suggestion at that time was to put uh, Amy Nielsen on a non-paid administrative leave. That was a consideration because then she can go ahead and resign rather than being terminated. But I'm going to pull that back. My recommendation should have been that she just be, be terminated. My understanding is with cause. It, uh, basically, you guys would have taken a decision at that time. With cause, there would have been no cost to the county. And possibly, if I recall, her contract says uh, she could have been... Uh, terminated without cause and get six months, which is $600,000 or thereabouts. That's, isn't that an interesting number? That's exactly the reason why I think she should be terminated because that's what Jeffrey Blank got. And I think it'd be well worth the 600,000 to move on and get somebody else in there. Hey, but that's just my perception of that. So uh, none of this was mentioned in your staff report, any public comment since I was the only one. I thought I would bring that forward to you at this time. Thank you for my opportunity to speak on your consent. If I have just a second. I wanted to thank you uh, for your reappointment on head waters there i think she's done a great job and uh let's see rex pulled the other one so i guess i don't talk about that uh, project or a couple other things but goslins cannot be on consent you you highly recommend before you move forward you talk to your staff uh your county council Je uh, jefferson there and see whether you can do that without notifying the public or ha or having some way of addressing it later in the meeting thank you for my opportunity to speak it was your mistake not the public's Oh, thank you, Kent. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on the consent agenda? Good morning, Thomas Mulder. I just clarify, you can hear me? Uh, yes, we can, Thomas. I am commenting. Um, I didn't hear everything that was pulled off of consent, but on C-19, is that still on consent? That's still on consent. Um, so my ask, I, I, I don't know how you guys can do this as a policy, but my ask is with all of the uh, trouble our county has gone through in the last, uh, I don't know, in 2020 has been pretty rough between fires, COVID and many other things that are having a financial burden on the county. Um, you guys just just approved a, a small cultivator ordinance. I would hope that that aerial imagery that somehow you guys can set a policy not to send abatement notices for at least 12 months on people that are 2,000 square feet or under to give them time to gather the resources to come into compliance um, and possibly file for a permit. I don't know how you can legally do that, but that would be my request because um, I, I know a lot of people are really, really hurting. So thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, Thomas. Um, any further comment on the um, consent agenda? That concludes public comment on the consent calendar. Thank you. I'll go back to Council Billingsley to clarify the item uh, discussed in public comment, item H3. Thank you, Chair. Council Billingsley. I would recommend that that remain where it is just because there's a potential issue with timing because if someone looked at the agenda, they they wouldn't see that there's no way that that item would currently be considered until after 10 o'clock. So that is a potential timing issue. So I would recommend it could just have a, a brief update and stay where it is to be on the safe side. Thank you very much, Council Billingsley. Uh, that's uh, what I would request the uh, motion to, to to change their motion on. Sure. Uh, I will change my motion to um, put H3 back into the regular calendar. I will say that, I mean, I have seen other boards and commissions move things to consent at the meeting. It's not super unusual, but if uh, if that's the um, the advice of our of our staff at this time, I'm happy to And thank I'm you. Uh, is that okay with the second? Yeah, thank yes. You. Yes. Um, just uh, well, we can clarify that when it comes up. But I, as I understand it, it was basically the wrong button pushed when it was sent into the, the calendar. But anyway, um, okay, we have that now. The consent calendar. I'll go to um, Ryan for a roll call, please. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Yes. Supervisor Bass? Yes. Supervisor Madrone? Yes. Supervisor Bone? Yes. 
and Supervisor Fennell. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate that. So we now move to a time set item. We actually have two that will go one after the other. And after that, we will discuss items removed from the consent agenda. So we'll first go with our update from uh, Health Officer Dr. Frankovich, Director of Public Health uh, Stevens and the Sheriff on the COVID um, pandemic emergency. Welcome, Dr. Frankovich, Hi. Sheriff, Michelle. Thank you, Supervisor Fennell. So um, just a brief update. Um, overall, I think people are seeing in the media that in California, um, hospitalizations and death, um, deaths continue, the rate continues to decrease, which is really um, good news. Um, I think everybody is sort of being cautious because of the recent Labor Day weekend, and we'll see what that looks like. Uh, the 4th of July was problematic but we're hopeful. Um, in Humboldt County, we um, currently, as of yesterday, had 473 cases, a total of six deaths and 26 hospitalizations. Um, of course, in addition to um, COVID, um, as you mentioned, we're dealing with the fire situation. And um, again, our hearts go out to people in the community dealing with some of the conditions out there. And um, I know uh, Ryan Derby will be updating the board after my report. Uh, public health's role in this has been primarily in the nursing support um, for uh, evacuees as well as uh, COVID prevention measures, just trying to inform the process. So locally, um, we have um, had about 80 cases in the last 14 days. Uh, we've had four new hospitalizations and two additional deaths in that time period. Uh, we currently have 59 people in isolation and uh, 207 people in quarantine uh, related to those cases. So um, clearly um, takes a lot of resources um, on the um, contact investigation teams. But I believe it's one of the key reasons we're doing as well as we are here um, is that we're really aggressively um, investigating all of these cases at this point still. And that's not true across the state, um, just because of the large volume that have not been able to do that. Um, about 63% of our cases are contacts to known cases right now, 21% travel, 13% community transmission. And mean age is 36 years, so we're still skewing younger on this, and our doubling time is about 43 days. So um, a couple things I wanted to mention, we're now operating under the new um, state framework with the tier system. We are in the orange tier um, and we are one of, I think um, today the state reports out these um, tiers again. They're reviewing data on Mondays um, and uh, they are reporting out on Tuesdays. So our numbers now, um, it looks like we'll be one of about nine counties in this orange level. There are two in the yellow level, um, which is the least restrictive. Um, the remainder are in red or purple on um, tier one or two. Um, so I, I think this week we will remain in the orange tier um, with our case rate at about 3.9 um, initially. Uh, four is the cutoff to move to the red tier. So we're a little close there. Um, we, because we have been testing at such a high rate in our county, uh, well above the state uh, median, um, we actually get like a little adjustment factor that brought us down to 3.7 on their um, calculations. Um, our positivity remains under 2%, which is really good. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, you know, for this current week, we look fine um, in terms of operations as usual, although we'd love to get down to yellow. That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I did want to mention is that with our current data, you know, when the state reports this, they report right now, they're reporting on data that goes through September 5th. So there's like a seven day lag on the data with a few days for data analysis. So it's, and the reason for that is that CalReady is sort of the state surveillance system. It takes time for um, some of the labs to download into that system. And so, um, you know, they, that's why they use that seven day lag to try and get as many of results from that period into the system before they look at the data. I do wanna let you know, that we look at this week to week with current data. And it always gets, it's constantly being revised as new things come in. But, you know, we're concerned because this, you know, for this past week, we were looking at being at that four um, level. 
And, um, and again, over this coming week before that data gets refined, you know, I don't know what will happen. Additional negative tests coming into the system may change that, but I just want people to be aware that we're dancing very close to that line. And I think it's really incredibly important um, for all of us and for our business community that we remain in this orange tier or better. Um, and so again, we're just encouraging people um, to adhere to all the things that we've been talking about um, so that we can continue to do well. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, Dr. Is, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Supervisor Bass has her hand up. So I was sure. just wondering, did you want to ask? No? Yes. I did because I don't want to forget this. I wrote it down, but um, I was on a call last night and like you're saying, we're really dangerously close to, sl uh, close to slipping. Um, and there was a conversation, you know, San Diego went from purple into red. Now this week they're going back to purple. But um, we were on the phone and you probably have had the same conversation um, with Dr. Galley and um, some others from the governor's office. And what they said, or at least what we understood, and I wanted to ask you if this is accurate, is just because you know San Diego's example, their data puts them back in purple. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have to stay in purple for the full three weeks at that point. It's like they have to be in there for a period of time. It's not like you slip down and you're permanently there is what it sounded like. So, um, and you may not have that answer right now, um, but if you do a clarification, mm -hmm. it'd be nice. Cause I know it made the San Diego folks feel a little more comfortable that they didn't have to tell their businesses to ratchet down that quickly, but right. we might have been misunderstanding what was. No, and, and, you're, and you're right, Supervisor Bass, it is, it, you know, part of this whole framework that they've constructed is it's not a single week measure. So you have to be in that tier for two weeks by your measurements. Um, and then before you would move into another tier, you also do get to talk to the state, you know, about what the data looks like, what what's driving those numbers. So, you know, especially in the really small counties, um, you know, it's they're really trying to avoid this where the difference of a handful of cases can move you from one tier to another. Um, we're big enough that we're not impacted in quite that way. Um, but certainly if there were some considerations we thought should go into it because of where our cases are, we would take that argument to the state. Um, but we do, so a single week on here does not move us, um, but it's a good heads up for us to sort of go, okay, <laughs> we need to really be careful about where we are. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Was there anything? Yeah, I know yeah. we kind of interrupted you. Oh, sure. A couple, just a couple things I was going to mention. The state is also going to be adding in a social equity measure. Um, they have not provided the final um, language on this, but the idea is to ensure that all areas of your community, um, you know, that for instance, communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, making sure we're getting everybody tested. Um, and so the preliminary data on that for the framework they're looking at, we look very good um, because of the volume of testing we're doing across our county. But, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll update you when we actually get the final parameters for how they're going to measure this. It looks like it will be sort of looking at positivity rates in sort of the highest use or um, in, the, in different census tracts of the county. So we'll see how that looks. Um, the other thing they're going to be putting out some messaging on shortly, I think, is gatherings. Um, and so that will, we've been looking forward to that and, and pushing for some clarity on that in terms of messaging. So I, I'd be surprised if we don't see something within a week on gatherings from the state. And then the last thing I did want to update on is just testing locally. Um, because again, I think a couple of the big underpinnings here are, are the contact investigation and testing. So our lab is doing very well. Um, we're, we're testing um, our capacity on a daily basis. Um, can, is, can be over 200 um, if needed, depending on how the samples come in. Um, Optum is doing very well. Um, our EOC folks have just worked incredibly with that to keep us optimally using our Optum site. Um, and so we're doing very well and getting good numbers with that. Um, Optum, currently the state did extend the contract is my understanding through October for Optum and the turnaround times in Optum are much looking much better. Um, we're actually getting some turnaround times there in that three day time frame, which is excellent. Um, but we are, um, as we announced, working on a, a regional testing uh, strategy with uh, Del Norte County and UIHS and tribal partners. 
that is really exciting. Um, and it's it's possible for us, the big, I'm sure people have heard of the, the state will be setting up like a, a big lab um, with uh, Perkin Elmer equipment. It's um, a PCR um, setup for testing. And they're gonna be doing that in Southern California, potentially one further in Northern California. We are getting that same equipment here in Humboldt. Um, and we are going to be operating our own collection process here and our own online platform for scheduling. And we will be running the tests here and we expect turnaround times that are in that 24 to 72 hour period. So it's very exciting. We um, expect that that will be, um, we're hoping that will be operational in October. Um, and we're already getting pieces of equipment. Um, UIHS is working on their um, site for housing the equipment and uh, HSU has stepped in to assist as well. So we are really, um, it, it, it's taking a lot of collaborative planning, but I think it's gonna be an incredible solution for our county because basically between this and our lab, uh, we will have a, a, the ability to run about seven, 800 specimens a day. Um, capacity for um, Del Norte and Humboldt County. So with a really good turnaround time and not having to ship anything out of the county. So it's it's a really cool partnership. And I think uh, that will place us uh, well in terms of entering flu season and such. So um, kudos to all the partners on that group. And that's so, all I um, mentioned today. Any uh, questions from the board? Uh, any any update from the sheriff or from Director Stevens on um, the COVID emergency, Sheriff Director? Just briefly, you know, we're still approving business com um, compliance, and and that's going well. Twenty seven hundred businesses have registered. Um, still have the compliance line, uh, and our EOC is still um, very very active on the, the COVID emergency and. Uh, and I'm thankful because of all the testing that we're able to do, that uh, our numbers are favorable. And uh, so working together with public health uh, through all this has been, um, you know, it's going very, very well. So again, simultaneously running two emergencies, two EOCs, it's a, a challenge, but um, the personnel that we have in there have done an excellent job um, with managing both of these emergencies and, and still getting the messaging out there and everything that we need to do. So thank you. It's, it's been incredible you, and the workload is huge. I have to say the, the between the JIC and the um, doing the business reviews and the, they've done an amazing job at being able to advise um, many of these businesses on getting through all of this. And uh, as well as, you know, helping with events and things like that, helping people craft things that are safe and fit within um, orders, which has been really incredibly helpful. Thank you, Dr. Frankovich. Um, Director Stevens, anything to add? No, not today, thanks. Thank you. Um, with that, any further questions, uh, Supervisor Bone? Yeah, I, I just have two that I've, I've had called in. One of them is, are we one of the only counties that do this business review that has a team doing the businesses having to influx and not just doing it online? I keep hearing that from other counties. Is that right? You hear a lot of things, but we're the only ones, I mean, you talk to them all. Are we the only yeah. ones having to have a team re register? You know, honestly, Supervisor Bowen, I don't know. Um, I know it's it's really evolved over time. When we first started, Tehama was um, having submissions online and reviewing all plans. I don't know if they're still doing that. Um, so I really don't know. Um, all businesses have to create a plan. Um, I think the, the thing that we bring to it is um, they have to develop it and post it, um, is that we provide that assistance for them in actually creating a good plan. So I think that's been really um, useful for our community and a great service we've been able to offer. But I don't know how universal it is. I honestly don't. Okay, I'm just wondering as we handle these other emergencies, we have so many county staff doing this and sometimes we're going to have to go back to county business somewhere and, and try to streamline as much as possible the other question is is um how tragic it is that we have deaths at all everybody was really confused about the report on the fifth death he owned a house here he didn't get sick here didn't i mean i couldn't make heads or tails was the fifth death a resident here that got transferred out because of covid or um, 
it was just confusing and, and I, I i don't think it means it means a lot to the family and them but i don't think it means anything to our numbers it was just rather confusing and i just people were asking how that how sure. that number came about yeah and it, it's i get i you know it is it's an odd situation but it it all really comes down to your assigned county of residence um, it's not something we have control over locally. Um, it's assigned on a death certificate. Um, and so essentially, even if someone has lived outside the area for many months um, and even has no intention of returning, if their residence of record or their family attributes their residence of record to Humboldt County, that's where the case resides. And that's that's just the state reporting system. We have no control over that. that question asked so, and answered, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. uh, Supervisor, Supervisor Bass. Thanks. I actually have a follow-up related to that, but not necessarily, you know, to the death category. And this comes, you know, in my mind from hearing what's happening in San Diego. And uh, on the phone call last night, their uh, CEO was really concerned because, you know, the uh, they had a, a fairly large outbreak at San Diego State University. I think over 600 or something. It was pretty high but pretty contained within you know the system but the question I was having hearing you talk is so San Diego was getting kind of like credited with those you know illnesses as far as they're being punished I shouldn't say punished but they're being gauged on those but if it actually goes back to the residence of record a lot of students don't necessarily I mean their residence of record is still somewhere else so I was I was curious if you heard anything regarding that um, since we we've been really fortunate we have you know a university and a junior college that seem to be doing pretty well mm -hmm. but if something like that were to happen it's called the residence of the record for uh, you know an organization like that yeah and there are all these odd conventions typically it has been um, you know for obviously the people renting apartments and homes here their residence is here um, the students in the dorms you're correct I mean obviously there are home addresses for a lot of these um, students but they do when they move here and reside here in the dorm for the academic year um, for our purposes they do reporting purposes they do become part of the community um, and count in our numbers Thank you, Dr. Frankovich. Any further questions? Well, I had a question, uh, I, and I know that we'll, we're going to be having a whole presentation on the fire emergency coming up shortly, but I uh, have been asked, um, does the fact that there's a lot of smoke in the air uh, make, it, make people more vulnerable should they contract uh, the COVID infection? Well, um, well, I think that we don't have evidence about whether smoke increases your risk of acquiring the infection, but certainly if you're having respiratory um, issues because of a COVID infection, you know, I would think the smoke could be a complicating factor for that. Just as, um, you know, again, for people who have asthma, you know, it can, the smoke itself can be a trigger. Um, so if you have already have some um, respiratory compromise from whatever the source, I think it, it can make your course more challenging for sure. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, if there are no further questions, I'm going to go to uh, public comment on this item. And uh, for most, I see two hands up. I believe they're probably people who know the process, but um, you can press star nine to come in um, to join the conversation. So with that, I believe we have well, two and Ryan, can you let the first caller in, please? I really like the questions coming from the board. Um, uh, when it's mentioned, you know, that this is out of our control regarding stats and how they're done. I'm self-diagnosed autistic and nothing is out of our control. We can, we can always raise objections, strongly suggest that you do. My understanding is that uh, if a student comes up here, his place of record is where he votes. And if he doesn't re-register to vote here, then that's his place. But maybe I'm misinformed about that. Uh, again, I was curious about the person. In other words, if I were to go to Mexico for six months and die down there, it would affect your records from what it sounds. And that's wrong. I mean, that needs to be fixed at the state level or wherever it is so that it's reflected correctly. Uh, the 
the count that always bothers me, which doesn't seem to be out there, it says total hospitalized. Well, that's total during whatever time period we have now, as far as I can tell. We would like to know how many are currently hospitalized because that's telling us where our deaths may go and the seriousness of how it's been affecting us here. And, and one of the biggest things I would like to see if you're going to the county is that the same policies for all of our interaction be based upon what we're able to do in the airports and on the airlines, which is basically elbow to elbow as long as you're wearing the correct uh, mask and uh, you're basically same with the seating and it's elbow to elbow. So I um, got three phones chasing me here. Anyway, that's what I would like to see. Go ahead and get clarification on that. And uh, uh, that's the uh, same, same thing. It's just everybody's right close together. And I don't understand why that can't be a guiding principle as far as how airlines and airports are treated. So uh, again, from the autistic viewpoint, why questions are great. If you don't like a policy, please go ahead and lobby and change it so it's more functional. My, my wife's right now across the across the, uh, my yard, uh, spending six hours a day with my uh, granddaughter, basically educating her because there's two high needs kids. They need to be back in school. Thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, we do have an, two other callers. Um, Ryan will let, the, uh, let you in. You'll hear a cue and you can begin to speak. I believe you should press star six. So, welcome caller. Hello, my name is Catherine Motor. Can you hear me? Catherine, uh, yes, we can hear you. Why can grown-ups play sports and I can't play basketball, baseball, or soccer? Thank you. Is that all? We'll, uh, any questions will be answered when we close public comment. Okay, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, we, the next caller, um, you should again press star six when you're allowed into the queue. Welcome. Hello, uh, Thomas Mulder here. That was my son, Tyson Mulder, just before me. He asked me that question, so I told him to call in, so hopefully he can actually get an answer. Um, I, I read a couple reports uh, Dr. Frankovich was supporting in schools. There was a story in Time Standard. I would like to, as someone uh, that believes it's very important for children's social and emotional skills to have in, in-person school, it would be nice to see a, a bigger report and uh, follow up on that more because I know there's a lot of pushback from some areas in the community to have children in school. Um, that was a weird, this meeting is being recorded now. Um, it's something I really, really support as a parent and as a community person. So it'd be nice to have some follow up from the health department on what the actual risks are for children. Um, and thank you for my opportunity to speak on this topic. Thank you. I don't believe we have any further uh, public comment on this item. Ryan? Nope. Yes, that's okay. correct. That well, concludes it, public comment. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, bring it back to the board. Any additional uh, questions or comments? Um, Supervisor Bone. Yeah, I do. I and I would love to uh, if Dr. Frankovich could give any. I know we. I know we don't have an off ramp for this thing, but. Um, emotional anguish amongst parents and children I, I i really worry about that extremely worry about that and i i wonder if that has come into the play or do we just you know our, our i see our our age is the mid-30s which is good which is going to keep people out of the hospitals and keep people because they're basically the hung, younger people are healthier but do you see anything along those lines about releasing some of this so some of these kids can get out and Actually, I mean, I know we can jump up and down singularly with a group of 12, but I mean, actually play games. Yeah, well, I, and I'm sorry, I missed part of your question. You were frozen, Supervisor Bone, but um, to, the, to the youth sports, 
um, and to the question, the caller um, that uh, asked about this, you know, I, I agree, there's a bit of a disconnect between having, you know, pro teams playing and, uh, you know, kids not being able to. I don't know what measures they've put in place, whether they're cohorting and housing these folks, I don't know. Um, I think at, we've had this discussion multiple times at the state level. Um, the concern, of course, is, again, bringing together kids from multiple households in close contact where you can't distance. Um, and just, you know, but all I can tell you is that this has been an evolving process and we have kept pushing for guidance that sort of broadens and allows things and, um, you know, that are reasonable. So we keep having the discussion and um, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere along the way here, um, if we get to a stable place that they're going to be able to um, allow some mixing and in, in ways that we have not before. Um, in the school setting, they're doing that with cohorts and uh, I'm hopeful, but at this point, we are under the state orders on this and they're more restrictive. And then through the chair, yes, I think, and I, I didn't see it, but I, I think it was at the beginning of August or it's been quite a while ago, uh, the public health officers of this region or Northern California or basically the rural end of it, sent a letter to the governor requesting some sort of Maybe, I don't know, division or at least a different set of eyes on our rural areas, because I think of the 11 people that are in the two lower tiers, I think nine of them are in this northern end of the state. So um, they were trying to set up their own little basis to work out. Did you, did you guys get a response to that letter or um, the gist yeah. of the letter? To that? Not <laughs> Not much. Did and, and did you release that letter to the board? I, I went looking everywhere. I couldn't see where I, we saw it. So yeah, no, and, and I'm sorry, we can provide that letter. It was it's actually the Rancho group that did it. There are our regional health officers and the issue centered around restaurants. And it was really just the issue with moving to outdoor only. Um, it was a huge issue, in, um, especially for places like Modoc and Shasta, where the temperatures were so high that it was really impossible to do outdoor dining. So in spite of them having relatively okay case counts, they really couldn't have restaurants operating um, because of that problem. And so uh, the letter to the governor was simply on behalf of Rancho to say, in, the, in this situation with restaurants, we would appreciate having discussions with the state about um, whether, whether we can customize a little bit for some of, some of the counties that are facing specific issues with being able to do this. So, but in answer to your question, really nothing came out of that. Um, yes, and I think they made it clear with the new CDC study that just came out the M in the MMWR about the fact that um, in when they looked at, uh, in a large study looking at COVID cases, that um, if in identified cases, I believe in hospitalized cases, although I'm not certain, there was a, uh, it was, they were twice as likely to have been in a restaurant in the preceding 14 days. The state has said that they're not doing waivers about restaurants um, in this instance. So. Yeah, I read, I read that CD. They only asked 364 people too. So that was a pretty low, it was a pretty low uh, sampling. Um, but my thing is, would you guys entertain sending another letter again about the Northern region we're doing so well up here about, you know, maybe being on our own a little bit more and, and being, because we're doing so well, because we are doing our job. I yeah. mean, we, we're, we're not we're not doing what LA and we're not having the large, the extreme large gatherings and things. I mean, we're, we're, we're paying for the sins of others up here and financially, emotionally, you know, um, I don't I don't know how much longer our people can survive up here. And the problem is back there, they have a lot to fall back on. When it comes time to open the doors here, there's going to be a lot of people not on the other side of those doors. And I think that has that has me concerned anyway. And and I I can't say, but I would like to support another letter, or support you guys sending another letter, and I will contact some of the other counties to see if they would like to. Well, it's a I mean it's obviously it's a huge worry for all of us, and I think people are being hugely impacted across the state. Obviously, the um, actually uh, Supervisor Bone, we we have now. We now actually have regional meeting that um, we just had our first meeting um, with a representative from the state that is meeting with us. And they're doing this with each of the regions across the state so that we can provide that specific feedback about our area, um, some of our concerns and requests. And I think that may be a better vehicle 
to actually be able to kind of further the discussion. Um, up till now, it's been primarily us all on calls with the entire state, um, the health officers, and it's hard to get your specific issue addressed. And I think this is gonna allow us in a small group to be able to convey that um, to the state. And so I'm hopeful with that. Um, and uh, I'll, we, I, I can keep you posted on that as well. I think Wait. it's likely to get a better response. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Frankfurt. Uh, Supervisor Bass. Yeah, uh, to tag on to Supervisor Bone, um, um, on the call last night, it was a fairly small group of counties, but included actually more rurals than a lot and suburban. And, you know, the conversation was, you know, if if there isn't some latitude pretty soon that's afforded different communities, um, it could get really ugly, you know, because we know that there's some places that are on the edge of, I don't want to say going rogue, but of just going and doing what they want to do. And so we are trying to, um, we're going to have potentially even twice weekly calls with them now from the standpoint of just to keep them kind of abreast of what's going on in the community because they don't know unless we actually get a chance to talk with them and to tell them. And I'm sure, and some of Supervisor Bones um, from the RCRC group were included on this one. So I think, I think there's going to be um, a lot more conversation of you know, how do we do this? Well, one, so they don't switch switch uh, the rules on us like so frequently and not give us enough time to actually even, you know, share that with our communities. But then also recognize that, you know, some of us probably can have the latitude and, and we, we, you know, people need to feel that they have somewhat control of their destiny, whether that's individuals or community members. And so I, I think, it wouldn't hurt. I, I appreciate Supervisor Bones, you know, comment, and I, I think we just should always just try to assert that, you know, not in a bad way, but assert that some counties are doing pretty well, and hopefully someday the leash will be taken off, so we do have a little more latitude. Um, perhaps some type of system where we could be released. That sounds really awful, um, but then have some kind of mechanism that if a county goes gets too many, you know, I don't know cases, whatever it said it then have to then then have to claw back i don't know i'm just thinking they've got to give a little more um thought to giving credit to communities who are really trying to do the right thing mm -hmm. and uh, i don't want to be in their shoes i mean it's hard enough sitting here i can't even imagine yeah being at the level. well i mean i think the ongoing discussion is important for sure and i also just think you know again with where we're sitting with our cases I think you know we we really just have to be focusing really hard on on controlling um, you know like em, embracing again all the prevention things we've been talking about because I I don't want to see us moving into a more restrictive tier so um, so hopefully we'll Thank be able you. to hold on and perhaps improve our our where we're sitting. Supervisor Wilson. Thanks. I want to. I really appreciate the report and. Um, I do, I do have, you know, this aching concern that um, with that supervisor bone reflected, which is like kind of where does this end and what's the other side look like and what, you know, what happens when you open the doors and I, I appreciate there's a lot of anxiety about that. I, I do appreciate that. I do want to talk, just answer a little bit on, I, I do disagree with like the idea that there's no space for activity for our youth between jumping up and down in place, as Rabbi Bone put it, and organized youth sports in the context of the way that they've always been. There is a lot of space between those two things for, for activities, for outdoor activities for our youth, and even some that involve some interaction with, uh, with, with uh, other kids. And I've seen it with our uh, summer camps um, this summer and I've seen them and, and I've seen it all around. So there is just a lot of creativity in there and there's a lot of space for activity and, and social interaction it does exist. Mm -hmm. And, and to the, to the question specifically about why we're seeing sports on television versus what's, what's required. Um, I would give one example, which is if you, if you know, if you just, there's a, the New York times has a podcast called the daily, um, you can, it, it has, it has a wonderful report about the NBA. The NBA is completely sequestered in Orlando, Florida on the Disney resort. Every player, the press, 
all the tech staff, everybody is on one place and they can't leave. <laughs> like they, yeah. and they're tested virtually every day. Um, it, it is a pretty extreme situation um, in terms of like why, uh, why there's a difference, you know, and, and I, it is a, it's a, fan, uh, a fascinating podcast to listen to uh, this radio report done by the reporter who's in that bubble. And I recommend listening to it because um, it's definitely a time capsule for, you know, uh, in terms of what we're going through as a society and the extremes that are being uh, done to maintain that um, business venture, which is the NBA. And I, I think that the other uh, sports, professional sports teams, and I have friends who are working in them, they're all sequestered uh, uh, as techs in those things. And it's, um, it's pretty extreme. So there is a, there is, a, there is a big difference between what you see on television and what we're trying to, you know, grapple with in our day-to-day -day life. That being said, I really want us to get to a place where we can have contact <laughs> in real sports. I just, I don't want to, I don't, I, I, there's no, um, yeah. So that's it. That's all I got. Yeah. And to your point, um, Supervisor Wilson, I think, um, that, you know, and that, that's great to have that clarification on the pro teams. You know, it's just that vast difference in resources um, to be able to ensure safety. Um, and But I get that for kids on the ground, it feels like a really big, like, what the heck is going on? Um, and so, um, again, it, it, it's that changing, bringing together people, which, as we pointed out repeatedly, is just launching clusters of cases. And so it, it's problematic. I completely agree that, um, you know, when we've, again, when the JIC has been working with groups who want to do some youth sports, the groups have been really appreciative of the fact that there are some things they can do that let the kids out be out there and participate in um, the, a sport that they like. It might look different, um, but they get to be out there and they get to be with other kids. So I, I, I think there's room there. Of course, we all long to be back to exactly how we were able to do this before, but it's gonna take a while. Thank you, Dr. Frank, for uh, Supervisor Bone. Yeah, I didn't, and I didn't mean just up and jump up and down, but I, but I do manage and run a youth sports facility that averages a little over 700 games at 2,400 practices, 2,800 practices a year. And I can tell you, I have had very few games and the ones that were out there, I guess were, I didn't kind of realize or were taking place with the, with baseball, but with that being said, I've had a few gyms, I've had a few gymnastics things have their separate and everything else. But what I'm saying is I, I impact between youth football, humble youth soccer, um, all the little leagues, there's approximately, you know, four to 6,000 kids involved. And I know they didn't all go to summer camps. And that's what I'm saying. I would say 90% of these kids did not have and why I appreciate the summer camps that have the 10 member summer camps that have taken place and all the efforts done on that. The majority of 90% or more kids are not getting a lot of interaction and then without school. And, and what, what interaction these kids are having is being regulated. I mean, is being regulated. I mean, I remember the days of coming home when the street lights came on, so I'm really old. Um, but what I'm saying is those things, I just, I didn't have a lot of regulations. I just got to go play with my friends. You can't play with Tommy because he's got four friends over there. I mean, look, that's, that's my concern is the amount of fear and the amount of negativity these kids hear on a daily basis. And I just want an end result when the hell the kids can be kids again. And, and, and that's, you know, go to school, do normal. I mean, we, we tell our kids, get off the computer, get off the computer. Now we tell them, okay, you have to do everything on the computer. Your social life, your educational life, everything is on the computer. And I just, I that's not what I, I envision our next generation having to put up with. I got three grandkids and I worry I worry about that. And that's, that's why I say that. I, and I applaud the summer camps that Eureka and all these other places made, but there's a lot of kids not getting served by, and we somewhere they have to be in the equation. I know it worries all of us, but we're doing stuff about other things that worry us. We need to start, you know, expanding our wings to see, you know, what what is available for these kids. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Bone. Um, Supervisor Madrone. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Great. Um, 
you know, I was just realizing that we're, you know, while Humboldt's been generally doing pretty good, we're no longer just the Humboldt community with the heat, the smoke, the fires. We've got thousands of people come into our county to evacuate, um, you know, not just from Southern Humboldt evacuating to the fairgrounds, but uh, people coming from Butte County, from the Central Valley, from Redding, from Sonoma, you name it. We have thousands of people that are coming into Humboldt County now to uh, evacuate and to try and stay safe and get some fresh air. Um, and so I was thinking that it might be really useful to double down on our educational efforts at the lodging facilities in the sense that we require them to provide a handout to visitors when they're checking in to go over all the safety precautions that we're asking people to do. Um, I suspect that, you know, there's some signs in the hotels and uh, in the lobbies and here and there and this and that, but I just think with this massive influx of visitors, it might do as well as a community to try and double down on education with those visitors. So other than that, thank you for all your work, everybody. Thank you, Supervisor Madron. Well, really appreciate the um, discussion here. We do have another time set item of also emergency nature. So really appreciate that. And uh, thank you, Dr. Frankovich. Thank, thank you, you. Dr. Mr. Stevens, Sheriff, for all of the work that you're doing. And we're going to learn just how much the EOC is uh, tasked with today. Um, so again, thank you. And we'll go to our next item. This is an update on the fire emergency declared and a ratification of the uh, de declaration of emergency. Uh, I'll go first to the sheriff. Welcome, sheriff. Thank you, Chair Pinnell. Uh, it's been a, a dynamic week. Um, and uh, last Tuesday, we were notified in the middle of the night about uh, fire in the August complex um, that has uh, primarily been burning in um, in Lake Mendocino, Calusa, um, and um, Trinity counties. And, um, and we got notified that it was affecting Humboldt County and that Humboldt County residents would need to be potentially evacuated. Evacuation warning was issued in the middle of the night last, last Tuesday. Um, and it's been um, a, uh, uh, a roller coaster since then, I would say that. Um, last Wednesday, uh, I applaud. I just want to do a couple things. First of all, well, um, uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of briefly go over our uh, how we've deployed the local emergency and the things that have been happening. I want to turn it over to Chief McCray, Chief Bellier, and uh, Chief Hopkins to give us an overview of the Cal Fire effort, and then finish up with uh, our EOC manager Ryan Derby talking about what's happening locally. But uh, just to kind of give a snapshot of what we knew at the time uh, last Wednesday. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, Chief McCray made a, uh, uh, an emergency decision to branch off and to go and start fighting this fire in the state resource area of Southern Humboldt. Uh, we had some brave um, uh, firefighters from Cal Fire working with locals to create dozer lines and extinguish the fires that were right on the border of Humboldt County and, um, and getting ready to jump essentially the Eel River, the main stem, and um, and to make its way into Humboldt. So the brave efforts from these, these firefighters that worked 96 plus hours straight to, uh, to essentially save our county was, uh, was phenomenal. So I just want to just applaud their efforts. And, um, and so they did a, a fantastic job. So I just wanted to just thank you on that. Um, we have two fires that are affecting Humboldt County, the Red Salmon Complex, which is up in Northern Humboldt, that's right on um, the edge and uh, of the Hoopa Valley Reservation. Uh, is a fire that's about 90,000 acres, uh, about 16, 18% contained. And uh, I'm thankful to report that um, through the efforts of US Forest Service and the Hoopa Valley Reservation Fire Department um, and all the efforts up there and the back burning, they have really created a good zone to protect the, the Hoopa Valley Reservation. Um, they are not under an evacuation warning right now um, because of all the efforts. And uh, so we're in constant communication with their Office of Emergency Services and, uh, and their efforts up there. So they're done a, a, a fabulous job up there and the fire is pushing south. Our biggest um, issue is the August complex. They've renamed it, it was the Hopkins fire. Now it's August complex west. 
And, um, and so that's our biggest concern. This is the biggest fire in state of California history, 800,000 acres. And, um, and so it affects uh, Lake Mendocino Glen, Tehama, Trinity and Humboldt County. And uh, so uh, we saw the effects of the smoke. We saw the effects of potential fire. We have uh, a lot of evacuations. Uh, we know about 600 families have been affected by these um, or 600 persons, I should say, affected in the evacuation area. And we created a nice um, large evacuation warning area just based upon um, the conditions that are on the ground. We currently have roadblocks up uh, managed by California Highway Patrol um, and uh, actively providing information regarding the, uh, the efforts that have been ongoing there. Um, we do have, uh, we have set up a temporary evacuation point at the Humble County Fairgrounds. I do want to thank um, the uh, American Red Cross and also um, Pay It Forward Humboldt for managing the donations as well as DHHS for assisting us with the sheltering. Um, it is a ongoing effort and, um, and they've done um, uh, a good job with coordinating with our EOC and, um, and that kind of thing. I do want to touch on also the fact is that EOC is typically managed by three personnel. And, um, and so we have, again, two EOCs running now, and the county has reached a lot of different divisions to pull people in as disaster service workers. And they're working, again, two EOCs, and they're done, they've done a, um, a good job of trying to coordinate all this effort, and uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chief McCray, Chief Hopkins, and Chief Bellier to discuss um, the current fire conditions on the ground and what we're doing. And then after that, um, uh, EOC Director uh, Ryan Derby will, will, will discuss uh, what we're doing with the EOC, then also update on um, uh, temporary passes um, uh, into the evacuation area that Blanding and Billing are currently doing right now. So, uh, Chief McCray, take it over. Well, good morning. Well, thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. Um, uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to give you a situational briefing on the uh, current situation. And what I'd like to do is uh, start off with a state overview. But before I do that, um, I am sincerely indebted to the services of our cooperators, the CAL FIRE employees, the CAL FIRE incident management team, and the public. The public who's been impacted, the public who sees what's going on, um, the patience and support we receive from the public is what drives us to finish this uh, emergency and bring it to an end. So with that, um, I'd like to give you a statewide perspective. Um, currently there are 25 large fires and or complexes in the state of California. Over 3 million acres have been burned. 25 fatalities have been incurred. Um, this effort has required approximately 16,000 firefighters to control the situation and we're far from done in completing that mission task. So with respect to that, um, another note of uh, importance and uh, scale of what we're facing, five of the largest 20 fires in our state history have occurred in 2020. And as Chief Hansel uh, explained, the August complex is the largest fire in state history. That fire has intruded into the Humboldt Del Norte Cal Fire Unit and um, I am so grateful to the efforts that were made in the initial intrusion into our unit to present to us an opportunity to stop the fire in what I would term a near miracle with the limited resources we had and the absolute dedication of our CAL FIRE folks, our local volunteer fire departments in our communities. So thank you for, for that start to, uh, to all of those people who made this happen. Um, so a little bit more with respect to this, um, in our Humboldt Del Norte unit, which includes Del Norte County, Humboldt County, and the far western reaches of Trinity County, we have three major fires. Uh, the northernmost fire is located in uh, Siskiyou and Del Norte County, as well as Oregon. Um, that fire, we have a uh, CAL FIRE agency rep assigned to it to monitor um, the fire's progress and coordinate um, plans and possibly responses with the United States Forest Service and their incident management team. The second fire to the south, as Chief Hansel described, is the Red Salmon Complex. That fire um, is, uh, has made uh, some spreads in all directions. Fortunately, the western front of that fire has been um, somewhat mitigated through the efforts of the Forest Service and the uh, Hoopa Tribal Fire Departments. So that's uh, some promising news there as well. The last one, the August complex, I will refer to the uh, incident management team 
to explain the details and situational update for that fire that we are currently very actively engaged in. Um, so to put things in context, um, the statewide fire service as well as the national fire service simply got knocked down. Um, the situation as I describe it now is we're not up on our feet, but in the last few days with the stability of the weather and more resources coming into our areas, we've got one foot on the ground now. So we still have a long ways to go. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Incident Management Team 3 Operations Section Chief Kevin Bohall. Chief Bohall. Uh, good morning, Kevin Bohall, uh, Operations Section Chief for the Humboldt Operations of the West Zone of the Mendocino Complex. So uh, to kind of understand the broad range of what we've got going here, we actually have three different zones for this complex. We have the North Zone and the South Zone, which are both under area command. And then we have the West Zone, which is uh, a, a work, uh, we're working together with uh, two CAL FIRE Incident Management Teams, CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 5 and CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3. Uh, to work this piece of the fire. Um, those three, uh, that zone, the west zone, is actually broke up into three operational areas. And uh, we're going to try uh, with the map here to get it where you guys can see it. And we're going to show you those operational areas before I specifically talk about Humboldt operations, which is the part that affects Humboldt County. So bear with us on the, uh, the videography here. So the southern corner of the west complex is Mendocino Operations, and they're based out of Ukiah, and they're working up the northern part up to Covalo, and Covalo Operations is the piece between Mendocino and Humboldt Operations. Currently, the operation that we're doing that we're calling Humboldt is actually all within Trinity County. There's no fire currently in uh, Mendocino, or excuse me, Humboldt County for this specific um, operational area. So as far as progress, the piece that was closest to the Eel River, that's east of the Eel River, we currently have line on that piece within Trinity County that's within the state response area. From the state response area going into the federal DPA, which is the area that's under their direct protection, we're taking line currently all the way to the Mad River. Within the next two days, we should have direct line from Ketton Palm all the way to the Mad River. So we would have the piece lined all the way back to um, an area location of Minor Road, if you guys are familiar with that. That there will essentially, with what we're planning to do, um, improve our ability to lift the evacuations that we currently have, the evacuation order that's in Humboldt County adjacent to the Eel River. Um, obviously, we still have some other challenges to try and um, get a tie-in with the north zone of the complex and our next branch to the south in Covalo to try and tie in the piece that's coming out of the Mendocino National Forest. Uh, if you guys have any direct questions, um, I can either do them now or we can wait until after we're done with the brief. Do you guys have a preference? Um, uh, let's, I don't see any hands raised uh, right now, so let's go ahead, Kevin, with the, um, with the presentation. Okay. But please oh, one stand by. I did think of one additional item. So currently PG&E is actually going back into the affected fire area and they're analyzing their infrastructure and, and trying to get ready to make sure that we can re-energize when available. So anybody that's affected by that outage, we're working on getting that mitigated also at the same time. End of report. So, okay, so Kevin, actually now that, now that you mentioned that, um, uh, the others might not have as many questions as I do. Obviously, it's uh, affecting uh, my district uh, substantially. Um, so you've actually now been able to solidify that line um, at the leading edge and feeling comfortable. You said that you're going to be working on getting it tied into the mat and that will kind of, and down to minor. So time-wise, what are we looking at then in the put, for the potential of rolling back the evacuation order. So I, I can't give an exact timeline, but I will say that it's at the forefront where we're looking at. And and as the days go on, yeah. we're definitely getting a lot closer than we were when I when I saw you when, um, when we spoke yesterday. Uh, as far what as what about the weather? Oh, the weather patterns right now. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're actually having favorable weather for the West Complex. Um, we're we have the normal diurnal flow, which is out of the Southwest, which is a good thing for what we're doing. Um, the one thing that we have that's a challenge in this specific fire is, is a lot of this fire isn't necessarily going to be from a, a weather driven like wind event because of the topography out there. This is actually a fuel and train driven fire. So we are still getting runs 
that are actually going against the normal weather pattern because of the steep uh, rocky terrain and the fuel loading that there is in the fire area. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. Um, are we going to hear from um, Jeff now, or do you, how, are you, how do you guys want to do this? Uh, Chief Hopkins will be speaking next. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Welcome, Chief. Uh, good, good morning, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Todd Hopkins. Um, I'm one of the Deputy Incident Commanders for representing Incident Management Team 5 and Team 3. Um, so just to give you a... Uh, a little background on the fire. We are in unified command with uh, its CAL FIRE, uh, with the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department, and also with the Mendocino, Mendocino County Sheriff's Department. Um, to give you a little, um, understand the, the size of this fire, um, from the, the southernmost border of the fire to where we are up here up in Trinity County, uh, we're over 100 air miles of, of active fire line along the uh, the western side of the fire. Um, currently, uh, the fire conditions, um, as you're from Kevin, it's we're we're doing pretty well up here in, in up in Trinity County. That's affecting Humble. Um, we have had active fire though um, that's been going um, down along the the more south towards Cobalo area. Um, so that's one of the things that we have to look at as far as as looking at the fire side before we start uh, releasing uh, people back to their homes. Um, where a census might show that there's a, a thousand people that live in the area, um, we're finding out that um, those numbers aren't really correct, that there's actually maybe 5,000 people in that area. So we, we're really stressing that, um, to, you know, and if, uh, pass on to the public that we need to, it needs to be safe uh, from the fire being able to spread before we release people back into the areas of, of where the fires are, are burning. Um, currently with the evacuations that we do have, um, we're, we're looking, we look at this every single day because uh, we do want to get people back in the homes. But again, um, we go through a, a checklist that we first look at our fire conditions. Um, and if our operations section chiefs uh, think that it's okay for the fire, uh, side to let people back in, then we go and we look at the infrastructure. Um, so as you heard Kevin saying that um, we have uh, bg and &E going in to uh, take care of power line um, or any other types of infrastructure. And then once we get signed off that the infrastructure is looking good, then we work with our partners in the sheriff's office and we tell them that we feel comfortable and that they feel comfortable letting uh, uh, the public back in, then we'll, uh, we'll release the evacuation orders. But we do a systematic approach um, with our checklist. We do it on any incident that we go on. So it's not special to just uh, the way we're doing it up in here in Humboldt. We do it the same for any of the fires that are going on uh, with any of the CAL FIRE incident management teams. Um, right now we have three different uh, base camp locations. The main camp is down in Ukiah at the fairgrounds. Um, we've uh, made a satellite camp at up in uh, Co uh, Covalo, and we've also made one um, over towards Garberville, and that's so we can uh, support the the engines and the resources uh, more efficiently, and also so the the resources aren't having to travel as many as long a distance to get out to the fire line, so they could be uh, more productive and get more hours out on the fire line, being able to go direct and extinguish it. Um, well, we have been getting more resources. Uh, we have resources uh, that are coming from out of state. So just at the, the camp that we are here in, in Garberville, um, we have resources from uh, that I've seen from Missoula, from Texas, and even as far away as uh, New Jersey that are here helping us with uh, fighting these fires. Um, and hopefully we'll be getting more resources in, but we are competing with all the other fires throughout the state. So we do have to share resources throughout the state. Um, there is an FMAG that was, um, has been sent up again and sitting with OES uh, trying to get approved. Um, I, I think you're all familiar with the FMAG process, which is it's the fire management um, assistance grant. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you can ask that during the questions um, and we can explain what the criteria is for those, but you've already taken the first step by 
uh, doing your your declaration that uh, you guys declared. Um, I just want to say that it's been a, a pleasure working. Uh, we have the under sheriff that's been here with us at the uh, incident uh, at our base that we have in in uh, Garberville, uh, but working with uh, Sheriff Hansel um, and and the under sheriff has been nothing more than a pleasure. They've been very helpful. Um, uh, same with uh, 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 the Cal Fire Unit Chief. We've all been working very well together and we very much appreciate the support uh, that the sheriff's provided and also with the EOC, they've been very helpful uh, with uh, the information flow going. Um, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Sheriff Hansel, did you want me or did you wanna talk about the, the permits that we were gonna be allowing? Uh, did you want me to cover that? Or would you like to cover that? Uh, I can cover that if, if that's okay. okay. Uh, I think probably, uh, Estelle, do you want to open up for questions directly to Cal Fire? Yeah, I would like to do that, and I'm actually going to start. <laughs> um, I, you know, I understand that in the southern part of this, in the Covalo area, there were additional um, evacuations announced last night. So uh, can you discuss just a little bit of, of your process there in terms of how important it is to keep the evacuations in place until you're actually sure that it can be defended because you don't want to lift it and then reinstate it. I'd like the public to really know that your reasoning on that. So when we do it in evacu so um, it's apparent there's three different ways we do do with evacuations. Um, we either will do a shelter in place, we do an evacuation warning, which is where we want the public to the ready, set, go, um, where we want them to have their items uh, in their vehicles, make sure they have their vehicles full of fuel and be ready to uh, leave their homes. And then we have an evacuation order, which is where we want the, the people to actually be gone because uh, it's pretty imminent that their, their house is probably gonna be threatened with the fire. Um, once a person leaves their home in that evacuation order, we have our traffic control points to go up and the public's not allowed back into the location. So once we put an evacuation order on, we don't lift the order. And, and like I said, even when we're doing our evacuation, we have that checklist. We have an evacuation repopulation plan that we follow um, that identifies road closures, what areas need to be evacuated. Um, we go through that checklist. We go in the, uh, a lot of times unified command with the uh, local law enforcement, in this case with uh, uh, Humble County Sheriff's. Um, we advise based on what the fire conditions are that um, uh, these areas should be evacuated. They sign off on it. They help us with the evacuations. Now, once the people are out, we don't want to open that up until we are sure that they are not going to be threatened by fire. Uh, typically, um, and what we don't want to do is put an evacuation order back into a warning and then have to reevacuate again. Um, and and from learning from the past um if if you do something like that it's almost kind of like the crying wolf to where people aren't going to leave or if they've left already and we let them back in and then we try to put on another order they typically won't leave because they know what it feels like to be with, out of their home for you know five six seven days um we are very cognizant of that um we have many of our own um, Cal Fire members that have been affected over the last years with these evacuations or have lost their homes during these fires and we're actually fighting the fire. So we're very sensitive to not keeping an evacuation order on any longer than we have to, but we always fall back on the public safety, but we also look at for the firefighter safety. We have firefighters that are working out in the area and people trying to get back in their homes um, it, it's a dangerous situation when people start because they don't just go to their homes and they want to go look at what's going on in the fire. Uh, we have people walking on the ground or they've been up for hours and they're, you know, they might be taking a nap and they, they get hit by a car. So we're very sensitive when we about people being out of their homes, but we're also sensitive to the safety of our personnel and the public safety about letting them back in. So typically that's why we will go through our checklist make sure that all the measures are in place before we lift that evacuation order. And when we do lift this evacuation order, we will keep the area in an evacuation warning. 
um, because there is mother nature and we can't always predict mother nature. Thank you very much, Chief. I know that that's on a lot of people's minds and uh, and I know that you've gotten a lot of pressure, um, but appreciate your your work in that uh, regard. Um, Are there any questions from the board? Supervisor Bone. Yeah, um, Mr. Hopkins, I appreciate everything you're doing. I I wanna know, um, we have the advantage here in Eureka right now in surrounding areas of actually having blue skies and being able to see when less than a week ago, we had our street lights on all day. Um, is your visibility, I know the biggest issue with the topography, you know it pretty well up there is actually getting, getting in there, like you said, to stop this. Is there any chance of you getting um, aerial support um, back online because I know the fog has been at a eight to 12,000 foot ceiling and I know that's been a big reason. Do you see a break allowing you to use aerial support or is this just going to be, I know there's some, but is it pretty good, much going to be land-based? I know you've moved quite a few water tenders and caterpillars in, but. Yeah, so um, yesterday actually we was the first day that we were able to start um, flying aircraft um, on uh, the Humboldt sector of the fire. Um, we, I can't remember the number of helicopters, but I believe we have two type one helicopters and I believe, uh, I think it's two type two and a couple type three helicopters here at our base. Um, we did 130,000 gallons of water drops yesterday on the fire. Um, so it, it all has to do with, uh, the ceiling, whether it's smoke or it's fog, the visibility for the aircraft, as soon as there's visibility, the aircraft's up and it's flying. Um, we are planning on, they were talking about putting up a mobile retardant base up here. So um, some of the ships could uh, drop retardant also and, and not just water. So yes, we as soon as we can fly aircraft, the aircraft is up um, and, and it will be on the fire. Now what portions of the fire can get to, it, it depends. It, but we're, we're, the smoke is starting to clear out. Um, a little bit over um, our sector. So um, we will keep on using the aircraft as, as much as we can while, while we have it up here and we have the, the clear skies. Thank you, sir. That's, Thank that's you. Great. you guys are doing an admirable job. I appreciate everything. Lots of questions, but you hit most of them. So thank you. Thanks. Well, it's been a combined effort with us and with the sheriff's department and all the other cooperators. So it's, it's not aware. just the firefighters. The I time. understand that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. I really do um, appreciate the work that uh, all of you guys are doing. Any further questions for CAL FIRE, either for uh, um, Division Chief McCree or for the incident management team? Okay, Uh, again, I want to thank you so much for your work. And I know that it's a a huge uh, issue throughout the state and to have instant management teams here gives us a lot of, uh, of comfort because that is a very robust, very professional, very experienced division. I know I've met people out on the line who have left their family behind time and time again this year. And uh, we we'll just so much appreciate the fact that they're here with us today. But thank you, Chief. Um, if you wouldn't mind to stay around in case some other questions come up, I'd like to ask the sheriff now to go to the next item. Thank you, Sheriff. Yes, and, uh, thank you. EOC Manager Ryan Derby is on the line. I'd like him just to give a just a brief update on the EOC and all of our efforts and on that end. Thank you. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you for having me, everybody. Ryan Derby, OES Manager. Um, so for this incident, I'm serving as the EOC Director for the August Complex West Zone. Um, with the Unified Command, we are trying as best we can to align our priorities and objectives with CAL FIRE. Um, so number one is providing for emergency personnel and public safety at all times. Um, though the EOC doesn't have an active role in fire suppression or containment, uh, we deal with the human impacts after evacuations uh, take place. So as part of that, um, we stood up a temporary evacuation point at the Humble County Fairgrounds in Ferndale. Uh, which then transitioned into um, a shelter, uh, primarily camping out in fields to uh, account for COVID-19 precautions. Uh, And then over the course of the past two days, we were working with Red Cross closely to get most of those folks connected with hotels in the area. 
so as of this morning, there were only two RVs and I believe three tents uh, remaining out there. And Red Cross is working actively today through noon to get them connected to hotels and post-disaster recovery. Um, so after noon today, we're gonna to be transitioning that site back to a temporary evacuation point. Um, we'll be providing um, kind of a connection to Red Cross services uh, and just keeping an eye on the situation. If the need arises to reopen a shelter, uh, we're prepared to do that within just a few hours of making the call. Um, our number one priorities are protection of life, property, and environment. Uh, what that looks like for the county is making sure that the evacuees have a safe place to stay. They've got food, water, all the commodities that they need to have uh, a decent quality of life until they can get back into their residences. Um, the number one push for today, uh, we were working closely with the Department of Planning and Building and Cal Fire to issue access passes for um, both agriculture and livestock farmers in the mandatory evacuation zones. Um, so this morning we got uh, an all clear to begin that process with uh, safe or relatively safe areas in our evacuation order zone. And I believe the first permit was issued um, 15, 20 minutes ago for people to begin going to their properties to take care of essential business, you know, water crops, feed their animals. Um, and we are setting a, a time frame in there. We, we want um, people using those access passes to only be in there during daylight hours, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and those passes are being issued in person at the planning and building office in Redway. Um, so for people who are looking for information, they can call 707-383-4100 to reach the Redway office, or they can call us at the EOC at 707-268-2500. Uh, if there's any questions about what that process looks like, uh, we have call takers that can walk them through that and get them uh, connected to the services that they need and, and get them uh, back to their properties for helping out today. Um, so aside from what the sheriff and, and our CAL FIRE reps um, briefed out, I don't have a whole lot to report. I'm just very thankful for the community effort in uh, assisting with the evacuation uh, shelter and the temporary evacuation point. These types of emergencies tend to bring out the best in people. And I think we've seen that over the course of the past couple of days. Um, so our, our primary objective here is to just keep the public informed, um, assist with these temporary access passes uh, while the area is still safe. And uh, as more information comes out, we'll, we'll continually relay that through my office. Uh, but that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I would just like to add to that that I, I really appreciate the work, um, the teamwork that's happened here with the Sheriff's Office, CHP, Cal Fire, everybody who's involved in this. Um, we understand people's concerns about getting in there to take care of their animals, take care of their crops. And, uh, but it's been difficult because as Cal Fire said, their primary objective in this is the protection of life, then property, et cetera. So it's um, a very fluid situation. Appreciate very much uh, what's a, a very robust program now to make sure that people know, um, that the firefighters know and law enforcement knows that people have a genuine need to be in there um, and that they can uh, be kept track of. And I know when I talk with the sheriff that you really emphasize people if they haven't done so already, that they should uh, sign up for Humboldt Alert so that if they're in there and something happens, uh, they can be contacted. So appreciate everybody's um, efforts in that regard. Uh, Supervisor Madrone and then Supervisor Bond. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to offer a very heartfelt th thanks to Sheriff Hansel uh, and uh, Director Derby and all of the people on the front lines. Um, you know, Hoopa is in a better place right now. And I know there's been a lot of communication back and forth. I want to thank you, Billy, for, for all of that. Um, it's just a really tough times so and folks, please don't be dialing 911 to find out about fire status. Uh, go to the county website, check out the fire maps and all the other alerts and updates there. Let's please leave 911 for emergencies. I know that's been a big issue as well. But again, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Supervisor Madrone. Supervisor Bone. 
Yeah, and I want to, I really, Ryan and Sam and his crew out there at the EVAC Center in Ferndale and the, and the sheriff, because I've been out there the last five days with uh, Red Cross. I've been with Pay It Forward, Humboldt, Desiree, um, probably have shipped out almost a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand pounds of stuff to uh, out to Cat and Palm, out to Willow Creek, have been uh, shipping pickup loads, a fully volunteer based. But every time we've had an issue, Ryan's been able to react to it with his crew out there. And DHHS is manning the check-in and um, to uh, satisfy um, Supervisor Madrone, um, they were, uh, there were multiple points of temperature checks, uh, multiple uh, mask uh, enforcement out there telling people to use their masks. I think we were up to 85 people out there at one time camping and close to 70 or 80 um, dogs. And I think don't think we hear about them very often, but um, Sheriff Hansel had his full animal control people out there and livestock deputy out there because we did get quite a bit the first couple of nights. I spent the night out there one night because we hadn't set up yet. And we brought in, uh, there was livestock coming in, horses, goats, sheep. It was like, you know, I know how Noah felt but um, they were able to set up areas for cats and dogs separately. And the whole, the whole uh, team of animal control officers, which you don't think about it, but the, the people that are getting evacuated don't know what they're going back to, but their number one item was their animals. And that, that was a big deal. So his team did really well there. We had lots of security. So um, it, it, it worked really well in Ferndale. We, there was a few glitches, but Ryan and his team, and I, my hat's off to Sam because Sam really stepped up and kept things informed out there. So I just, it, for what happened so quickly, it was pretty fluid because, and I'll, I'll post something about how many, we, we this community just friggin' rocks. I mean, it, it was absolutely amazing for a full volunteer organization, the amount of, the, of um, new gift cards, gas cards, and letting people that ran without anything get back to where they needed to go, or at least have somewhere to stay for a few nights and be fed and um, have some security. So um, the, EO, the EOC, DHHS staff who, there was two or three of them there at all times, and they were doing the screening, um, COVID screening, nobody got in and out, and they were COVID screening everybody. If they left and came back, they had to go back to COVID screening. So on, on our end, we did a pretty good job. I thought it was a great idea that we do flyers at the hotels um, I think that's being done already, but we probably should do that, not just for an emergency, but as you said one time, Trinidad's problem was with the tourists. So we should probably always make those a handout with every receipt to a motel receipt till this pandemic is over. So thanks guys. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Bone. Uh, yeah, Ryan, yes, of course. So just a quick point of clarification, um, although we are transitioning the um, Ferndale Fairgrounds from a shelter back to a temporary evacuation point, we are gonna maintain the animal sheltering component. Um, so for the individuals who are getting transferred to a hotel who can't take their pets with them, uh, we're gonna maintain the domestic and large animal uh, shelter out there with our animal control taking the lead. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. That's great news. I think that people, as, as, as Supervisor Brown said, very important to them. I know somebody who had to move llamas out. And that was uh, quite a, a, a thing to be bringing those down the Alder Point Road in the middle of an incredibly smoky day. Also on an issue of COVID, I understand and I know that um, Team 3, Incident Management Team 3, is very cognizant of that and have been extremely careful with the, those who are coming in and out of the fire camp to make sure that all of the processes are followed there. So, you know, we're managing two emergencies at the same time. And uh, it is pretty amazing. I, I actually have to say, it seems to me that the fact that we have been dealing, we, we ramped up the EOC uh, so much for COVID has made everybody be just so good to hit the ground running with the next emergency coming up. I hope you don't have any more, but at least for now, you're doing an incredible job. Uh, I do want to re re remind people of those numbers. Um, for the Garberville office, it's 707-383-4100. That's 707-383-4100. And for the EOC, it's 268-2500, 268-2500. Uh, those are really important. Sheriff. 
Yes, and just for latest fire information, uh, CAL FIRE set up a, a phone number at, um, at their main base to discuss all fire operations, and that's 355-4926, 355-4926. And just like you touched on before, Humboldt, Humboldt Alert is vital in these kind of circumstances. I believe this was a good you know, uh, wake up call for a lot of people. Um, and uh, so please subscribe to Humboldt Alert and go on our website, humboldtgov.org and and um, and search Humboldt Alert. You'll be able to sign up within five minutes. It's a quick and easy way. It's the only way that we're gonna really get that emergency message to you uh, in the middle of the night in case this is um, this thing um, does um, does cause more evacuations. And uh, I, I just uh, finally would like to say a very big thank you also to uh, under Sheriff Bo, who's been spending a lot of time in Southern Humboldt, being your liaison and attending the meetings and making sure everything works well. So everybody's on and uh, doing a fantastic job. Any further questions from the board before I go to public comment? Okay, uh, we have a couple of comments, uh, commenters waiting to speak. Ryan, can you let them in? And again, when you get the cue from Ryan, uh, press star six and you'll be able to talk with us. So welcome. Hi, Estelle, this is Tom Wheeler from EPIC. Hi, um, Tom. I, I want to, uh, of course, thank all of our first responders um, who are dealing with this fire emergency. Uh, it's been really incredible to, to see the photos of their work. Uh, and then also I'd like to share uh, Rex's uh, commendations for all of the good work at the emergency center uh, or centers. Um, but I, I would also like to remind the board that the, that the land use management decisions and zoning decisions, including the general plan, affect our risk exposure from fire. Right, so we currently allow people to build in areas uh, that are not serviced by a fire district. Um, we are allowing people to have uh, ADUs on their resource owned lands. We're allowing people to develop new residences on resource owned lands, on TPZ, on Timberland, uh, on ag exclusive. We are, we are putting people in the WUIs. We are allowing development in the WUIs, which then affects how our firefighters have to fight these fires. Uh, they are going to try to defend structures where they can. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, it restricts the range of options uh, in our firefighting response. And it generally just puts more people, more homeowners at risk and it puts our firefighters at risk. Um, so in areas that are frequently flooded uh, or experience hurricanes, uh, what those communities are doing is they're changing their zoning codes to get people out of those highest risk areas. And with this new fire uh, season, um, this new, the new normal that we have with our fire season, uh, a longer fire season, hotter fires, larger fires, I, I think that we need to consider um, how our land management decisions affect our <laughs> risk exposure as a county. Uh, Rex, I, I hear I hear some good laughter from you, so I, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say on this. Um, we don't do a back and forth during public comment, Tom, but you do still have. Well, no, I understand it, Stel, but it was it was an offensive uh, guffaw by uh, by Supervisor Bone. So I, I would certainly appreciate if he wants to share his perspective, uh, why he thinks why I had to say this funny. Well, we will, we will give but him that I, opportunity. When we I would also keep, accept an apology keep. from him too. Thank you, um, Tom. Any any other points to share before we go on with uh, public comment? And um, I will ask uh, Supervisor Brown uh, when we're done with public comment. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll go to the next caller. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, uh, it's still good morning. Thomas Mulder, you can hear me, correct? We can, yes. Okay, so um, I'm going to change up my comments a little bit after the last uh, commenter. I respect Mr. Wheeler, um, but I also respect people's property rights, and I also respect uh, proper forestry management. I'd like to remind you, everyone that's talking about land, potential land use changes that all of this fire started in uh 
government owned land that may, you know, everyone has different opinions on how proper forestry management is. I think uh, we should maybe promote proper forestry management in these processes and promote um, underbrush cutting, back burning, and all those kind of things, working with our volunteer fire departments in the winter months to properly uh, make these forests more fire defensible and defensible spaces. I think CAL FIRE does have some good resources as far as what defensible space is and stuff like that. Now I'll go back to what my originally was going to say. Um, I, there were some bad rumors going around on social media yesterday, and uh, I'm going to thank the Sheriff's Department for clarifying that, that they weren't out raiding people in the Island Mountain area. Um, I'm personally not in the evacuation area, but that, that would be disheartening. Um, I'd remind most likely with the smoke and ash damage, those people out there probably are going to lose 10 to 25 percent of their crop. So people are hurting, and I respect the sheriff for clarifying that um, statement yesterday. So thank you for that. Thank you to all the uh, fire departments and everyone that's been participating in uh, making everyone as least displaced as possible. And I think this after this issue is gone. Um, the fire's out in wintertime. I think it'd be a good time for us to all talk as a community on how to best uh, have fire safe roads, um, fire safe uh, defensible space and proper forestry management. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Thomas. I believe we have another caller. Uh, looks like it could be Kent. Uh, still, uh, ditto to what uh, Thomas just said there. Always appreciate his astute comments. Um, Tom Wheeler, I have four phone calls in you at Epic. You want to give me a call sometime? I figured I could reach out to you in this forum. Uh, I do. You know, I want to. I want to say that you know we we all we all value our lifestyle, and uh, those of us who do live in those particular areas, which I call sprawling now, uh, we know there's a risk. But actually, these are the people that we want to have out there if they're good good people who will actually take their 20 acres, 60 acres, or 160 acres and make those fires safe, unlike what the Forest Service and uh, California and everybody else from the different jurisdictions are managing their forests. So I do want the people out there. I do want them to live out there, and I want, want them to manage that. I mean, it, it, I was actually coming up with a general plan designation that would basically give people a carrot to move to those areas and yet manage those forests in a manner that would uh, minimize our loss of life and property. I don't think we've lost anybody here. I, you know, I was multitasking during this conversation. Uh, Mother Nature wants to let you know this is just a little shot across your bow. Uh, People who say, well, we're, 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 this is two. So what's a hat trick? Well, I said, people, where would you go if there was a fire? You know, living in a lot of people, we would go to the ocean. I say, so I said, but what if there's a tsunami? So what if we get a hat trick there? And of course, the fourth one would be, uh, I refer to as a hat trick plus a boot, which be a, have some other catastrophe, which would probably be major earthquake. So uh, be prepared, be aware, be safe. Um, the human race, as I've said many times, is the only invasive species. Mother Nature's tired of the greed out there. And uh, thank you so much for taking care of the pets. I wanted to make net note of that. Uh, I, I can think most people who have a pet cannot think of 20 human lives that they would exchange for having that pet. And I fall in that category myself. So I, I, I can understand their, their thoughts on that. But uh, also what's being done regarding the other things with Mother Nature out there. I mean, do we have rescues for, for fire damage for other things out there? Birds, bears, deer, all these things of Mother Nature that are important. Elk and those kind of things. I haven't heard if we're doing any rescues for that. And there's got to be some of them really hurting. They've lost their habitat. And so I strongly support uh, having good things happen in the habitat. And uh, and a lot of times I like to agree with uh, Rex's dog, not always Rex, but King always has good input. So maybe King has something to say on this particular topic. Thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, uh, Kent. I believe that's all for public comment at this time. So bring it back to the board. Um, did uh, any comment from Supervisor Bowen? Would you like to sh add? Okay. I, um, I think everything's I, been said. Thank you. I, I did want to bring up uh, the issue of the, uh, that was brought up about the Forest Service and these lightning fires that 
happen in there and can can spread because they're not hit right away, which they obviously are if they're in a, in a more of a community area. I was out there um, in Trinity County at the Forest Service with um, Chief McCray, and I'm wondering, are you still there, um, Chief McCray? That, Kurt, that you could talk a little bit about what is being discussed in terms of forest management. I, I do I do want to point out that uh, in a, a fairly uh, amazing uh, situation, the Forest Service and CAL FIRE are now working together. That hasn't always been the case, but you've had a lot of cooperation happening. And I know when we were out there with Senator McGuire, we we're talking about how for, the forest can be managed through fire. Well, I'll, I'll speak to a, a couple of points there. Um, there's always been a cooperative relationship between the Forest Service and CAL FIRE. It has to be that way. Um, yeah. We often have incidences that are too, uh, too, uh, too great in intensity, fire intensity, or geographical distance in areas to cover. So that starts at the initial attack phase where we share resources at the moment we receive a, a call of a wildfire. Um, and it follows all the way through these large incidents. Um, it, it's, uh, it's important. Um, and that's why we're currently under unified command with the with the Forest Service and CAL FIRE on many large wildfires throughout California. So that cooperative effort uh, uh, has always been there, um, but there are times where each of our uh, agencies um, don't have the resources to share adequately with each other. Um, and again, that's why unified command in this situation with the August complex has provided us the most leverage with the resources we have. And uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, on an operational basis, um, CAL FIRE resources and uh, Cal F uh, Forest Service uh, resources, the managers of those resources, they do what I call horse trading. Um, they, we effectively um, move resources where the need is greatest. And that can be a very fluid, dynamic situation. And back to the August complex, our, our priority is to control, to contain and control the fire. And the way to do that is with perimeter control. There are times and there will be times yet before this is over that we'll have to um, suspend perimeter control and go back to point protection, um, protecting structures and uh, assets on the land. Um, that variability of operational um, change in tactics um, is dependent on burning conditions, the weather and the resource availability we have. CAL FIRE and Forest Service have to be in the same equation to, to affect success there. With respect to um, forest projects, um, CAL FIRE and uh, uh, the United States Forest Service, um, we are engaged in cooperative projects. Um, there's obviously uh, much more to do in the future um, on a grander scale, and that's, uh, that's gonna take time. Um, what we're seeing with these fires, uh, we're not gonna change the, the ground conditions, the fuel conditions overnight. That, uh, that's a function of time um, and, and effort as well as funding. So um, to, uh, to put it simply, uh, Supervisor MacArthur of the Six Rivers National Forest and I, um, we believe very strongly in, in having a strong partnership because of situations like we're facing right now. Um, and those partnerships and those cooperative agreements and, and projects begin um, long before the fires start. So um, yes, there's a long ways to go, um, but we have, uh, we have the, uh, the tools and then the science that keeps emerging um, to direct us in the right um, direction to, to hopefully minimize the frequency and scale of the fires we're currently experiencing. Does that answer your question, Supervisor Fennell? Yes, it does. Thank you, uh, uh, um, Chief, uh, uh, Chief McCray. Um, appreciate it. Just, uh, I just know that the kind of conversation that is going on is looking at how the fire was burning in one area versus another and, and how, um, you know, with managed fire, prescribed burns, those kind of things, things can really change uh, the lay of the land in there. So um, any other uh, questions or comments from the board, Supervisor Madron? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, uh, Chief McCray, I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, the work that uh, CAL FIRE does. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, CAL FIRE and the Forest Service do need to be cooperating to have any uh, positive effect on all this stuff. And, and same with the county, you know, we're big players in this with our county road system, which is so important for evacuation as well as other things. And, 
you know, when we think about what it is that starts fires, in the last three years, we've got all three types of ignitions, right? This year, it's primarily lightning driven. And uh, so far, we don't have the Superman shield. So, uh, you know, what we have to do is deal with fuel management, forest management. Uh, then there's uh, power lines, trees going down on power lines. And PG&E has a lot of work to do to harden the system, as we all know. And the third one is uh, starts along our roadsides, uh, the car fire. So this year, lightning. Uh, last year, uh, we had lots of uh, power line uh, down, starting fires. And then the year before, the car fire that burned into Western Reading, that was a chain dragging uh, along the roadside with a lot of heavy vegetation. And when we look at our uh, county public works being so underfunded for the job, I mean, all the departments are, and of course, COVID's not helping that at all but you know we're down to so few people in the public works crews on the roads that the mower goes out and there's two guys at either end for flagging but there's no crew with the mower so it doesn't take very long for the mower to hit a rock or a tire or a metal guard post or whatever and then bam the mower is down for thousands of dollars of repairs and the roads aren't getting brushed so when we look around the county i'm sure all of us as supervisors get calls from our constituents about the incredible brush growing on our county roads. And it's not public works fault. You know, we're not funding them to do the job. And if we funded extra positions for laborers to go out first along those roadsides with uh, weed machines and daylight the hard objects, daylight the rocks, the tires, uh, the metal posts, so that the mower doesn't hit them, uh, we can just shift the money we're spending on mower repair into laborers, work with the SWAP program, work with the CCCs and expanded programs with the state and the governor, and put people to work and get our roadside brush maintained and dealt with, including invasive plants and other things. So, you know, I see incredible opportunity there because of all three of those types of fire starts, lightning, power lines, and roadside brush, Roadside brush is the easiest to deal with, and it is right there at the intersection of evacuation routes and safety for our communities and all that, along with fire safe work around the homes like others have mentioned. So I think, you know, the, the silver lining here is hopefully going to be a substantial increase in funding. I'm not sure where from. None of us know that. But we do need to figure out ways to get these crews working with the brush machines and the mowers so we have a much more effective process of keeping our roadside vegetation maintained, which will reduce fire starts and make our community safer. So uh, I know you know all this, uh, Kurt. I just thought it was an opportunity to share, you know, the broader picture of how we as a county are such a critical part to that triad of the county, Cal Fire, and the Forest Service. So anyway, thank you for everything you guys are doing out there. You're, you're very welcome and, and point taken. Um, the advantage uh, County of Humboldt has is a community wildfire protection plan that um, has been put together and, and the Board of Supervisors has accepted. Um, that's a very important uh, tool and foundation to secure grants, um, some perhaps from CAL FIRE, some from other agencies, to begin such work as you've just described. So I would encourage uh, the county to keep pursuing uh, those type of uh, grant funding opportunities for projects that you've just mentioned, Supervisor Madron. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Chief McCray. Any further comments? Uh, Supervisor Baum? And hey, Kurt, are you running across, I know they've had some problems up in other areas quite a bit in Oregon, um, lost a whole trailer park last week. Are we, um, are you seeing, um, I know we are, but are we seeing it here locally, arson issues? Are we, are we following it? Or is that hard to follow in something like this? I know this tends to bring out when you start saying this is the world's biggest fire or the state's largest fire, the arsons seem to come out in droves or. So. Um, I'll say that we haven't, we haven't seen any trend of that sort, um, but uh, we, we don't uh, disclose our uh, investigation uh, results or processes during uh, fire investigations. And the state of California is, we're tasked with um, investigating the cause and origin of all wildland firefighters. So to, to answer your question in general, no, we're not seeing any trend of uh, any malicious uh, intents with fire. Thank you, uh, Chief. 
So again, I want to thank everybody. And I know that you'll be with us for a while and uh, wish you the very, very best luck in your endeavors. And thank you so much for helping protect Humboldt County. Really appreciate it. You're very uh, welcome. We do you. have, thank you, Chief. Um, we do have um, an item before us, which is the ratification of the resolution proclaiming the existence of a local emergency. Um, so I appreciate the motion in that regard. So moved. Second. Okay, we have Steve, a motion and a second. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Okay, we'll go to Ryan for a um, some, something's going on there. I don't know what. Thank you, uh, Ryan, Supervis Supervisor Madrone. Yes. Supervisor Bone. Yep. Supervisor Wilson. Yes. Supervisor Fennel. Yes. And Supervisor Bass. Yes. Thank you. Passes 5 0. Thank you, Ryan. And again, thank you to everybody. Thank you, Sheriff, for all of your efforts. I know that's just really extended your working day. <laughs> Do appreciate that. Um, so we will now go back to items pulled from consent. And um, those Here's items were. Um, Somebody's got something going in the background. Could you please mute your audio? Okay. So we have item C10, which is the fire services ad hoc appointments. And um, that recommendation, um, would that be the CAO's office or the uh, um, CAO Nelson? Supervisor Bone pulled that item for discussion, so we should turn it to over to Supervisor Bone. Thank you very much, Supervisor Bone. Yeah, and the only reason I, 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 I hadn't seen this done before where we passed them around, and I know I was, uh, I wanted to be on this committee at the last two times and, and kind of, you know, graciously let this go. I've got a history as a volunteer <laughs> firefighter and pretty well involved with, uh, uh, the county as a whole on the firefighting. I go to the chief's dinners every once in a while and stuff like that. So I was thinking I would like to serve on it. I mean, I just, I didn't know how this came about because it is, it is an appointment. And, and, um, and so I just thought I'd ask about it. Um, I had a couple of fire guys ask me, he says, why aren't you getting on it, Rex? And I go, I don't know. I didn't know anything about it. So it would be nice to have the, I guess what the word we use is transparency. So. Thank you. Um, go to Supervisor Wilson. Uh, you're actually the appointed member along with myself on the Forest Services Ad Hoc Committee. Yeah, and I appreciate Supervisor Bone pulling this from consent. To be quite honest, when I was reading through it, I just, I thought this was, <laughs> I, I thought this was actually going to be an item that was going to be um, not on consent. So thank you for pulling it off because I it just I just buzzed right through it. I'm okay, I'm ready to discuss it, and I didn't realize it was on consent. So, uh, and I didn't put it on this. Um, this basically comes from um, uh, uh, a brief conversation I had with uh, Supervisor Madrone, uh, where he was expressing his um, his interest with relationship to. Um, uh, the fire services situations that are occurring in his district, which are far more complex than things that are happening in mine, for sure. Um, without getting, uh, I, you know, we stopped before getting any kind of detail because basically I said this is a conversation we really can't have uh, to any any depth because the, we have a subcommittee that talks about this stuff. It's a, a um, and um, you know that's with myself and Supervisor uh, uh, Fennel. Um, uh, but it, it seems like there's a lot of stuff that there's definitely a lot going on. I already know from being on the committee that there is a lot of, um, of interest in what's happening in that space. Um, uh, and so, uh, from my perspective, um, I, uh, the things that are happening in my district are kind of launched. They're kind of happening in terms of like the getting the Jacoby Creek area started to, 
um, move towards becoming incorporated into a, into a fire district. Um, I feel like we've made a lot of headway um, with relationship to the to the, the issues in um, Estelle's district and, and in uh, Supervisor Bones district. Um, so from my perspective, if there's a supervisor that really has a lot going on in their district and can be helpful to their constituents by participating on, on a committee like this, then I'm more than happy to to um, have that happen. I, I feel like the the part that I needed to do is kind of happen and are, well, I mean, it's in process and I have confidence that it'll continue in its, in its trajectory. Um, and I don't want to, personally, I don't really want to be, uh, uh, you know, have to have to have this go through in terms of, um, uh, in terms of having a, you know, potential Brown Act issue with relationships to what's happening up in, um, up in the fifth district. And I know that, um, you know, there's there's just a lot of conversations that need to happen up there directly with with the supervisor. And so, from that perspective, I I uh, let Supervisor Madrone know that if you want to put it on the agenda to discuss um, transferring over, I'm happy to have that discussion. And that's that's the that's the genesis of this conversation for transparency. And again, I really I don't know. It's just kind of like a old man brain freeze or something, but I really did think this was on our regular uh, calendar when I read through it. So um, I have a question for you, uh, Supervisor Wilson, as you know, uh, the other ad hoc member on that committee. Um, uh, what, a, what what do you think of the idea that we, we make those appointments every year? It's September now, we usually make them in December. Um, uh, so you're feeling like you just can't add to that committee at this time. It's not that I can't add to this committee. I just I just feel like there's a lot really going on in the fifth district that needs you know that needs um, some special attention. It appears, mm -hmm. and um, and I just feel like the the issues uh, that we've been dealing with. I mean, I have to say, like I have learned a ton on this committee. It has been extremely educational, um, and it's really from a what some of the most complex thought matrices of planning that we've had I've ever really had to deal with to be quite honest it's just very um uh, interesting from that perspective and it just it took a while to kind of catch up but, but I feel like I understand the issues fairly well I, I can advocate for well with my for my constituency um outside the committee now, I mean I feel like it's, it's like I've, I've I've taken it as far as I can for my constituency in terms of um until we get it done, but I think that's in process. I don't. I don't think that me being on there is going to move it along any faster. Um, so, from that perspective, I mean, I, if you want, we can wait till then. I, I didn't. I don't know. I, I'm fine either way. To be quite honest, I'm. I'm a. I'm a little bit passive in this. I, I will admit, but um, uh, it's not. I, I don't want to cling to this if if there's something if there's some issues that need to get dealt with. That are aren't outside my that are outside my um, purview. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Supervisor Bass. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm glad this um is actually be discussed because I thought I don't know I didn't hear anything about that during our regular process. So um, and I appreciate uh, Supervisor Wilson's uh, explanation. And it almost sounds like uh, he was um, kind of uh, relent. No. I say uh, taking what he's heard from Supervisor Madrone's challenges and uh, basically when I heard uh, if uh, Supervisor Madrone wanted to put it on, that's kind of how I get this got on. So it doesn't matter now we are here. And um, I just, I just, I think I'm more comfortable just doing, I mean, it's three months from now, um, the regular process because I can only see, and why Supervisor Wilson makes complete sense and I understand it, I think, and obviously I don't have a lot of fire districts. I have kind of two. That's, I obviously don't need, shouldn't be on that committee, but but um, I think we can all talk to them. I mean, I go to the chief's dinners too. And so I, I think that avenue which probably still exists. Um, I'm just concerned if we start pulling different things and bring them back mid-year, it just gets kind of messy. But um, is this the one, and I mean, does this one have an alternate to it or is it just the, the two yes. exist? 
Okay. Yes, there is an alternate supervisor bone actually. Oh, so supervisor yeah. bone is the alternate. Yeah. See, and I, okay. Yeah, because I, I think if we were making a decision, I probably would move him, him up to the place just because he's been hanging in his alternate all that time. But um, mm -hmm. I just prefer if we could put it until December and then it gives a little time for um, people to work things out amongst themselves. No, I guess only between two of them. How's that? I just, I'm not ready. For that. And again, I'm not. Thank gonna, you. Go ahead, sir. No, I'm not going to die on it either way. I'm just saying, I I, I understand the CSA four monies uh, issue up in Trinidad, and I understand you know the West Haven. We just did the fundraiser for um, West Haven. I know all the volunteers are having you know that issue, but I've I'm very familiar with the head of all the past fire chiefs. I tend to hang around with them. So I, and, and the other thing is it's a two person appointee. And I, and I, I think the one thing is, is you have to separate you, you're, you're representing in this position, kind of like our position you're representing, even though you have an issue in your County, that's not your, per, I mean, you want to obviously be aware of that, but you're representing the whole County and you've got to have an awareness of the whole County and the operations and, and AP and Fruitland Ridge. And I mean, all, all of those things. And so I was just thinking I could bring up more um, balanced. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure Supervisor Madrona could also as well, but I've, I've been pretty, I mean, it's, it's recorded that I'm pretty well enveloped with all of them. And it's, even though there's problems in the fifth, I kept hearing there's problems in the fifth, it's, it's not a, a specific district um, appointment. It's, it's, it's somebody that's gonna represent all the fire districts, all 37 throughout the county, so. And I thought I could bring that to it. And I've, I've made this argument before. And then when I saw this, I'm going, oh, so that, that's the only reason I brought it up. And so I just asked and, and uh, would uh, step up to serve if uh, Mr. Wilson can't serve. But I mean, it's again, it's a, a board decision not, not to be made amongst ourselves. And I fully understand that was not what Supervisor Wilson intended. So I. To be right clear, on. I didn't put this on the agenda. <laughs> so I just. I, uh, <laughs> your name's on it. Supervisor, you wear it. No. <laughs> Supervisor Madrone, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And as the person who did put it on the agenda, it's uh, nice to finally speak at the end of the queue after everybody else. Uh, Might have been nice to speak first because I could have shared with you why I put it on the agenda. Uh, you know, conversations go a lot easier if you get an understanding right from the get-go of what's going on. And the reason that the other three supervisors are just now learning about this is because of the Brown Act. And uh, Mike and I did the right thing and not continuing to converse further or with one of the three of you and creating a violation. So how do we talk together? How do we make it transparent? We put it on the agenda. And here we are. Imagine that, talking about it. Um, Really good points, uh, Supervisor Bone. I totally respect your uh, your background, uh, your involvement with volunteer fire departments and everything else. And again, thank you for helping raise money for West Haven. Those were all wonderful things. Uh, all of our districts deal with fire, right? Right now, we're pretty highly focused on wildfire, but it wasn't just a couple of uh, weeks ago that uh, Mike's district had some pretty major barn fires. Uh, going on in Arcata, and of course, fire can happen anywhere, anytime. Uh, but in regards to wildfire, I would say that uh, Supervisor Fennell and, and my district, the second and the fifth, certainly have a lot more instance of that. Would but the first district has burned heavily in the past too. Remember the Shelter Cove fire and and many others. Uh, so, you know, and there have been big fires in Newland. There have been big fires in Trinidad, everywhere. So they burn to the coast sometimes and. Right now, we're seeing a really bad uh, situation. Um, you know, uh, we've talked a little bit about various backgrounds of folks to serve on this. As you all know, I uh, taught forestry at Humboldt State. I've been involved in forest management my entire professional career. Uh, in fact, over the last couple of weeks, I have been out to Honeydew a couple of times and have been working to help implement a project, a million dollar uh, fuel reduction project that I helped bring uh, those grant monies into the county for, working with a rancher out there, Bob Stansberry, uh, in a project that is uh, part of the Redwoods to the Sea project, 
in order to protect uh, the old growth redwoods on the Eel River and the King Range Conservation Area on the coast. There's this private land in the middle and that's Bob Stansbury's ranch. And he is implementing a project with uh, various nonprofits, CAL FIRE, as, uh, where the funding's coming from, CAL FIRE, and Save the Redwoods League, uh, doing massive fuel breaks to uh, be able to control and prevent wildfire from getting into these precious uh, wildland areas. So uh, I have a lot of background in that particular field of work. And yeah, the reason I put this on the agenda is because um, there have been some problems cropping up in regards to the CSA 4 discussions. Uh, and yes, Supervisor Bone, I fully recognize that the members of this ad hoc committee have a responsibility to be looking at all the issues in the whole county, uh, not just their own district. Uh, but what's happening, uh, the fifth, is the CSA 4, which is the only one of the CSAs left. Apparently, there were at least four of them at one time. There's only one left now, and it's in the uh, northern Humboldt area. And in discussing that uh, that assessment district and the needs of the West Haven Volunteer Fire Department and the needs of our greater Little River to the uh, Del Norte border, uh, well, actually up to Oryx area in regards to fire services, it has become very difficult for me to respond to my constituents' requests uh, who have been asking me to be highly engaged in discussions about the CSA 4 and the overall fire services within that assessment district. Um, and staff have found that it's difficult to uh, be able to allow me to fully engage as my constitu constituents would like me to because of a potential serial Brown Act violation that might occur if I'm heavily engaged in those discussions. And then this comes back to the ad hoc where there's two more board members suddenly that's three board members involved in a serial conversation. So the county council advised staff that um, I cannot fully engage in those conversations, make recommendations and fully represent my constituents without creating a problem. And that's really simply because the CSA 4 currently is so active in regards to trying to figure out how it's been working, how it might work in the future, et cetera. So, Supervisor Wilson uh, generously offered to step down uh, to allow me to be considered to be appointed so that I could be able to do my work for my constituents, but also very strongly considering the needs of the entire county. So, you know, that's all it's for. And if the board doesn't want to uh, do that, that's fine. Uh, if you want to wait later, all of those things are okay. Uh, that's why it was brought forward and i think i would represent the county quite well on that committee but i also knew you would as well supervisor bones so hopefully that helps you understand why i put it on the agenda and uh, i think you know a lot of my background as far as being able to serve so thank you thank you supervisor Madro and supervisor bone well i just a uh, point of clarification i don't think anybody there's nowhere on this that says it says it's from the clerk of the board and it says appoint supervisor drone it doesn't say on here that you put this on here so again i i apologize i didn't know you brought it forward and i'm i'm sure the chair didn't either and she probably would have turned it to you as she always does so i don't think there was a victim in there it's just the, the way it was worded on the on the presentation brought to us forward yeah and uh, i i'll just say very briefly here um that a lot of the work that we're doing has to do with district formation and there are a lot of uh, fire districts um, in in both my and um, supervisor bones districts who are, are in the process of trying to get them to this point very proud of the work that we did right uh, regarding um, Rio Del, uh, consolidation with Scotia uh, Red Crest Holmes Black crossing Shively. the three just and Shively as well and so we're we're really um, this is yeah it they, it all affects the whole county the whole process the vision of how we can deal with these uh, ongoing challenges and uh, and help our volunteer districts become a little bit more organized etc. So there's a lot going on in there. Um, I think everybody's got something to offer. Um, it sounds like in, in your particular case, Supervisor Madrone, it's, it's very specific to one issue. 
And I'm wondering if uh, somewhere, you know, in the next few months, uh, we can figure out a way for you to have that kind of engagement without having to take this step if that's if that's what we're waiting on you know um, for for the well, one, well through the chair if i may yes absolutely please one, one option yeah sorry i turned that off um i'm i'm on a zoom with hoopa tribal council right now as well just on the side trying to deal with a very important issue out there at any rate um you know, one solution would be that I could just fill this position for the next three months because our work in the CSA4 is very intense right now over the next several months. And then uh, we appoint Supervisor Vaughn, move him from a, a alter, alternate to the uh, prime position in January. I mean, you know, there are a lot of ways to try and do this. And I do agree, all of us have issues with the fire services. I'm just trying to help uh, see if I can get your support to remove a barrier that is making it difficult for me to respond to my constituents' requests uh, from West Haven, from Trinidad Volunteer Fire, and, and the rest of, and, and my staff. And so, or our staff, not mine, I don't have any staff, we share them. But at any rate, so, you know, that would be one solution. Um, if you might consider that, I would appreciate it. And I'm sorry if I, it sounded like I was taking it personal earlier. Uh, I thought when Mike said he didn't put it on the agenda that it was clear that Maybe I did, but at any rate, I, I'm not taking that personal. I just thought I, I made that point that if the person who was kind of putting something on, and if that wasn't clear, my apologies. Um, it's a good way to start out because then you get some clarity from the beginning of the discussion. That's all. So at any rate, I didn't take any of that personal from any of you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Bass. I was just thinking, you know, an alternate path would be, I mean, if Supervisor Wilson wants to step down, you know, usually it'd be the alternate would kind of move up, but then someone moving into the alternate position, I would think should still have access to most of the information and the conversation, but I'm not in that group. So I, I'd be curious to ask. A, we have the CAO with her hand up. I, I need to provide some clarification to this ad hoc committee. There is no alternate. It's a two member ad hoc committee and the members are Estelle Fennell and Mike Wilson. So I, I just want to provide that clarification for you all. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's... All right. Well, sorry nice. about that. I, I, I was under the impression that there was, so that changed. Thank you, CEO Nielsen. Okay. Hmm. So we're at a um, situation where maybe we want to take some public comment or do you want to continue the discussion for now? Okay, let's sort of take some public comment. Um, Ryan, I believe we have at least one caller who'd like to speak. Uh, Estelle Ken Sawatsky here. Um, yeah, yeah. W when I did look at this thing on consent, you have items two, three, and four, and that's where this should have been if Steve Madrone had put it on there. It is like Rex Bone said, it's under the clerk of the board. And so therefore it was lacking clarity as far as who put that on there. Um, I don't know, you know, I know you guys don't really like my artistic ideas sometimes, but can't you have two separate ad hoc committees, one to deal with fire issues in, in Soham, like Rex and Estelle's district, the other one to deal with uh, the fifth and the third, and Virginia's already acquiesced that she really doesn't have as big a district affected by those things. That would be a question you might wish to ask your county council, if you could have uh, just a... Uh, negate this one and establish two separate ad hocs. I don't think you'd be violating the Brown Act. They would be acting independently of each other without communication. And, and maybe you would consider that. It's, it's kind of like, I'm not asking you to chop the baby in half, but it sounds like we got twins here. Very simple operation we could separate. And, and while it's very important at this time for all of you to be on board regarding fire, and that should be something that could be noticed for next meeting and accomplished on next meeting's agenda rather than making any of these other alterations. But that's just uh, you know a recommendation from the uh, peanut gallery out here. Uh, again, I, I I would hope that you would ask your county council if that's possible to do, and then possibly consider that at least. So thank you for my opportunity. Fire's king here, 
and I can understand everybody need to actually participate. And I, I did wish to make mention, I really haven't seen that much coming back from reports from this committee at all in the past. And, and especially now, now we're paying attention. So maybe it's time that we did get quarterly reports from hopefully two ad hoc committees to address the issues in the different parts of Humboldt County. Thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ken. Okay, um, back to the board and um, Supervisor Wilson. I just wanted to address the comment that um, in, in that, um, that sounds okay if it was just us two, <laughs> but um, the committee right. involves a bunch of other people and you can't really, there's already meeting fatigue, um, you know, in a lot of these things. And I, I would say I, there's just, that's that, like I said, if it was just us two and then we create two, ah, that'd be, that'd be great. But I just, um, yeah, that, that, that wouldn't work. It's more like a, it's more like a two-headed baby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I know. And, and the, way it, the way it goes, Mike, is like um, there's so many people involved with it. Uh, there'd be so many opportunities for serial meeting violations. It's just not a good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Wish it could be as easy as that, but it's not. Um, so where do we go from here? I mean, I, I'm a, I, I would be okay with the with the uh, three month appointment um, with regards to switching over that um, that uh, supervisor Madrone is talking about. If we if we really think that it would, you know, if there's enough to get done in that space of time, or if there's something that's really really immediate in in there as a conversation that has to happen in this in this context, um, I'd be okay with that. But I'm a, either way. I mean, I just, I, I think, um, I, I do want to find it. I do want to, uh, I think it is important to find a path for uh, Supervisor Madrone to engage in this pre really important and timely issue within his community. So, um, and if staff has a, uh, an idea about how we might get to that place, that would be good. Um, I, I, well, I might, yeah. thank you for that. Uh, I, I would actually go to Council Billingsley. Um, to clarify the situation, if you would, um, I, 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 because it, then it comes into my mind. And so, are we just saying, okay, um, create an, a, a situation where um, Supervisor Madrone can go in for basically one issue? You know what I'm saying? Um, does that meet the intent of the whole meeting of the whole committee? A uh, chair, I think that's potentially problematic along with the idea of having two ad hocs on potentially similar um, ideas. I, one thing that may work is if the ad hoc, uh, if it's been a while, if the ad hoc wants to report back to the board, that's the time when the whole board can obviously have a discussion and input. And that could happen as soon as the ad hoc wants to return. And that, and that mm -hmm. allows the whole board to participate. Uh, that was the thing that came to mind at this point. If, if the board isn't interested in changing members on the ad hoc committee at this time. Okay. Uh, Supervisor Madrone. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I wouldn't be going on to this ad hoc just for this one issue. Let, let's just be really clear about that. Um, uh, we all know that whoever serves on the ad hoc needs to consider the needs of the entire county. Uh, as I've expressed, I have tremendous background in forestry and fuels reduction. I'm actively engaged in very large projects around our county in that realm. I work with volunteer fire departments, you know, the same as all of us do. I think any one of us would be well qualified, but I think that I have additional qualifications from my professional background that helps me serve the county as a whole quite well. It's also true that there is this one issue that is very timely right now. I do believe that over the next three months, significant work is going to happen and has been attempting to be to, to have it happen in the last month or so, but there's been some problems with the process. And I have not been able to engage in that process because of this concern over the Brown Act. And so, yeah, maybe it's not done by December or January. And we could revisit this at that time when we make our annual appointments. Um, but I do believe that a consideration for this three months would be significant 
for my district in regards to my ability to help with that. Never, you know, minding that I will keep my mind open on the whole county and all the things that are going on. So I just want to make it clear. It's not just for that one reason. Otherwise, yeah, that wouldn't be a valid reason to be on there. So I think I get that. I got that before this conversation. And, you know, I'm just trying to figure out a way to be timely with what's going on right now. And the staff are working diligently to try and resolve some of these issues with CSA 4 to be timely with budgets being developed at the start of the year. Uh, you know, so that's how that timing works because we want to be ready for July next year with the CSA 4 contract, but you got to be ready months before to deal with that. Supervisor Wilson. Okay. I know it's, I know that the situation is kind of clunky, but I do think that I, I think that it's been the, the argument for the three month appointment with a review uh, at, at a later time, I think is reasonable. I'm gonna make the motion to replace myself uh, with uh, Stephen Drone on the Fire Services Ad Hoc Committee for the next three months and with the review at the time we actually do our, our appointments. That's my, throw it out there, I'm putting it on the floor. And I'm requesting no, I'll second. second the motion. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, we have a motion in the second. Um, any further discussion of this, Supervisor Paul? And I, I'm not sure what the current committee is not doing for the CSA four up north. If it's they're not addressing it or doing it right, or if it's just the result isn't. Um, favorable to um, Supervisor Madrone. So I'm, I'm just, what what is going wrong with that? I'm asking the current committee, what is going, because you guys are obviously addressing it. What, 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 what's going to change? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not sure. I'm personally, you know, speaking personally, I would, um, I would have to discuss some more of this with staff. Um, I'm wondering if there, again, I keep going back to, is there another way for Supervisor Madrone to have, um, to feel uh, that he can have as robust uh, uh, participation as possible? Is there a way that there could be a community meeting about it? Um, uh, something like that, uh, where we would not be present. I don't know if that would, would be appropriate. Um, I just don't know. I, I, I really applaud Supervisor Madrone for really wanting to, to get in there and, and, and uh, have his say. Is there a way that Supervisor Madrone can meet with the fire chiefs, et cetera, the community, and, um, and, and somehow or other help them to get their message across to the uh, ad hoc committee? I just don't see... I really am not aware because obviously Supervisor Madrone has not been to meetings. And um, I, we have, at the last few meetings we had, we were concentrating a lot on the other districting, redistricting that's been happening out there, the district annexations, and also um, our um, uh, dispatch problems and funding dispatch in the county. So those are the kind of things we've been basically um, talking about in our meetings. Any further discussion here? Okay, uh, let's uh, put this, we'll go to Ryan for a call, a roll call vote, please. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. Yes. Supervisor um, Bass. For the three month period, yes. Supervisor Bone. Sure, I reluctantly. Supervisor Madrone. Yes. Supervisor Fennel. Uh, and um, I will say yes with the statement that I, I find this a bit clunky and I'm a little concerned about it. Um, 
but for the good of the order, I'll, I'll go along. Thank you. Pass this 5 0. Okay. Um, well, now, believe it or not, we're at what is it, 1126, and we still are we're going to go to public comment on non agenda items. And I apologize for There's another item poll. Our legislative. Oh, yeah, sorry. We have another item poll. Sorry. We have, um, wow. <laughs> C13, we are on C13, and that is, uh, that was pulled by Supervisor Bone, I believe. Yeah, it was my day to pull things, sorry. Um, yeah, the reason I pulled this, I, I, I sometimes in, in the, the thrill of what we call government here, we, we kind of overlook the things of what we get accomplished and, and where we spend our money. And if you read this, there's quite a bit of money being spent um, on inside the jail updating and it hasn't, I didn't think it was that long ago, but it's been over three years when we retore the entrance out to the jail to make it ADA compliant. And I think Karen Clower and the, I've, I have a couple offices next to me that do ADA and they, they're working their tails off. And this is a fairly big project that's been a long time in the making. And I think our ADA has had a lot of successes and we were finding out a long time ago when we were put under our federal injunction that Cal California ADA didn't meet all the criteria of federal ID, ADA. And now we're kind of getting those married together. And um, since we're out of we're uh, out of that decree order, but we're still moving along, I was hoping to get a little update on what's going to be happening in the jail, how much money, and um, some of the progresses we're making on ADA. and. And I know she'll make it short, but I also do know that it this is a big part of what we put on with for the last seven years. And I think it's a it's a it's a we're making small victories. It's going to make a big victory for our staff and for our people that use our facilities. So I was kind of hoping I'd turn it over to the CAO or in this case Karen Clower or the head of our ADA team. Thanks, Rex. Okay. Um uh, I'm Karen Clower, Deputy CAO and ADA Coordinator for the county. Um, at this point, um, we are excited to say this is the last of the consent decree items um, listed in the jail or the correctional facility. So once we complete these, we will reevaluate remaining items in that facility and start moving forward with those in future years. Um, we want to take a pause from the correctional facility once we're completed with this project as um, there's many other um, barriers we need to address. Um, as you said, um, it's been four years. On September 7th of 2016, the county entered into the, uh, the consent decree with the Department of Justice. Um, Needless to say, we've learned a lot in four years. We've learned a lot about the ADA and about the California building codes and how they relate. Um, on this four year anniversary, it seems fitting that we are bringing another jail shower, well, the jail shower project to your board because it was um, our first two projects were correctional facility projects. It was the intake room and the fifth street ramp to visitation. Since then, we've completed more than 6,000 barriers to accessing county facilities. We've relocated five programs to fully accessible locations and made five additional facilities fully accessible. We've made the county website compliant. We've brought on staff five ADA coordinators and two certified access specialists. The county has adopted policies to provide greater access. We've educated staff about the ADA. We've successfully constructed 178 compliant curb ramps. We've purchased and unveiled beach wheelchairs. And on March 13th of 2020, due to the county's steady progress and continued commitment to ADA barrier removal, the DOJ chose not to renew the consent decree. The county and the ADA compliance team remains dedicated to removing barriers to access in county programs, services, and activities. In the near future, you can expect to see the fifth floor project completed and the relocation of cast and victim witness. 
the Garberville Campus Complex started and its completion in the winter of 2020 with the relocation of the Sheriff's substation and the library. You can expect to see board chambers reconfigured, providing an accessible podium and accessible staff tables, changes to the Sheriff's lobby area, an ADA compliance plan for future ADA projects and facilities, and a public rights of way compliance plan, and many more projects to come. With that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Well, I, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, <laughs> anybody on the board, uh, Supervisor Bone? Well, and, and as we move through this, and I don't know how often, but when you have a list of a lot of accomplishments, it would be nice if we could have a presentation like this or, or something like this. Cause I mean, this is, this is something uh, I suffered on the board over eight years ago when I first got on here and it had been by previous um, bless their souls, but it had been kicked down the road, I would say with uh, mm -hmm. little band-aids being put on it. And we finally, they enough was enough. And so we had to step up and we're going to exceed 40, well over $40 million when this is all over doing these projects, curb cuts, you know, the 1,400 or 1,542 curb cuts we have to make. Um, you see those happening all over our districts. Um, all these things that our public works and our, uh, and our CAO team, uh, ADA team with Travis and, and I mean, the whole crew has been as doing a marvelous job. So I, I think it's every once in a while, you, you know, you got to step up and thank the people for doing what they're doing, even though sometimes it seems kind of, uh, taking a long time and it's really not because it's taken four years to get all this engineered and approved. So, so I, I appreciate what you're doing. That's, that's why I brought it forward. I thought it was a good time because I hadn't heard an update lately and I thought it was a good time to share this, all the good work these guys are doing. Hey, uh, Rex, I really appreciate you doing that because um, it, it is amazing the, the amount of work that's been happening in this regard. I just really, really appreciate it. Uh, all of the work that's been happening. And it's been very challenging because you're, uh, well, now we're a little bit past the consent decree, heavy handed part of it, but uh, there were lots of things that you had to redo in some cases because of the federal inspector coming in. So it's a very, very, very costly experience. And uh, I really appreciate that we were able to get it done before being having huge budget issues so thank you for that and thank you to travis too I see travis smith there um i've been doing a lot of work on this and thank thank you to karen travis and everybody involved in this so um i um take some public comment on this item and i believe we have one faithful commenter Welcome. Estelle, yeah, it, it's always good when you do get things close to accomplishment. The financial yeah. impact of this project for today is paid approximately 130000 change for design. But it says the project is estimated at, at $3, three million and change. However, exact project cost will not be known until the project has bid. Uh, it is anticipated that the funding will be secured to the 2020 finance plan and supplemental budget will be needed once the project has been an actual con construction costs are known. Um, I do have a problem with that whole 2020 finance plan. The public really should be aware of how that's going to work, what kind of debt's going to be incurred and exactly how it's going to be used. Um, I do concur with Rex that this was a, a thing that I, I don't know, I just uh, kind of kicked the can down the road and Bonnie Neely for 20 years and that all or whatever, the people who just kind of ignored this thing and put it on your guys' plates, most unfortunate, because it probably could have been done for 50 cents in the dollar had they addressed it as it should have been addressed, rather than expanding the, the county government and leaving us where we're at right now. Um, so anyway, I, I, it's always good to bring this stuff to the public. Otherwise, they don't have any idea as far as what's going on, and they should have an idea what's going on. Uh, the federal government, of course, this is an example of one of their fantastic unfunded mandates. How do you like that one, folks? Uh, ADA compliance, we might have got a little bit here and there, but I think it's mostly been taken out of our, our general fund. And now apparently out of financing, which we may not have the ability to repay if the current economic crisis doesn't get 100% solved, a lot of us predict it won't be. The usual is going to be different than it was before. 
So when you incur these costs, I highly recommend that you look at what is our ability to repay those. Um, you're burdening, not necessarily me, but you're burdening my children and grandchildren with all these improvements. The last thing I wanted to mention was that ADA compliance uh, was not done down uh, for the for the Veterans Hall down in Garville, much to the chagrin of the people down there. My understanding is they're being stuck in this complex in some little room where they can have meetings. They might even have to move their flag out of there. And it's most unfortunate, and I highly recommend that you, if you are doing funding and financing, you build the reconstruction or exact replacement kind for kind of the Garberville Veterans Hall down there, which is an important part to that community. And they always asked, like, asked and like me to speak on that topic. So I did. Thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, Kent. Um, any further comments on this item? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, and uh, one thing I would like to mention since it was brought up is the uh, Garberville Vets Hall. That actually is going to be treated as a, um, and, and made into a very um, ADA compliant building. And uh, that's uh, part of our facilities master plan. So looking forward for, to that going forward as well. So with that, um, Item number C13, Supervisor Boney Polder, would you like to make a motion? Yeah, that's fine. Make okay. a motion. I'll second it. Oh, <laughs> motion to what? <laughs> yeah. So she said C C13, uh, staff's recommendation. Thank you, Supervisor Boney. And uh, Supervisor Bass seconded. Okay, great. Again, thanks to everybody. Uh, Ryan, let's go with a roll call vote on item C13, please. Thank you. Supervisor Bass? Yes. Supervisor Madrone? Yes. Supervisor Bone? Yep. Supervisor Fennell? Yes. And Supervisor Wilson? Aye. Thank you. Passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, we now have public comment on non-agenda items and this portion of the meeting is reserved for people designed to address the board on any matter not on the agenda that is under the jurisdiction of the board and i believe we have um one caller and i believe yes uh, still while i'm consistent as i'll get up and uh since the other day I was bringing forward something as far as being uh, nominations for the biggest asshole in Humboldt County, I'm going to nominate myself. Um, I never got nominated before, and I'm going to run on a platform here. Uh, my definition would be that I always have or consistently have the back of uh, Mother Nature, the environment, consistently have the back of the young children, consistently have the back of the older people, and consistently have the back of pets. And if that's what it takes, I guess, to qualify for that, I will continue to speak in, in whatever verbiage I feel without being chilled by the board, exercising my freedom of speech, and continue to participate in the process. Um, it, it's, it's part of, I guess I would refer to as being a bully. Uh, my rules are I can only bully bullies. Uh, I was asked before by one of the supervisors why I came back from Mexico from so much angst. And, and, and the angst has always been there. I've always had a problem with any particular backing of, of what you refer to as cannabis, marijuana, I call Humboldt County green crack. It basically has negative impacts on the baby in the womb. It has negative impacts on mother's milk and has negative impacts on the minds of the young. And this has all been brought to you folks before. Uh, unfortunately, this county has not been able to any way, shape, or form control those to minimize that, permitting when you permit the stuff, and basically everybody is going back to black market. Not everybody. I think Tom is probably the, one of the few honest ones, maybe 10, 20. I don't know what percentage he is, but significant people are back in the black market, and that stuff is still going basically into the womb, into the mother's milk, and into the young minds of the children who need a chance to survive. So that's my nomination for myself today. I'll leave it at that. And uh, anybody can make comments regarding me for other reasons they think I should be. I have no problem. I have broad shoulders. It doesn't bother me. It's freedom of speech. 
And the only thing I think they can't do is cry, call fire in a fire hall or try and uh, insinuate somebody should be harmed through physical violence. So freedom of speech is king, and I will always have that back also. Thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, Kent, uh, for exercising your freedom of speech. And we have one other commenter here. Um, welcome. Uh, good. Almost afternoon. Thomas Mulder here. You can hear me, correct? Yes, we can, Thomas. I, so I wanted to piggyback. I, I'm sorry on the, the fire update. I lost a train of thought earlier because of the previous commenter, but I also wanted to extend thanks to the sheriff, building and planning, Cal Fire, and anyone who worked with being able to allow people back into ranchers and farmers back into the evacuation area through passes. So in the collaboration of governmental agencies, it's great to see that. Thank you for that. Um, next, I want to bring forward your attention of Planning Commission uh, discussion agenda item number one for this Thursday. Uh, I believe it was two weeks, maybe three weeks ago, there was a conversation about generator use. Um, I respect Kent. He's basically wanting to pull every project that has generator use on its uh, plan. And there was a large discussion about a project on, uh, uh, was on Alder Point Road for Using, utilizing the EU 2000 for supplemental ancillary services, uh, processing, drying, nursery. So I want to remind you, when everyone brought forward Ordinance 1.0, there was a baseline CEQA study. So all that existing generator use was already included in that baseline study. Whether we like it or not, that was part of the CEQA document. So I would encourage you, if the Planning Commission does move forward with sending you a letter that you de deny their idea of changing and once again moving goalposts. I'll remind remind you that you just passed an ordinance allowing small or yeah allowing small cultivators to be able to apply 2,000 square feet and we're opening the window and an opportunity for people to come forward. If people hear about governmental agencies changing the rules on people that already came forward and trying to move goalposts again, I think we might lose trust. So I want to remind everybody whether we like that baseline study or not, that was what baseline was because of no regulations. So please remember that when a letter comes your way. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Thomas. Um, any further comments from the public on non-agenda items? I, I don't see any. Comment. Thank you very much, Ryan. So um, I... Uh, First of all, I want to say welcome uh, to Karen Lang over coming into our presentation on the state uh, legislative program. And I know that in the past, I would have been really concerned to see you wait this long, and Paul, and Paul, um, to see you wait this long. But I know you didn't have to travel very far to wait. So uh, I feel a little bit better about that. Um, and anyway, thank you for your patience. So we're now going to have a presentation on our state legislative platform. I'll go to the CAO to introduce the issue. Thank you, Chair Fennell. September happens to be one of my favorite months um, in county government, and that is because we begin our work with our state advocates, uh, Shaw Yoder, Antwi Schmelzer, and Lang. In particular, Paul Yoder and Karen Lang, who have been our state advocates for many, many years, and they're a pleasure to work with. And so with that, and they've met with our department's heads, and they have met with staff, and they have met with your board to discuss the um, issues that are of great concern to this county. And so with that, I will turn this over to Karen Lang and Paul Yoder to provide a 2020 wrap-up. Welcome. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Karen Lang with Shiaeter and Schmelzer Lang. I'm going to kick it off and then hand it over to Paul. Um, we really did miss getting to be up there in person, um, especially right now. Uh, although I suppose you have fires as, as well up there, but uh, really miss seeing you in person and having that time together and seeing the Carter House and the AA. And uh, we're just really missing it and hoping that this is a one-year thing and we're back in the on the road next year. Um, it's been absolutely wild, as you could imagine, being a lobbyist in this environment. Um, we were all pretty much at home as well. From March until now, uh, the, the state capitol um, was technically open when the legislature was meeting, but it was made pretty clear that they wanted folks to utilize alternative 
um, options to access hearings and meet with members um, just because uh, you know the, the the fear of spreading it inside the Capitol was pretty significant. So um, it was quite a strange year. Uh, clearly lots and lots and lots of bills that normally would have moved did not. Um, they're just a few hundred. Uh, normally we would tell you about probably over a thousand bills that were sent to the governor and that's not happened this year. Um, and furthermore, um, you know, we started out in January with the governor um, proposing a lot of new initiatives and new ways to spend money and building on um, things that he had started in his first year as governor. And we were looking at that time in January at a $5.6 billion surplus um, in the budget. And that's including what uh, he was proposing to increase the spending on in January. And then of course, by May, when uh, the legislature returned and the governor um, had to do his May revision, we went from a very exciting budget full of a lot of new ideas to the governor needing to scale back nearly all of his expanded proposals to contend with what was at that time estimated to be a 54 billion with a B, $54 billion budget hole over budget year plus one. So it wasn't like all of it was had to be solved in the next like 10 months, but it was a pretty, um, pretty big turn of events for everybody. Um, they did a, um, a series of reductions and scale backs on what um, the governor had spent the previous year. Also built in some internal borrowing and uh, did some sort of maneuvers like, uh, for those of you that remember when Governor Schwarzenegger was in office, we had what were at that time described as trigger cuts. So if revenues didn't materialize as the budget year went on, then automatically certain cuts would be implemented. They turned that concept on its head for this budget year that we're in. And um, instead of cutting things, they just started out at a lower number. And then if by October, the uh, federal uh, government acts to do another uh, relief package, then several programs would be quote unquote triggered up. The thing that would be most notable for you all to be aware of that's uh, dialed into the trigger up um, scheme is uh, the realignment backfill. As you recall from 2011, counties and the administration entered into a sort of an agreement which was codified that realigned several health and human services functions and public safety functions. And the dollars associated with giving counties the appropriate resources to implement those realignments were tied to sales tax. And as you could imagine, there was a lot of uncertainty about how consumers would behave in um, a COVID era. And so there was concern that you wouldn't have enough money to to, to uh, implement the realignments in this budget year. So the governor and the administration uh, got to an agreement on a $750 million backfill um, for counties that would uh, be triggered up to a billion if uh, the federal government acted. And so that's sort of the cushion that you have. Um, the governor's office did make it clear they wanted you to spend that money to the extent you could on the health and human services side of the realignment to support um, individuals in the um, on, on the public assistance programs that are supported by that. Um, and then uh, as part of it, the governor made it clear that he wanted to make sure counties as they got these allocations were complying with his public health orders and guidances from the Department of Public Health, which I would imagine has been a challenge for you, much like it's been for several other rural counties that don't quite have the positivity ratings and hotspots that some of the more suburban and urban counties have, um, but the governor really wanted all the counties to continue complying with the order. So he's required Amy, Ms. Nelson, to sign a monthly form uh, testing that she will make sure the county follows the orders and guidances. And actually while she's been manning the, the board meeting this morning, the um, administration put out an announcement that the last chunk of your um, uh, your realignment backfill money could come out um, by that you should be getting it by 917, excuse me, your CARES chunk. I'm sorry, your CARES chunk. Um, you'll be getting that by the end of this week, even though it's like one and it's, it's two payments in one kind of. And I think it's a, it'll you know be a couple million dollars for the county. So that's good news. More money is better than less money, I think. And then in the CARES, the, the, the other part of this that was, you know, the governor really tied the state uh, giving you funds. Um, any county or city under the population of 500,000 did not get a direct allocation from the federal government back in March. And um, it went to the state and the state held on to it until the budget process was done. 
and then they were allocating it out in chunks. The amount of money that Humboldt was designated to receive was 13 million, and that was to fund um, public health, behavioral health, and other health and human service needs that arose directly as a result of COVID. They have tried to condition uh, how you can spend the money, and um, there was a little bit of push pull between the federal and state government about that, since there was some effort to to further tie what you could spend that money on. But the federal administration made it very clear that states could not add additional uh, limitations on how that money could be spent. So you're just supposed to spend it consistent with federal guidance, and um, those dollars are still moving out. But again, the administration was very clear they wanted counties to be following guidances and orders in order for you to receive the money. Nobody has yet had it held back with the exception of two cities in the Central Valley. Um, and I, I'm not sure if they've sort of gotten um, back in the governor's good graces and received the dollars yet, but um, he did actually withhold um, some money from two cities that, um, some CARES money from two cities in Merced County, I think, and uh, might've been Fresno and Merced. Two county or two cities uh, did have their funds withheld. And the other big thing that happened in alternative law, uh, SB 823 is the juvenile justice realignment bill. Um, we had a nice conversation with your probation officer yesterday. We're very aware that uh, it was not ideal that SB 823 was actually approved and sent to the governor. Your delegation was wonderful. Senator McGuire worked really, really hard um, on the Senate floor to try to extract agreements and commitments to make sure that this realignment um, for the juvenile justice population, uh, you know, should the governor sign the bill, that there will be further refinements and commitments made to make it work for all, all California counties and for the public's benefit. The governor in January had proposed to move um, the Department of Juvenile Justice, uh, basically close it down and send that population to counties. And um, those um, kids would be served sort of by health and human services and probation officers and overseen by a a state, a new state um, entity that would keep an eye on what is happening at the county level. Um, ordinarily, when I was talking about the realignment from 2011, counties have always been at the table through the whole process and had signed off on the final version of a bill before it was approved by both houses. And with what happened in the juvenile justice realignment, the they only had, you know, there's a 72 hour rule, which is the first time there's been a realignment since the 72 hour rule took effect. And the bill that showed up in print with only three days to go was not something that counties could support or even be neutral on. And there was a, an effort launched by all the county family to stop that bill. There was no you know, deadline under which the counties needed to take back DJ or to take GJJ. There's not a federal order or something that is um, creating a false timeline for this realignment, but the legislature and the administration pushed forward and got 823 out of the Senate. Um, but again, Senator McGuire, Senator McGuire worked really, really hard and I don't want that to be lost. He did understand the implications to the county. So we started having conversations with the administration right away. We don't have time to just be mad about it because DJJ stops accepting um, kids being transferred to, the, to DJJ in the middle of next year. So we need to get to work right away. And uh, the chief probation officers have already met with the governor's office to talk about all the problems that were in the bill. And I think um, it'll be a concerted effort with all of the county family to try and fix the bill, assuming the governor signs it, which I think there's a reasonable uh, conclusion to draw that he will sign it. So we've got to be working on that. And that's going to be, you know, not just the lift that Humboldt County has to, to um, carry, but just um, be advised that your senator was spectacular and tried really, really hard on your behalf. And I don't want that to be lost, even though the vote um, went the way that it did. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll hand it over to Paul and then we'll, I'm sure, happy, be happy to answer any questions that we have uh, at the end. Thank you, Karen. Paul. Thanks, Karen. And uh, good morning, Madam Chair, and board members and members of the public. Um, so Paul Yoder, and I want to talk, Karen did a great job talking about some things that happened. I'm going to briefly talk about, uh, unfortunately, something pretty significant that has, I'm going to say it hasn't happened yet, not that it didn't happen but that it hasn't happened yet. And then I'll do a little bit of a look ahead before we take questions. So when I say the thing that hopefully hasn't happened yet, that is uh, the next major effort by the state of California to infuse a lot of money into fighting forest fires uh, and preventing forest fires and uh, the management of lands uh, that could help in, in both of those regards. 
So what we started with this year were two different bond proposals, Senate Bill 45 and Assembly Bill 3256. Both super well-intentioned, both built on uh, previous efforts, previous funding streams uh, in the state of California, not just for fighting fires or preventing fires, but also there were a lot of other natural resources related provisions in both those proposed bond acts. They went by the wayside when, um, and I'm not placing blame on the governor here because he had a very good reason for doing this, um, but they both went by the wayside in the middle of summer when Governor Newsom indicated that he wasn't prepared uh, to allow another bond to go on a statewide ballot at this time. And the reason that the governor gave was that in his view, the state has a lot of bonded indebtedness already. We're in a, we're in a fiscal situation, a dire fiscal situation, and that the last thing the state should be doing is incurring more bond debt um, that does have to be paid out of the state's general fund. So the bond efforts fell apart um, as soon as that happened. So the next thing that was attempted uh, was pretty creative. Um, and that was an effort to take <clears throat> all those forest and wildfire provisions from the bond acts, about $3 billion worth, and to fund them by extending an existing surcharge on folks' utility bills. And it, again, it's an existing surcharge already that we are all paying. So the idea was extend it out over 20 years, create something that you could, a revenue stream that you could take to Wall Street, bond against it, fast forward about $3 billion uh, into California to combat uh, fi uh, wildfires. That fell apart um, due to opposition from uh, the large utility companies in California. Um, I would say on one end, and then on the other end, uh, in addition, opposition from uh, utility ratepayers uh, and their groups and the folks that advocate for them. And so it was sort of a corporate opposition and a very grassroots opposition that doomed um, that proposal. Um, and that was um, a, a valiant effort, uh, but it really never got any momentum whatsoever and, and also fell by the wayside. So. The very last effort at the end of session was to just straight up get half a billion dollars out of the state's general fund. And I want to say that was a bipartisan effort, mainly in the Senate. Um, your state senator, uh, Senator McGuire, very active in that, um, working together with Senator Nielsen to the east of you. Um, and, you know, just a, a very good bipartisan, uh, valiant effort in the Senate to try to get some amount of funding. Uh, a shot in the arm, if you will, for everybody around the state. Um, that actually ran into some problems. And I'm going to say it ran into problems maybe in a normal or typical year where we didn't have the logistics of COVID in Sacramento um, and the inability of people to really meet face to face and negotiate the way they typically would. Um, I think in the end is what doomed uh, that effort um, as much as anything else. Um, but I have to say that those legislators, including your own, uh, I think they are um, they are very invested in, in making something happen as quickly as possible next year. So unfortunately, nothing yet in terms of a, a major infusion of cash uh, to put towards these efforts, but a lot of efforts. Wanted to make sure the public knows um, that there was that there was a lot of trying. Uh, and just unfortunately, at the end of the day, though, um, nothing, nothing new. Now, when I said I want to do a look ahead, just very, very briefly, I would like to look at the November ballot, and I want to make sure uh, we highlight a couple things for you and for the public. Um, CSAC, the California State Association of Counties, uh, has taken positions on two of the ballot measures that will be on uh, in November, Proposition 16, uh, which they have voted to support. Uh, and Proposition 19, which they have voted to oppose. Uh, but in addition to those measures, uh, if you're watching television at all, you've no doubt uh, seen the fight, uh, an ad sponsored by Uber and Lyft and DoorDash uh, that go uh, right to the heart of uh, the independent contracting issue in California and would overturn Assembly Bill 5, which was uh, enacted last year. Um, there are two citizen-initiated measures, uh, one that would over overturn uh, some of the uh, criminal sen sentencing and supervision laws uh, that were passed during uh, Jerry Brown's tenure. And I want to say uh, former Governor Brown actually just put a million dollars of his own money into defeating uh, that measure. And there's also the cash bail referendum, uh, which I'm sure all the board members are very well aware of. 
We do have the so-called split roll initiative on the ballot. The thing Karen and I want to pass along today is that uh, the, the latest polling that we are hearing about behind the scenes uh, had support for the split roll initiative at around 45 percent. Um, however, I do want to caution that that polling, uh, to the best of my knowledge, was done uh, actually before uh, the, the ads for the pro side of that initiative really started saturating the airwaves uh, like they have. Um, and then I want to make sure the public knows there is another rent control in initiative on the ballot, uh, and that is despite the fact uh, the Proposition 10, uh, a rent control measure was defeated uh, and defeated pretty soundly in 2018. But um, given some of the issues going on uh, with COVID this year, I um, want to highlight uh, that initiative as well. So I'll stop there. We, we both promise we'll take questions. We always like to back and forth with your board. Um, and we're ready to do that right now. Thank you again for, um, we, we do miss being up there in person and I look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Paul. And yeah, I definitely missed that opportunity. Yeah, um, Supervisor Baft. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't think you guys mentioned this. Um, I, I was just wondering, because we talked a bit about the CRV and I know I was I was texting you and I did talk to uh, Tom Matson, and you know, it's it's very confusing for us to try to understand. I mean, I mean, I'm having a heck of a time with it as well. But I, you know, can you give us a little background of how this actually works, and that, you know, why we're at this challenging place, and what part the state plays in the whole picture? Yeah, can I go first, Karen? Sure. Okay. So, I mean, in, in a nutshell, um, the. China stopped taking a lot of recycled materials. Um, I'd say going back five or six years ago. And they were in fact taking enormous amounts of recycled materials, recyclable materials, I suppose I should say, um, from California. And the markets in general have never really uh, globally recovered from that. Um, and one of the effects, very material effects that it had in California was to, to basically just wreck the CRV market. Now there were other issues. I'm going to call them issues, not necessarily problems, but issues with the CRV system in California. There were folks that um, a variety of folks from different perspectives who were trying to fix that for some time um, still would like to fix it. But I want to make sure the board members know and the public too. In Sacramento, and again, I'll say in a, in a normal year, uh, CRV reform has a lot more players, institutional players than one might imagine. And, uh, and there are a lot of different aspects to the CRV system. And so there's skirmishes uh, <laughs> all over the place. And then just in terms of bringing a deal together in Toto, it, it just, you have to resolve the issue here and the issue here without, and over here without wrecking the first issue that, that you resolve because things are so interlinked. And so, um, we haven't seen the governor weigh in. Uh, we do know that the resources agency understands there's a very serious problem here. Um, and and I, I just to try to be hopeful about the supervisor bass. Um, if we can get back in 2021 to, uh, and I'm going to say it, the more the way things used to be, the more normal way of, of business getting done in Sacramento, because business can get done in Sacramento. It, it got done this year, just not as much as it typically would. I think maybe we could see some movement uh, on on CRV, um, the bottle bill, however you want to uh, think of it. Um, but we're going to have to we're going to have to get to a place where people are interacting face to face. I think on an issue as complicated that in, as that in California. It just seems to me that this is a huge issue. I mean, it's a you're, we're talking about uh, recycling. We're talking about people who depend on it. We're talking about the state having the funds to come out of the CRB program and not uh, bringing it down to us. We're talking about the system and and the fact that actually the retailers are, or you know the manufacturers already put that money into the state. It's extremely complicated. But on the street level, for the person on their home who through the several months of COVID before we started opening back up, have been yeah. saving this wanting to bring it back it's huge it's a really yeah. big deal yeah and we understand yeah. and, and I, the canary in the coal mine uh say about three or four years ago was when we started hearing about 
recycling centers closing in some of the most highly urbanized, densely packed parts of California. Um, I mean, that's when folks said, uh-oh. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, um, there's been a lot of thinking about what to do next. Um, there's been a lot of talk, um, but, but just to, I think maybe to underscore how complicated and difficult politically this is to, to you all, we can't even say there was a bill right? Like Senate bill 1234, where someone, you know, a state senator said, hey, I at least want to try to wade in here um, and explore, you know, some type of, uh, or I just want to put, put it out there for a thought piece so that we can convene stakeholders and, and see, you know, where, if anywhere we can go here. I, folks really feel stymied and I, I know it's unfortunate. I just, I just have to look to 2021 and hope that um, you know maybe it can it can get done in the next legislative session. Thank you, um, Sir, Supervisor Madron. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, pleasure to see you again, Paul and Karen. Um, you know, on um, let's see. Do you remember when you used to be able to take your bottles and cans to the grocery store and get your nickel back? Yes. <laughs> this this will, this will tell our ages probably here, but. Uh, do you know that's still part of the law that technically you can take your bottles and cans to the grocery store? So I don't know if you heard about this movement happening, but on October 5th, everybody's taking their bags of uh, plastics and cans, maybe leave the bottles and the glass at home, but everybody's taking their bottles and cans to all their local supermarkets and seeking uh, remuneration. So imagine that, right? What would that cause to the system to shut down and, and whatnot? So, uh, you know, bring back the nickel, I guess, is what the, the moniker is there. At any rate, you know, in Oregon, you do take your glass and your bottles and your cans to the supermarket and they have machines out in front of every grocery store that processes the recycling, you know, so that there's not personal handling happening and all these other issues. So one idea would be for the legislature at Cal Recycle to create a uh, incentive program for supermarkets and give them a tax write-off for installing the equipment that would be necessary to start processing this at the local level again. So that's one of the ideas I've heard out there. It sounds like a good one to me. I don't know what kind of a legislative fix that is, but I throw that out to you guys uh, as, a, as a thought. Um, yeah. Anyway, look for uh, Bring Back the Nickel on October the 5th. Yeah, I will. I wasn't aware of that. So thank you. I don't think we were aware of that. And, um, you know, I, I tell you, one of the things we can do in, sooner than later is to start talking to the committees, the relevant committees, just to get a sense of are they hearing about any efforts or contemplating any of their, their own efforts uh, for legislation in 2021 and the administration as well, now that we're really, we have this deep sense of how important it is um, in Humboldt. So we can do that immediately. Yeah, and I, I'll just... I've heard a plan that maybe take truckloads of it to Sacramento. I could pick up my laptop and show you Capitol Park. There's a lot of space. So, uh, you know, maybe. Yeah. Um, any further questions uh, or comments for Paul or Karen on the on your legislative platform? Supervisor Bone. As always, thanks you guys for keeping us informed the, the the updates and everything else. I just don't have a lot of questions because these guys are so great handling everything on the state level and running everything through CSAC and RCRC. They're great partners to us and to our associate agencies. So great for that. And just for us locally on our recycling, um, Senator McGuire is talking with Cal Recycle on our behalf um, with input from HWMA and Recology about how we can Part of the problem is, is loosening the rules so we can actually put pop-ups in other areas uh, because we just don't have the space in COVID times to handle the big influx they had the other day and they had traffic out the Broadway and they couldn't get in the service trucks. And so he's gonna, Cal Recycle has been pretty pretty stringent on holding to their rules. And I, I'm i always wondering how a guy with two tacos can walk out of a restaurant with four margaritas in a Dixie cup, but we can't put recycling pop-ups in a empty field somewhere to relieve some of the people that have been sitting on this COVID for, uh, I mean, this COVID related recycling issue, because a lot of this is COVID related. I know there's issues with actually selling the product, but it, our problem is we just don't have enough space 
to properly wash, uh, distance, clean everything that comes in with 450 visits a day during a normal time down at HWMA. And then the loss of value, some people have, um, you know, some of the areas aren't collecting anymore because there is no value in this. As a guy that spent probably eight years of his life sorting bottles every Saturday morning at his dad's grocery store in the back room, um, I can I can certainly tell you um, that the the issue has to be addressed because there's a lot of people that are waiting. There's quite a bit of money. I know there's people driving to uh, Crescent City on this, so they 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 are addressing it as as quick as possible. But it is it is a it is a global issue more so than just a local issue. But it's hard it's hard for people to under, to to fathom what's going on. So and then most of the grocery stores. It is by law, they should take them, but most of them have bought out of that. That's the deal. They can pay mm -hmm. that little bit of that law that they have to take. Well, they can also buy out of it. And so they've actually bought out of it because even the machines in Oregon, you still have to deal with the waste, the concentration and the picking up. So it, it's a, it's it's not a very cleanly job, but when it was paying money, as you guys all remember, everybody wanted in it. Now there's no money in it. Nobody wants in it, so. That's right. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it, it adds to their costs. We get it. We do get it. But there's also the issue of the state actually having the funds. So how do we handle that? And um, I, if there's no other questions from my colleagues, I did want to go back to the wildfire issue and uh, SB 45 and AB 3256. Do you think that the fact that we now have more fire in California than we've ever in records had the governor and others might change, even though you have a hard time lobbying there. Is there any possibility things might actually go back? Yeah, I I do. I you know I uh, I hand over to Karen real quick. I um, you know even despite the fiscal situation we had this year, the the state found a way to appropriate a, a couple hundred million dollars of additional funds to help combat homelessness in California. And so I think you know you prioritize the thing, and then uh, and then you find a way. Uh, for the money. We'll see what happens in the presidential election. I, I, I'm hoping that regardless of the outcome, uh, if we don't have a, an aid package for states and local governments before the election, we'll have one shortly thereafter. Um, and I think, Madam Chair, that, that will hopefully um, help the governor and the legislature okay. um, fund, um, put more money in, into these programs that we know can work. So I'll, Karen, did they leave anything out? I, uh, yeah, I think just after the election probably would be the soonest. The governor does have um, some ability to spend money when the legislature is not there through what's the, called the Joint Legislative Budget Committee. That's how he was spending money while they were, um, uh, when the legislature had adjourned for a period of time while waiting out the COVID piece. So uh, he could spend some money if there's an urgent need to do it with the wildfires. Um, to be honest, if you watch any of the end of session, uh, the last three days was not the institution I love. It was very, um, it was very unfortunate. It's specific times, you know, one of, uh, one of the senators tested positive for COVID and he had been at an event with almost all of his Republican colleagues. And so the Senate Republicans had to basically participate remotely for the last couple of days and it got real rough. And so I don't think it was a anything that anybody's in a big hurry to, to experience again. And hopefully we, when they come back, it'll be in person and sort of look more like what we're used to. Yeah. Um, it wasn't it wasn't the best. Um, you know, I wouldn't want us to be on a nightly talk show about how our, how our legislature functioned there at the end. They did their best. And again, Senator McGuire um, presided at the end. And it's our understanding that that was just really at the request of the Republicans because he was so um, even handed and they felt like they could really uh, trust him to conduct the Senate's business, and so um, he handled it. And it was there were some really sticky moments. So I just can't imagine the legislature wanting to come back. And I don't know that the governor wants to have that happen again. Um, I think they'd re probably rather wait until it can function more like normal. Yeah. Yep, definitely interesting times. Well, let's go to public comment. We do have somebody waiting to talk with us. Um, yeah. So if Ryan, you can uh, um, let that caller come through. Um, Welcome, Estelle Kempsawaski. I didn't catch the whole thing. Are, are you guys still going by thunder and lightning, considering that's what's happening? Never mind, probably dropped that term. So 
Um, always appreciate your participating. You know, there are, there's some major concern that I could bring you. I don't know. Maybe it was brought up by somebody else. But we've got literally miles of, of, of plastics out here that uh, on all our greenhouses. And if you compare probably statewide to all the other plastics you have, and this is sun-resistant stuff. This can be in the environment forever or a long time. And, and we really need to have some form of a, a thing where they pay a, a CRB tax or something to assure that when that stuff is, is no longer being used, it goes and it's disposed in the correct way. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have what I refer to as ghosts blowing around. Of course, with the fires, we have enough fires. I guess that stuff just goes ahead and and puts the toxics into the atmosphere. So um, that's one point I think we really need to work on some form, especially for, for the Emerald Triangle here to, to mitigate that potential future problem. Uh, the other thing I will always bring forward, uh, as I spoke earlier, uh, the water that is here needs to stay here. The water that's being taken from here needs to be put back here. M Mother Nature works in mysterious ways. And my opinion is as long, as long as her natural flow for water is being circumvented to the only invasive species on this planet, to the detriment of Mother Nature, she's going to have some angst. And it's just something that just kind of happens. Uh, so I strongly recommend... Uh, I guess with potential consequences from Mother Nature that you start, everybody start listening to her and everybody start paying attention. Otherwise, I don't think you're going to find there's much of a place left in California or much of the world. We've already gone way beyond the tipping point as far as any of the climate changes and things. And people are just starting to realize that. But that's just my crystal ball. Uh, I really have very little interest in a lot of the humans' business these days. We need to protect the young, the elderly, and and the animals that are part of our life here so that's where my that's where i'm weighing in on my opinion on this topic if you can lobby for those things be greatly appreciated and i think you're going to find that everybody's karma might improve thank you for my opportunity to speak thanks Kim. thank you kent um we have another caller um once welcome Good afternoon, Thomas Mulder here. Um, uh, just from the update I got, I think it might have been the CARES, but it sounds like typical California where they're taking $100 out of your pocket and they're going to make a big public announcement about giving you $75, but put a bunch of strings attached that basically it's got to go back to where they took that $100 from you. So it's really unfortunate. Um, I think uh, we need to fight towards keeping as much of our money local as possible. I know uh, resource money, different different things. I don't know exactly how to do that, but that's something I would support. And I don't know if it's quite on this agenda item, but you did bring up recycling. I will remind you, um, Redway is not taking recycled oil anymore. And I know, unfortunately, beginning of COVID, there was a lot of used motor oil dropped off in Alder Point area. So advocating for some way for a free collection site for used motor oil maybe once a week at building and planning or something like that. I don't know. Let's just uh, protect our environment in that aspect. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Thomas. And I believe that's all we have for public comment, correct, Ryan? You are correct, Sheriff Fennell. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much. Okay, so back to um, Paul and Karen. And the board, any further discussion on this item? Uh, thank you. I just you. want to make a, oh yeah. Just, just I just want, I mean, point. I just want to thank him for being here and, and uh, you know, meeting with, with us individually and being available to us, uh, mm -hmm. both in this format, but also when we're in Sacramento, you know, um, it's always helpful to have people to be able to talk to you there and um, have, have that. So I appreciate it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Wilson. And I just want to note for the record that uh, in our staff report is a very, very robust presentation um, line outline of all of the bills that we're looking at. And uh, I really, really appreciate that. So thank you for that. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the, the report. I make the motion that we accept the report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Ryan, we'll have a roll call vote, please. Thank you. Supervisor Madrone? Yes. 
Supervisor Bone? Yep. Supervisor Bass? Yes. Supervisor Wilson? Aye. And Supervisor Fennell? Yes. Thank you. Passes five. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much for all of your efforts on our behalf. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care. Uh, take care of you too. So that brings us to the item that uh, had been asked to put on the consent agenda, uh, but we are going to uh, bring it forward at least. And I see that uh, Director Matson is here. It's the approval of the Gosselin subdivision in the Fortuna area. Uh, Director Matson. Um, oh, okay. Mr. Bronco, welcome, and Mr. Benson. Um, um, I'm here, um, Tom Matson, Director of Public Works. Welcome, uh, thank you, Chair Fennell, members of the board. As stated earlier, this was a mistake when we clicked the wrong button when we submitted, it should have went on consent, um, but I will turn it over to Mr. Bronco to go over the staff report and uh, complete this item. Thank you. Thank you, Director Matson. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. Um, excuse me, wait a minute, Bob. Uh, Supervisor Bob? But I, I appreciate Tom, or, you know, both Bob and Tom want to do this, but since it was supposed to be on consent anyway, can I make a motion we just approve this? Because we've had this in front of us two or three times. This has been going on for almost 15 years. I, I think it's been, this horse has been whooped to death. And I mean, Bob can give his presentation again. No offense, Bob. But for the matter of time and everything else, unless somebody sees a problem now at this late hour of this project, I would like to just make a motion to accept staff's recommendation one through eight. We well, made a motion and I'll second that wherever it goes from here. Yeah, and, and just for clarity, and I'm sure Bob can, can clarify that too. This is basically just approving the map that came out of all the further discussions, the unanimous decision at the planning commission in September of 2019, but yeah, go for it, Bob, if you want to add anything. Uh, just briefly, the uh, subdivisions, final map subdivisions, which are the big track maps, do require that the Board of Supervisors accept and approve the subdivision at the conclusion of the process, and that's where we are. Normally, it's a consent agenda item. However, in this case, due to a clerical error in preparing the agenda item. They got routed as a departmental item. Uh, other smaller subdivisions are approved internally by the Director of Public Works. These are the only ones that do require approval by the board, and we request that the board adopt the recommendations in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, with that, um, I will go, uh, unless there's discussion further here at the board, I'll go for public comment. Okay, going to public comment. I see one raised hand. Welcome. Estelle, thank you. I, I just always go for policy, procedure, and protocol, and so I have no comments on this particular project other than I do appreciate uh, recognizing that once it's put in a certain category. I know a, a comment was made before from the dais up there that it's really common to to go ahead and move things uh possibly that happens in other other jurisdictions but i've never recall that happening in a supervisor chamber if any of you can refresh my memory as far as something uh, that's been agendized for the thing being put on consent and there usually is a process for that where it's voted i guess voted to go there anyway thanks for crossing your t's and dotting your i's thank you kent Back to the board, any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Ryan, let's go for a roll call vote. On Thank the you. Supervisor Bone? Yes, please. Supervisor Wilson? Aye. Supervisor Madrone? Aye. That was a no? No. That was a no. Okay. Actually, I'm I want to. Uh, I, need, I need to vote to. I was going to change my vote to a no because I just remembered what this was and go reviewing it again and again. No, no for me as well. Yes, for me. 
and and then Supervisor Bass. Yes. So it passes three to two with Supervisor Madrone and Supervisor Wilson with with the notes. Correct. Thank you um, very much, everybody. So the next item on our agenda is actually uh, we we had um, H two removed for a later date. Um, so the next item on the agenda is a planning commission, I mean, sorry, uh, 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 an appeal, a hearing, and that's at 1.30. So we now get to have a nice break for lunch for, for the first time in a while. And we'll see you back here at 1.30, unless you guys want to go into closed session. To closed session. I, I just hope, I'm just asking that we have at least a half hour break prior to the um, the 130 item. You know, I so if we can get close session, I'm fine with that, but I think we all need, you know, I know my brain cobs would need to be kind of like swept out at some point. Okay, well, we do yeah. have five items on uh, the closed session, and um, I'd ask Council Billingsley to give us an idea of how long it would take. Uh, oh, well, I, before we discuss what they are, because we may or may not do it. So any idea on how long they might take, Council Billingsley? I don't think they would all be finished within half an hour. Um, potentially some of them could be. I don't know if you want to do them as a group or if you want to try to split it up. I would be okay with just having a 45 minute break for lunch for once. I think, I don't think that's like a huge deal. <laughs> I don't really understand. An <laughs> I was thinking doing half of them just because I want to get, you know, done before like 10 o'clock tonight, the way things that could be looking, but I'm fine with whatever. 45 minutes is a fine break as well. Or hour. An hour. It's actually an hour. Yeah. I'll do whatever. Um, Three and a half hours. I'm okay, but whatever. <sighs> okay. So I'm going to do a straw vote. <laughs> Mike. Mike wants a break, right? I, I want a break. Thanks. Okay. Um, how about you, Virginia? You want, oh, you want half and half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rex wants to go forward. Okay. And then uh, Steve? Um, I'd like to go forward, but I recognize we need to have a break, so I'll split the baby in two, half and half. Okay. So, all right. So, with that in mind, we're going to go to, we have five items, which do we go, do we announce all five of them now, Council Billingsley, or do we pick what we're going to talk about and, and announce the other ones later? Chair, I believe it'd be appropriate to announce all five and take comment. Whatever isn't completed, okay. the, the board will have to go back into closed session. That sounds good. Okay, thank you. So if you I, I would, will, please I introduce. I will note that we have not taken a break once, just saying, for this whole time. <laughs> so. Well, we're going to, I'll tell you what we'll do, um, Mike. We will make it that whatever we have done by one o'clock, we're going to take a half an hour before the next item. All right, because some of us have kids at home we got to deal with and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, it's like, this is what? kind of ridiculous. Supervisor Fennel. <laughs> Why don't we let him announce it? And then why don't we take, it sounds like there's issues being need to be done right now. Can we come back at 1255 and that'll give us 35 minutes to address everything else refreshed, um, emptied out and ready to refuel. I, I would prefer to jump in and do 20 minutes of closed session and then have a break before the next one. I mean, you know, I just saying like, okay. Oh, uh, whatever. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's we got three three votes for that. So let's do it. All right. Council Billingsley, all five items, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's the intention of the board to meet in closed session on five five items. The first is pursuant to government code 54956.9D1 to discuss existing litigation in the case of Avid Marg versus County of Humboldt at all, case number 19 CV 05891RMI. Uh, there are three items under government code 54957 to consider public, excuse me, public employee appointments. Those are for the position of one health officer, two county council, and three director of library services. 
And the last item is a conference with labor negotiator pursuant to code 54957.6. It's the intention of the board to meet in closed session to review the county's position and instruct its designated labor negotiators, Kelly Barnes, Alicia Hayes, and Jack Hughes. The employee organization is the Humboldt Deputy Sheriff Organization. Thank you, um, Councilor Billingsley. We'll go to public comment on um, this closed session. And we have two. Uh, let's go forward. Estelle Kamsawatsky. Mm -hmm. uh, I did. I did wish to um, I, settle case number one whenever you can in a reasonable manner. When you come to a point for position for health officer, I'm asking you to find someone who that will take them and give the maximum leeway to the businesses and the citizens of Humboldt County that can be done under law. I'm actually asking you for someone who will just go ahead and, and, and engage in what I call uh, Sacramento nullification should the, the rules be not tenable and not not crafted in a manner that fits our local uh, needs uh, of our constituents here. So that's the kind of person I would like to see in there, not the same old, same old, but a complete different new prospect for someone who really has has that kind of a, a heart and, and, and agenda. So uh, your Mike crystal ball says number number three. You're probably going to uh, point Jeffrey there, and uh, I'm going to leave that one to you, folks. Uh, when it comes time to meet with your deputy sheriff's organization, I'm going to keep con saying that everybody's going to need to take a haircut here. I highly recommend that these organizations volunteer to lower their pages, pay or their benefit and continue to provide services at its existing level. Uh, if there's good times, you know that people get top dollar when there's not. My outlook is that the, that the other counties and in, within the state are going to be suffering more than us, and we may find that there's more people wanting to come up here and work in our area than there is down south, especially in areas that are no longer there and have no funding. And the library services, well, that one's been on there about five times, so maybe you'll do something someday on that one. That's all I have to say on your closed session. That was an interesting discussion you had uh, regarding the closed session. And, uh, but I can understand uh, Mike Wilson's viewpoint where we all have families to, to manage and, and if he's in, engaged with that with his children, you, get, you guys deserve to have a full hour between these meetings and I would try and go ahead and budget that in any way possible in the future so that uh, things can be taken care of, especially family, it comes first. Thank you, Kent. Um, next caller, please. And Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Thomas Mulder here um, on the health officer appointment. Um, I think it'd be nice for the public to be able to know as well as the board and be able to disclose when the board has the authority to supersede the health officer's orders, because I know that question has been asked all through this COVID and the public has never, ever gotten an answer with that. Also, I would say if you're going to appoint someone, appoint someone that can take harsh questions, strong questions, strong questions from the public and be able to answer when they're having to work massive overtime, answer to the public of what that takes. I know there's differing opinions, but it, the public needs to have the right to know when the board has the authority to supersede. Uh, county council appointment, uh, I just am gonna say, I hope you appoint someone that you don't pay $600,000 to sit at home and do nothing for. So I read a story and I just hopefully lean towards that. And on negotiations, uh, I, I, I know a lot of people want a lot of money and it's a tough thing, it's competitive, but maybe get them closed up before November. Thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you. So with that, we will go into closed session and we will be back at uh, 1.30 for the public hearing at which point we'll report out or I'm not sure what, how we'll do that, but we will be back at 1.30. Thank you. Back. Um, we have everybody right here to the screen. We've got Supervisor Wilson, Brian back. Majorn, we'll go to, okay. All right, Brian, Ryan, are we ready to roll? Okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. So we're back and uh, the first item and actually the only item besides uh, some additional closed session items are the all, is the all points 
outdoor appeal of the planning commission denial. And um, this actually, uh, Council Billingsley, is a continuation of that appeal. Chair? Council Billingsley, uh, yes. If I may, it may make sense to do a partial report out. On okay, the let's session. do that first. Um, All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on item L1, mm -hmm. uh, there is no reportable action. And on item L4, the board voted unanimously to reaffirm the designated labor negotiators. Uh, the remaining items, the board plans to reconvene back into closed session after the public hearing. And for the public hearing, I'll be turning that over to Scott Miles. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Scott, welcome. <clears throat> If you can uh, unmute your uh, audio and uh, introduce the staff, the uh, public could, hearing. Uh, Chair oh, Fennell, no, this is not an ordinance, so it doesn't require an introduction by the uh, County Council's office. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that, Director Ford. So I'll let you take take the uh, the reins from here. Thank you. Good afternoon again. Uh, John Ford with the Planning and Building Department. Joining me is Steve Lazar and Steve Warner to present the appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of the All Points Outdoor Advertising sign. So one of the uh, things that uh, this was continued to uh, do is to allow staff to uh, research additional information that was brought up uh, at the prior hearing. And uh, we have done that and we've included that within the board report. And we're gonna summarize it briefly today as part of the presentation to the board. I just want to uh, say as we begin that uh, this is new information that uh, would be appropriate to have public uh, comment on. And, and so the public comment should be allowed to focus on this new information. And so with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Lazar to go ahead and uh, give staff the staff presentation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Chair Fennell. Thank you, Director Ford. I'm going to do a PowerPoint slideshow um, just to make sure everything's working. Can everybody see? Let's see. Can everybody see what's on my screen or do I need to share my screen? So. No, cannot see that yet, Steve. Okay. Let me do that. Okay. There we go. Should be working. Okay. Yep. There it is now. Thank you. So, uh, as Director Ford mentioned, this is a continued public hearing on an appeal of a planning commission decision. Uh, the project involves the repair of a billboard that was damaged in 2019, uh, late November of 2019 during winter storms. It is a non-conforming structure. We went over that in the last public hearing. It means it's a lawful, it was lawfully erected prior to our zoning regulations and doesn't conform to the current code. And thereby, uh, our code requires that when a, when a non-conforming structure is destroyed, it can be rebuilt with a special permit. Ordinarily, these can be approved by the director of the department, but given the controversy that uh, it was immediately obvious with regard to this project, it was presented to the Planning Commission at several public hearings. It was ultimately denied by the Planning Commission on May 7th, and, a, and an appeal was filed by the applicant and the owner of the property, uh, all points advertising, all points outdoor. Um, the first hearing was held before the board on July 28th. And as director Ford mentioned, during that hearing, we received public comments, um, both in support and opposed to the project. The, some, some of the concerns raised during the hearing and in the public comments involved uh, potential conflicts with public trust resources, uh, the validity of the outdoor advertising permit that's been issued through Caltrans, Office of Outdoor Advertising has been put into question, as well as uh, there was challenge made of, of the decision to cite several CEQA categorical exemptions in our analysis of the environmental impacts from the project. The public hearing was continued to August 18th to allow us to address some of the concerns and a continuance was requested to 
uh, for additional time, mostly because as part of our response, we prepared a mitigated negative declaration pursuant to CEQA, which has a 30 day timeline. And we were awaiting the results of an inquiry with the State Lands Commission. Quick summary, this is the action summary from the board July 28th meeting. Staff were directed to determine the location and extent of the excavation required for new footings. There was a bit of confusion with regard to the overall sign design. And we were asked to work with the applicant to, to nail down those details. We have done that. Um, there was a request to look into the public trust resource claims that were mentioned earlier, and also to look into the, the outdoor advertising permit and consult with Caltrans. And there was concerns raised about cultural resources and we were tasked with investigating that as well. With regard to the reconstruction, we have been able to nail down quite a bit of the details to the point where we can say with confidence, this is the project that is being sought and if approved would be implemented. Uh, the sign in its existing condition and, and design uses 18 supporting posts. Uh, the Several of the posts were damaged when the billboard collapsed, but many uh, are still have structural integrity and can be reused. Uh, so 12 of them are proposed to be reused. Um, reconstruction plans uh, were modified uh, essentially to reflect this and new engineering was provided by the civil engineer who prepared the original plans. And those plans were reviewed and approved by our building official, but they are awaiting the outcome of this uh, permit request as well as uh, the Coastal Commission that would come in the wake of any approval to it. <coughs> With respect to the reconstruction, as I mentioned, 12 of the posts can re be retained in this diagram here. Those would be all the posts that are not red. The easternmost posts, both the main supporting posts as well as the rear braces would need to be replaced with new posts. And this is a photo showing kind of that portion of the billboard. You can see the ones that would be retained here on the left and on the right, you can see the ones that have been compromised. With respect to the amount of ground disturbance required to install these new posts, there would be holes that would be 18 inches wide. They would be located in the same location as where the existing posts that have been damaged are. The depths of the holes would vary depending on the location of the, the support. So the main vertical supports are deeper. They are five feet deep. And the braces, the post holes for those are three feet deep. These are photographs. There was some question uh, raised by some of our uh, members of the public with regard to the existing conditions for the supports that are out there. And the applicant uh, went out and took photographs and, and to expose the upper portion of the foundation or the footings for these, these billboard supports. Um, so you can see in these photographs here, this is the concrete uh, at the top of the post. It isn't immediately above ground. It's about 18 inches below the, the surface of the ground. And, uh, but, but there are existing concrete footings for each of the posts that are out there right now. And this is a detail showing, once again, the concrete footing and the post depth and the variation depending on whether they're the braces or the main vertical support. And in addition to the excavation, uh, the, any spoils that are generated that need that would otherwise be deposited on site will be removed in buckets and any excess concrete uh, that gets poured in the hole that uh, isn't used will be removed from the site as well. That's a condition of approval and a mitigation measure. With respect to the public trust resource concerns, we did a site visit. On, on August 1st, and we traveled to the site via boat to get a feel for uh, the actual accessibility and relationship between the structure and nearby uh, coastal waterway, the Elk River. The closest boat launch to the project site would be at Hillfooker Lane. It's not a, a official boat launch, but it is one that's available through the Hickshari Trail. And for small vessels, it is available for, for launching. And we, we, we uh, entered the Elk River near its mouth with Humboldt Bay. Um, we did it, we timed it to make sure that we were there during a high tide event. You can see here the tide table it was a 5.4 uh, tide and, it, and we came just at noon as it was crested. The sign supports during the site visit were all above the water level the, at the time we were there. And from the look of the kind of witness marks along the bank, you can see where there's obvious signs in the discoloration of the 
the grasses that 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 sort of indicates the ordinary mean high water mark and the sign supports were well above it. This photo is actually a picture of the two billboards that are also on the property at the south end and you can kind of get a feel for where those supports look in relation to the tide line. And uh, we also went up river a little bit further than the sign just to see how far it was navigable and it, it becomes very dense with willows and, and impassable beyond the sign about a mile upstream. We did submit a public trust inquiry through the State Lands Commission for the board's direction and received a response on August 24th. In the response, the State Lands Commission made note that the the, the sign did not appear to be located on state sovereign land and it would therefore not be subject to public trust. The Harbor District, they noted in their letter, does retain interest over tidally influenced portions of the Bay, including the Elk River, though in earlier consultation prior to uh, during the Planning Commission consideration of the project, we had approached the Harbor District to see if they would be interested in asserting jurisdiction and conversations with the director, Larry Ocker, it, it, they indicated they did not they did not wish to assert jurisdiction. They did not view it as within their jurisdiction. With respect to the outdoor advertising permit, some confusion has been uh, surrounds the fact that the permit, the historical permit information may not uh, reflect the uh, the current location of the sign and and we approached and we spoke with Caltrans outdoor advertising staff, uh, George Anzo, who leads the permitting department for outdoor advertising. Uh, in, in our conversations, Mr. Anzo made clear to, to me that the, their database shows a permit for this sign. There's a history of signage uh, with permitting and the permit holder is out front media. Uh, Mr. Anzo said that at this time, they had no reason to believe that the permit was not valid and that any discrepancies needed to be further investigated and they had not completed that task. And uh, and so at this time, per Caltrans, what we can tell you is the outdoor advertising permit is, is considered valid. It's also worth noting that because there is a permit associated with the site and because the site, because the sign fell over, it prompts the outdoor advertising act requires that the permit holder be notified that they have responsibility to erect the sign. And a letter was sent to that effect on June 9th by Mr. Anzo and required that the sign be erected uh, within 60 days. And if it isn't completed, then the, the outdoor advertising permit can be revoked. However, there is provisions in the Outdoor Advertising Act that allow for an extension request by a permittee where they have just cause and a request was filed by uh, the uh, folks at, uh, sorry, uh, Outfront Media. It was received and last night, Mr. Anzo shared with me uh, a recent letter that was sent out on September 11th, whereby a six month extension had been granted by the Office of Encroachment and Outdoor Advertising Permits. And it requires that the, the permit holder complete any repairs by February 8th, 2021. Lastly, it's worth noting that in the Outdoor Advertising Act, there are provisions for uh, protecting or recognizing displays in the language of the act that that exist at the time of certain milestones, one of them being November 6, 1978. There's protections for compensation if a sign is forced to be removed in the case where a sign predates that date. But in addition, there's what's called a rebuttable presumption that if the, if the person who holds the sign hasn't been contacted for a period of five years and told that the, the display wasn't lawfully erected, that is presumed to be lawfully erected. The complicating part about that is this isn't something that gives you a permit under the Outdoor Advertising Act. It's something that you can invoke in the event that your permit is brought into question, either through revocation uh, or some other action. And, and when that happens, it would be in an administrative law court and the judge would have to give consideration to it. So for all of these reasons, we feel confident that the permit is valid. And if for some reason in the event that it was subject to revocation, that, that the rebuttable presumption provision would also provide some protections to the, to the permit holder and ultimately it would be uh, recognized. With respect to the cultural resource concerns that were raised during the last public hearing, 
we had already engaged with both the Weot Tribe and Bear River Band of the Runnerville Rancheria, who have uh, who have both uh, have ancestral territory in this in this portion of the county. Um, during our initial engagement with them in December of last year, uh, they responded saying that they didn't have any knowledge of any kind of cultural resources in the vicinity or any potential sensitivity, and that the standard conditions for inadvertent discovery, whereby if something were encountered during excavation at all construction activities halt, that, that would be enough to, to uh, cover any concerns. Um, when we prepared the mitigated negative declaration um, in, recent, in, in August, we once again engaged with them to offer a consultation pursuant to the AB 52 provisions of CEQA, and they declined the invitation to consult. And in conversations, they've once again affirmed they don't have any concerns about potential cultural resource sensitivity. With respect to CEQA, uh, in response to some of the comments that were raised, uh, staff uh, worked with the applicant and moved forward with the preparation of a initial study and mitigated negative declaration. Uh, the mitigated negative declaration and, uh, memorializes a number of mitigation members that were previously part of the, the earlier project design and submittal, including the reconstruction plan and best management practices. Uh, in, a, in response to some of the concerns about public trust and water quality, uh, restrictions were placed on the timing of excavation associated with the new post holes that would be dug and a requirement for the spoils to be removed from the site. In addition, there's prohibitions on sign lighting. The sign has never been lit um, in recent years and it's restricted under the conditions of approval of the project, the recommended conditions, and there's a restriction on the use of pressure treated wood. And the plans that have been submitted and approved by the building division show the use of uh, non-pressure treated wood for the support. Um, the resolution for the board's consideration should you choose to approve the project today has been revised to reflect the use of the mitigated negative declaration and the public comment period on the mitigated negative declaration ended on September 11th. There has been some questions raised and comments made on the on the MND with respect to our choice of uh, setting an environmental baseline whereby the sign is correct. And our reasoning for that uh, follows is as follows. There is a history of signage at this site. The sign proposal is not a new sign, it is repair. I think the, the, the kind of close up view of the reconstruction plans gives you that insight. We're talking about six new supports, 12 to be retained, and much of the original materials to be reused and re reattached. Um, so it, it wouldn't be appropriate in, a, in terms of environmental analysis for us to treat this as a new sign because it would over um, it, 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 would, it would overestimate the amount of impacts associated with the project. And also under the zoning regulations, it would not be permissible as a new sign. So it would be inconsistent with the analysis that's the underpinnings for the actual permit that's being considered. These next few slides are just to show some of the baseline considerations. The, uh, let's see, it looks like it's lagging us a little bit here. Oh, let's go back. Um, and, and they were prepared just to kind of re-emphasize. So for, for purposes of our analysis, we look at the baseline as there being a sign here. We have uh, photographs that support that and at various intervals over the years, as you can see this exhibit from 1957, showing the location of where signs are on the property. Also the fact that there were two different signs at one point one facing northbound traffic, one facing southbound traffic at the same exact location. And then here in, in the course of submitting our public trust inquiry, we consulted with historical mapping to provide with the submittal and learned that this actual site lies adjacent to a former alignment of the county road that traveled to Eureka. This was the main route north and south from and to Eureka. And you can see here in this map from 1916 that there was a bridge across the Elk River in a different location than today. You can see the modern bridge that uh, we have two different bridges for the north and southbound sections of 101. And the bridge that used to cross Elk River crossed much, much further downstream and came out at Elk River Corners. And the evidence of that is still on the ground. You can see the supports. Uh, at the Elk River. This was taken during the site visit. These are supports for the former bridge, as well as if you look, oops, 
if you look closely at the uh, the vegetation, you can see the uh, signs of the. Sorry, I kind of a little crazy with the, the mouse here, but you can see the signs on the satellite contemporary satellite image of that alignment today. So you can see this this these faint traces in the vegetation where that alignment used to be. So it, it's just worth noting because this, we're not talking about a pristine piece of property. It has a history of development as well as billboard development that's demonstrated in the photos. So uh, staff is uh, once again, recommending approval of the project, as mentioned, prohibitions on sign lighting, post hole digging and timing of it, um, and as well as restrictions on navigability of the Elk River and, and public use and enjoyment of it. Uh, there's still a requirement that other agencies be uh, be worked with to get additional approvals before any kind of building permit will be issued. Uh, meeting the building regulations has been demonstrated through the building permit is ready to, to be issued. The BMPs that are included, no heavy machinery, electric hand tools, uh, no chemical treated woods, and the treatment of spoils are all conditions of approval. We also want to make sure that if the board chooses to approve the project today, that they include an additional condition requiring the applicant to sign an indemnification agreement uh, and the director has been uh, identified as the, the representative for the county to sign on behalf of the county and this condition language is uh, being provided for your reference and we would it should should a motion to approve uh, move forward we would request that you include this additional condition language. There is an alternative to uh, a non-conditional approval or an unconditional approval and that could be through the application of a permit term in this case, we're suggesting the use of 15 years as the most recently approved new billboard that uh, we've issued a permit for through our, our department had a 15 year term limit for similar reasons and was proven acceptable by the applicant at that time. It is important to note that there is no obligation to approve this permit. It is, it is uh, under the Outdoor Advertising Act. However, should it be approved unconditionally, the board should know that to remove it in the future, and by unconditionally, I mean without any kind of set term limit, to remove it in the future would require some form of compensation. And, and so that is an important consideration when deciding which way to go should approval of a permit be uh, considered. Lastly, denial is an option. There is latitude under the findings that are required for approval of the special permit for the board to deny the project. And should the board decide to do that, we would ask that you uh, to uh, continue this item to uh, to the next hearing uh, to allow for us to prepare the resolution to reflect the board's decision. And when continuing, before continuing, make sure that you make uh, make us give a good reasoning for what it is the basis for the denial. So with that, uh, I'll end my presentation and I am available for questions should you have any. Go ahead and unmute it, Estelle. Estelle, you're Thank you. there. Thank you very much, Rex. Yeah, do we have anybody here uh, to speak? Oh, I see Jeff's here. Uh, anybody here to speak on behalf of the appellant? I also see Mr. Slack online. Both Jeff's. Does either of, the, either of those representing the appellant Okay, Mr. Slack. I would just uh, thank the uh, planning department. I think they've done a very nice job in summarizing the findings and showing that this project is in compliance with the county codes. Um, the only thing I'd uh, add is um, in reviewing the project under the Humboldt Bay Area Plan, um, existing projects in this area can be approved and existing uses can be continued. And um, other than that, I have no further comments. Thank you, Mr. Slack. Um, did uh, Mr. Will speak to speak? Okay. Me? Oh, yeah. Here you go. Yep. Welcome. Uh, I'm here. I have uh, no comment. Staff report summed up well, but I am available if anyone has questions of me. 
Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll bring it back to the board and uh, let's see. Let, let's have some uh, testimony from the public, if there is any, before it comes back to the board. Um, currently, I do not see any hands raised. Uh, perhaps Ryan, you can remind people if you if you wish to comment on this item, you can press star line star nine, excuse me, and then uh, when you're in the queue, you press uh, star six. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment on this item? Seeing none. Uh, oh, okay. We do have one hand raised now. We go to that person. Ryan will, the, it's the numbers ending in 3674. And I would like to remind you, by the way, that as this is a continued item, we just want comments on the new items that were discussed here by Steve. So if you have comments on those new items, uh, please join us. Um, you need to press star six. There you go. Welcome. Hello. Welcome, Colin. Um, Hello. I guess I've been pressing star nine for like 15 minutes, so I'm not really sure how many other people have been having trouble getting in. Hello, supervisors. My name is Jennifer Kalt. I'm with Humboldt Baykeeper. And, um, well, I guess, um, I just want to say that on behalf of Humble Baykeeper, it is, it is quite stunning to see the layer upon layer of reasoning in the CEQA document for approving a permit that um, we all know would never be allowed to be built today. And, um, you know, our goal is to preserve coastal wetlands and open space for the benefit of all of the people of California, not just for one private sign odor's use. And, um, you know, one thing that just really stands out to me is the lack of evidence in the CEQA document. The, um, on the same page of the CEQA document, page 25, um, it says that there won't be any significant impacts to wetlands because the ground disturbing activities will be located within upland portions of the property, which would mean outside of the wetland. And then later on the same page, it says the entirety of the parcel is a wetland. Um, I would note, you know, there's not any wetland delineation. No biologist has, has examined the wetlands and determined that there even are any uplands on the site. Um, the the um, district's jurisdiction being determined by a phone conversation just is a complete mystery to me. But anyway, um, in short, I would just urge you to recognize that this billboard had a basically good run of many, many decades, and it's time to get rid of this billboard and other billboards on our coastal wetlands. And um, you know, it doesn't comply with the zoning. It's, it's on an environmentally sensitive habitat. There's no mention of wetland buffer areas as required by the Humboldt Bay Area Plan, which is the planning document that governs this area of the county's coastal zone. Um, and so given that there's no vested right for the billboard, I hope that you will just deny it and um, move on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Jennifer. Uh, we do have another caller and um, welcome. Hi, Estelle. This is Tom Wheeler, Executive Director of EPIC. Um, I'd like to say first off, just ditto to um, what my friend Jen called of Humble Baykeeper had to say. Uh, and specifically, I would, I, I, I disagree with the um, analysis offered in the ISMND. Um, and Mr. Lazar spoke to, I think was my largest issue, which is an incorrect baseline use for consideration of other impacts. Uh, so for CEQA purposes, baseline is that thing against which you consider impacts. So in the ISMND, it assumes that the billboard is standing. Obviously this is not true, right? So the correct baseline 
should be no billboard, as is down now. And absent an overturning of the Planning Commission's decision, the sign will not be replaced. So that is the correct baseline against which impacts need to be considered. In this way, the sequel analysis fails to examine impacts as it assumes something that does not exist. So here's one way that this, uh, this um, flawed assumption manifests itself in the ISMMD. So for example, in examining impacts of potential view sheds, the ISMMD assumes that there will be no impacts because it wrongly assumes a billboard is currently standing. Obviously, by allowing the billboard to be wholly rebuilt as this would do, it would impact view sheds. So throughout the ISMMD, we see flaws. It is incurably flawed because of this initial incorrect assumption of baseline. So I, I urge as a matter of public policy and as a matter of adherence to CEQA that the Board of Supervisors affirm the Planning Commission's vote and uh, not allow this billboard to be rebuilt in a coastal wetland. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, any further comments on this item? Uh, yes, we do have another caller coming in. Press star six to be to join us on uh, at the meeting, please. Press star six. Caller with number ending in nine two three eight. If you could, there you go. Welcome. Oh, hi. Uh, I, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity for your input. Um, my name is Gary Falks, uh, and uh, first up, uh, to echo what I, you've already heard from uh, Tom Wheeler and Jen Call, I, I would ask you to support the Planning Commission's decision by denying this appeal. This would be consistent with the Coastal Act and, and with current zoning for this, for this part of Humboldt Bay. Um, and and to dive into some of the details, uh, uh, Tom you pointed out some of the problems with the, the, the secret document, the initial study and mitigated neg deck. And uh, I just was, also want to point out that it, it, it doesn't really adequately disclose or address the billboard's true location within wetlands and very close to Elk River, you know, which is an arm of Humboldt Bay, flows into Humboldt Bay. Um, and to me, there's a reasons to, to deny the appeal. The, you know, the, the sale billboard is, is within the wetlands of Humboldt Bay and is in close proximity to a tidal arm of, of the bay, the Elk River. Um, and there's some specific problems with the secret document. Uh, for one thing, it's, it, uh, um, I, I visited the site on, on July 28th and, and took measurements and footings of the billboard are actually within just four horizontal feet of a tidal arm of Elk River. And this is not at all disclosed. So it, 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 it leads you to believe that it's much further away from um, the Elk River and its tidal arms. And that simply isn't true. It's, it's very close. I mean, if you imagine just a little bit of erosion of that tidal arm, um, four feet's nothing. Um, again, this is documented. I provided this photos of this with measurements to the planning department and to, to members of, the, of this board on August 11 in an email. Um, also, the, the initial study mitigated neck deck on page 25 is inconsistent when it, whether this is wetland or not. It, it states that all proposed new ground disturbing activities will be located within upland portions of the property. And uh, then later on the same page, it says the project is located within a wetland environment. Uh, and the fact that these wetlands are, are recognized as a environmental sensitive habitat area in, in, within the coastal plan. Um, and in the May 7th uh, staff report also stated that the entirety of the parcel is a wetland. And certainly to my eyes, when I saw it, it's, it's all a wetland but they're talking about it being upland where they're planning to do the work. Um, and I think that before any decision is made to up, if they're considering upholding the appeal, uh, a professional should survey the site to delineate wetlands and determine the title status of the, of the billboard location and its footings. Um, and it's also much more, the title exposure of that area is, is greater than is, is indicated in the mitigated neck deck. They talk about it being, um, half the days that tie, high tides don't exceed five and a half feet or 5.4 feet, which is kind of, a, it's tied into one of their mitigation measure. And I went through a tide chart and in fact, on 99% of days, you know, there are two tide, high tides in most days, on 99% of the days in 2020, at least one high Thank tide exceeded 5.4 feet. So again, please do the right thing for Humboldt Bay and deny the appeal. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I 
don't believe we have any further comment. And as I see, I am go up soon. I'm going to close public comment on this item. No, no more hands going up. I'm going to close public comment on this item and bring it back to the board and uh, request that um, Mr. Lazar uh, or Director Ford could give us some uh, responses maybe to the issues brought up in public comment. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I am looking for the uh, reference that was made to it uh, the sign being in an upland portion of the site. I think throughout we've been pretty clear that we thought that this was within a wetland itself. And and so we're not trying to hide that by any means. Uh, we do recognize that this is an existing sign. The existing sign exists within a wetland. And, and if I could go back and put this in a little bit of context, because this is really, really important. We're not considering a new sign. This is not an application to put in something that didn't previously exist. This is an application that the zoning ordinance allows a special permit to be considered for the reconstruction of a non-conforming structure. And so that is the context. That's the regulatory context that we're dealing with here. And unfortunately, we're also in a location. This doesn't absolve us of the environmental responsibility. So don't hear me say anything incorrectly here, but we're also in a position where some of the permitting of the actual coastal elements, this is in retained jurisdiction of the coastal zone. So the, the coastal commission actually has the coastal permitting responsibility here. So the policy issue really before the, the board of supervisors, my screen is locked up. Am I coming across? Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Hopefully okay. you are. Sorry. Yes, you are, definitely. Thank you. So the, the policy issue that's really before the board here, you have the CEQA implications, we'll address those a bit more in a moment, but is whether or not the board wants to authorize reconstruction of an existing non-conforming structure. That, that is the question that the zoning ordinance puts before the decision-making body. You don't have to say yes. You don't have to say no. You, you get to weigh the, the merits of whether or not this is a situation where a non-conforming structure should be reconstructed. In most situations, something is identified as a non-conforming structure or in all situations, something's identified as a non-conforming structure because it does not comply with the zoning regulations that are in effect. And so by definition, it's non-conforming, it can't comply. So we're, we're not talking about something that we expect to comply with zoning, not talking about something we expect to comply with uh, the coastal uh, LCP. We're talking about whether or not this non-conforming structure should be reconstructed at this location. So um, the uh, so that being the case, this does exist within a wetland. There can't be wetland buffers. There there aren't things that um, can be done to make it comply with current requirements for development adjacent to a wetland. That's not what we're talking about. That, that's all for new development. While we're talking about here, and we've precisely tried to articulate this, that this is a like-for-like -like replacement, pulling a piece of concrete and a post out of the ground and replacing it with concrete and a post. With respect to the ba baseline, it's probably something that's fairly esoteric for people, but CEQA does allow to use an alternative baseline. And this is a rare but well-used practice. It's not the first time I've seen this, whereby using a bit baseline and declaring a baseline at a different date allows you to more precisely focus in on the issues that are um, likely to be encountered. The request here is to reconstruct an existing sign. The, the emphasis on existing sign. 
So why would we evaluate this like it doesn't exist? It's an existing sign. And, and so really the environmental impacts that are associated with this sign is what are the impacts of taking a piece of con six pieces of concrete and six posts out of the ground and replacing those with six pieces of concrete or six concrete dead, dead men, sorry for the uh, perhaps gender specific term and, and, and pieces and, and, and wood pilings. That's, that's what we're talking about. That's the environmental impact of, of this. Um, so, you know, throughout this, that has been the thing that confused, I think the planning, many of the planning commissioners, I can't speak for them directly, but there's a constant discussion about this being a new sign. This is not an application for a new sign. It's an application whether or not we're gonna reconstruct an existing sign. And whether or not it's a policy decision, the county wants to see a non-conforming structure remain at this location. You know, and, and in order to do that, the CEQA findings are simply what's involved in taking out six pieces of concrete and six posts and putting in six new pieces of concrete, six new posts, and reassembling this line. That's what the mitigated negative declaration attempts to capture. It is a sensitive location. It is a wetland environment. So there are things that are being done that are mitigation measures to protect that environment. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Director Ford. Um, any questions or comments from the board on this item? Supervisor Wilson. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, let me start off with, uh, you know, <clears throat> what's being asked of us is to grant an entitlement to basically create an, to, to vest the property. I mean, that, that does not exist currently. Is that correct? That, that is correct. I mean, right. It's not a vet. I mean, it's not a vested right. So we're being asked as representatives of the public to, um, to balance whether or not that is an appropriate thing for us to do for a non-conforming use, whether to vest a right for a non-conforming use, because currently that, that vested right does not exist, correct? Correct. So some people have asked me about like, why does that seem so like, uh, why is it controversial? Um, why do people talk about things like public trust resources? And I would say, you know, part of this is there is some discussion about this, but it isn't a wetland. Wetlands uh, by law are public trust resources, right? And we're and we're in we're endowed basically through the state. We're supposed to be protecting public trust resources in balance for the public's um, uh, benefit and in balance with these with these issues. And that comes from I mean that predates this you know basically the subdivision of these of these lands base you know, and so. That's our, that's from, from my perspective, that's our role. So we have to ask ourselves, what's the public benefit of vesting a right uh, to, to, to this, right? What, what, what is it that on balance, you know, what are we, so, so that's the part where I really feel like that's the, that's the imbalance here is like, you know, we're being asked as, you know, and the public is being asked to basically endure a blocking of their view shed impacting the wetlands uh, and all of these other things for this th for this uh, uh, for this structure to be there and you know and and sort of pollute our visual space because that vested right doesn't ag exist now so there, that is an action I mean I have to, I have to say like I kind of I, I understand why uh, there's this discussion about what is existing and not existing because without the vested right, it doesn't exist. You know, it will not, it, it will not exist. So, so, um, you know, we're being asked and on the other side, like, what is the benefit? Well, I mean, currently this piece of property or the combination of these properties pays about
kind of confused about that. So um, I guess from my perspective, I, mean, I, I, I have a couple of now I have just kind of technical questions, John. I saw the photograph of the one footing that was dug out and there was a photo of that. So the assumption is that 18 of these footings all have concrete and all are 18 inches in diameter and all are at the at depth of what is proposed in this design. How was that confirmed? And I want to say I, I went out to the site yesterday uh, and I and I found that some of those those uh, those those had uh, concrete footings, none of which I could confirm were 18 inches in diameter. They certainly did not appear to be 18 inches in diameter. And some of them just did not. And I have to tell you, some of those footings were quite rotten, you know, all, all the way through. So I'm kind of wondering, like, what's that confirmation in terms of that design? And can you kind of, can you speak to that? Yeah, I can. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Wilson. So this is not a comfortable answer, but one of the things that we have historically done in planning and building for decades is relied on the stamp of an engineer. And this is something, frankly, that uh, I'm questioning right now. And so when an engineer submits information to us and puts their stamp on it, we're anticipating that what they're saying is correct. We are receiving that as being honest and correct information that we can rely upon. If something were to happen whereby they went out and began to construct this sign, and we found out that the information that was not correct, then in normal circumstances, that would require a change order and a building permit. But in this particular case, it's far more complicated than that because there is a very specific entitlement being considered here that says only certain things can be done. And in that particular case, what would end up happening is that this permit would need to be revisited. So one of the things that has happened here is that if the uh, applicant's engineer has for whatever reason not been completely honest in disclosing uh, what exists, and that could be that the uh, concrete footings are of sufficient size, that could be the integrity of the wood that's there, uh, then this will need to be revisited again. And thank, thank you, John, uh, for for that. I, I'm going to try a screen share screen if I, if I might. I have not done it before, so I'm going to just See what happens here. Is, is, is it working? Yeah. Is there a thing? Can you see? There it is. Hey, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. All right. So one of the things I also noticed is sort of in the management of this site and impacts to wetlands, it was not ad addressed. And you can see in this historical photo, uh, there is mowing that occurs in a wetland. I mean, this is again impacts in a wetland um, that are that are not hold on. This is not doing what it's supposed to do. So you can see it again here in these historical photos. How is this, how is this activity? And again, these are in wetlands. How is this assessed in terms of the, the management of this, of this um, piece of property and its resource impacts? This is not. Is not, this is not a set. I'm going to say something real quick. That's okay. Caltrans that knows that, not us. I, that seems very strange to me because the permits to, to mow are Caltrans permits, but the application comes from um, out front media. So I don't understand why Caltrans would spend public dollars mowing private property owners. I, I don't believe that. I mean, that's not what I've seen in the past. And I have a hard time imagining why we would pay public dollars for that to occur. And the permit and the permit for mowing is is held by Outfront Media. So we've never um, permit. To so I, I will. I'll, I'll. I'll also. I want to talk a, a bit, if I can, with relationship to the construction of the of the site of the thing. You can see in this picture. Yes, it doesn't in this in this case. Right, it gets mowed, and sometimes it's not mowed. But mowing has happened, and it, and and it's a uh, it's it's obviously part and parcel of the management and maintenance of this piece of property. So. 
the what we're seeing here is you can see that the uprights are not evenly distributed. Right. And the three uprights on the left are the ones that are supposed to remain. And they're very closely tightly put together. I am I, I'm pretty sure the reason one of the reasons that this sign fell down is because of the location of these uprights in their uneven uh, stance, because what you're having is, you know, the the spans are farther apart and basically in a windstorm, you're just having uneven, you know, basically flapping around of that, of, of one side of the sign. And which is why, which is probably a good reason why this, this sign fell over and is not addressed in the design. I want to just say like the design assumes a, a fairly even uh, representation of that. I also want to show this, this photo I took yesterday. Um, there's the sign. You can see part of the footing um, in the back here, right here, right? You can see this is this is not even high tide. I just want to say like this is not high tide and moving up into the back of this of the of the site. What I found when I was at the site, I just want to be clear, was completely saturated soils, um, saltwater obligate plants. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's a here's a photo of of it. These are all pick this pickle weed. So the idea that this is not um, you know that. At least a portion of this of this project is not in salt marsh. I think is highly questionable um, because we have real evidence that it is, and and I, I think that that's part of the you know part of the questioning of this situation. And I I, I think that uh, again um, I'm not and then you can see some of the rot in there. Um, I, I'm just not confident that um, that. Uh, the assessment by the engineer is is good. I mean, I just think that this is not not so great. I'm gonna stop share for a second and hold on. I'm gonna go try. I'm try, this is all new to me, so I'm just trying to get to my sharing share screen. Oh, wait, hold on a second. I'm not good at this. Cause I have one more sharing screen going to. Okay, so this is the this is what was submitted by the uh, by the applicant. I mean, one of the things in the, in, that it also says in here is, uh, if old post cannot be removed, we will dig new one next to old post. So, again, that is um, that will, you know that is not uh, what's being represented in the CEQA document. Part of the problem I have with the SQL document was mentioned, I think, by one of the commenters is that when we have such significant <clears throat> environmental impact or uh, biological resources in this case, typically and by standard, you would have a biologist review that and make the determination because only a really a biologist can tell us whether or not the impacts are significant or not and tell us what, in their opinion, in their professional opinion, what is mitigatable and not mitigatable. And part of the problem here is without actual uh, evidence of the footings as they are, we don't know what that square footage impact is quite specifically, right? So if the threshold, which is, as we said before, is basically zero, you know, what we have is a situation where that's, uh, that's, um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty tough sell from an from a from an environmental perspective. Um, I want to go to the to see. So if you look here, you can see the the design, evenly spaced uh, uh, posts. This is definitely not representative of what's of what's being proposed on the ground. I want to be clear, and and basically. Uh, also, the other thing is, is if you're at the site, you don't even, you can't see any footings or, well, you can't see any of the concrete footings at all. The, the concrete footings that I found uh, on the site were minimally six inches deep, um, or excuse me, uh, yeah, minimally six inches deep. So in this case, you know, with the idea that this is, these, these footings will not be buried, right? And so you have a fundamental difference between the square footage of impact related to the footings that will be put in versus the footings that exist uh, in terms of their impact. So I, I just want to like point out like, again, I didn't really feel like I really wanted to get into the technical elements of these thresholds, but we're kind of forced to do so because we're, we have to technically 
go through these loopholes to grant a an entitlement and investing where none exists. Um, I'm going to stop here, but I have to say, like that's um, we're. I don't know where to I'm going to stop here for now. I have other comments related to the findings because I really find that we're really lacking in, in many of the findings, and I know people are getting tired of hearing me talk. So I'll take I'll let everybody have a break. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. If you can stop sharing your screen, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, so any other um, Supervi Supervisor Supervisor well, Wilson? I just I know Supervisor Wilson talked about the public trust, but I mean right there at the bottom of the page of the state lands. Um, state and sovereign land under the, under the jurisdiction of the commission is not subject to the public trust because it's private property. So, and then all unencumbered lands are turned over to the public trust or in the bays to the um, Harbor Commission, which you're so familiar with. Um, and I, you know, the, the public benefit, the view sheds and everything else, it's kind of like everything else. There's public benefit because of jobs. I don't think anybody advertises on these things that they're because they're losing money or don't don't enhance their businesses. So I, there's something to be played with this. I really think we're getting deep into the weeds. We asked a specific set of questions and got them answered. I really thought, and this may be my, I thought that there was something about when they dug the, the new holes or whatever they were gonna do, they were still going to have room for native soil on top like these other ones because just as you showed in that pickle weed growing up around the bottom of the base it seems like the the even the you know salt based plants are, are growing pretty healthy around it um and it's been there for 65 years and i've been watching it for 60 60 so i just and and again i i asked for permission to go out there and look at it and i've been out there three times and and um, I, I don't see the impacts we get. I know a lot of people have written a lot about half the letters we're talking about how we can um, afford to harm the Bay's view as they, you know, but you'd have to be on private property to enjoy the Bay's view and standing on a ladder if you're on the Elk River. It's on the other side of the freeway. And I, I, uh, I look at the one standing in water in front of the nuclear power plant and out there and i and i and i worry someday if, if those blow down but what the battle will be i just um jeff i mean all points has employees i've, I've been familiar with them um i've talked to quite a few businesses that advertise on them i've made to follow up on that and um they appreciate that everybody thinks we should be watching these on our phone but and we did get a lot of letters. I want to thank um, whichever group sent out sent to get the mass emails into us, and we do appreciate it um, for the input and everybody's. Uh, but it is private property. It I I think the the impacts are somewhat minimal. Um, I I think I don't know which caller said that it's had its run. I'm 66 years old and I hear people say that about me, but I don't know if I'm ready to check out yet, even though <laughs> I've had my run. So I, uh, and it's been there and has not been an issue. I, 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 we're talking about what it's going to do in the future. There's no impacts to show from in the past. And just, just so you know, I've seen the Caltrans tractor on the other side of the guardrail mowing. So I don't know if they do that out of a courtesy down to the sign, but they do mow on the other side. Same reason they're changing all the guardrails to metal. So in case there's a little brush fire, they don't burn the, the, the posts that they're on them. So um, with that, with that, and I mean, I know there's a lot of other discussion, I, but I mean, we can keep bringing these back with a little bit of things, but we've got a 60 page document. And I know some, one of the questions came out of page 25. I thought that was pretty good. They had to go that far. Um, a lot of people just don't like them and and i don't know if that's enough of a reason because they just don't like them because they they've been here and they're somewhere they've got to be grandfathered in and somewhere in here we've got a public benefit of jobs 
public benefit of jobs they supply to people that advertise. And um, I guess we can just keep throwing sequin, which has been answered almost everything, or else we can keep throwing rocks at everything that comes in front of us and nothing ever happens. And sometimes it feels like that and I'm sorry, but I, I see no reason to oppose staff recommendation on this just for the basic reason. We asked for direction to staff and I thought staff answered every question. So let's sit down and make a bunch more questions and then let's make a bunch more questions. Thank you, Supervisor Bones, Supervisor Bass, and then Supervisor Wilson. I, cool. um, I think I kind of know where Supervisor Bones is going. I actually asked some questions. Um, <clears throat> because, well, John, this is a special, where are you, John? There you are. Considering this is a, <clears throat> maybe I'll lose my voice in the middle of this, but um, because this is a special permit, I mean, I, Supervisor Bones says we can't, you know, we can say no, like it's not okay to say no, because people don't like them. They don't we go to that extent, but that is why it is a special permit, is it not? That we are the ones to have the discretionary say in this. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying how, what other people are thinking, but that was my understanding that, you know, we have to find, you know, reasons that work. And John, I don't know if you can answer that. Or are you frozen? Uh, Director Ford, um, your microphone needs to be turned on. Thank I think you. he's frozen. There, and, oh, there he is. Sorry about that. So the, the and I question, have others for you, John. Okay. So the, the question was, is, is, is there an answer that the board has to give relative to a special permit? And the answer to that is no, you're not obligated to answer either way. Um, cause I've been, I'm, a question I had also is, and I guess we can, if this goes too far, let me know, but do we know how many other non-conforming, um, like billboards and other things that are existing in similar situations? I mean, do we have an inventory of that? I don't know. I would look to uh, Steve Warner, Steve Lazar. I'm not aware that we've done an uh, inventory on on the number of billboards or the number of non-conforming billboards. Anything else? One of them. No, no, they're both um, yeah, shaking I, um, their heads. I couldn't see. Okay, thank you. Your eyesight's you know, better than mine. You know, because I, I, and I said this last time, and I, I truly believe it. I, I do think we need to come with a comprehensive plan, uh, at, on this item, not this item, but this, um, this, I guess you'd say, topic. And um, I'd like also, can you give me, John, a little more information on what that option, uh, the other option of the 15-year or such. Um, term that was limited, uh, that was mentioned in the staff report as an option? Yeah, so basically what that option attempts to do is to recognize that there may be an investment back to expectation with buying the property and having the billboard in place. And recognizing that an approval would vest that sign going forward. <laughs> the term limit would then cease that vesting at some point in the future so that it would be an approval for a limited period of time to allow a uh, recoup of the investment in the property. And, and then it would require that the uh, sign be removed, that appropriate permits be obtained and the sign be removed. Uh, the 15 years was a number that came from a prior approval, the Planning Commission approved a brand new billboard that's really important to consider. It was a brand new billboard and gave it a term of 15 years to allow the applicant to recoup the cost of the property, the lease, property or lease, and the construction of the billboard. Um, so the, the 15 years for an existing structure that is being re reconstructed may not be required. It, it 
may very well be that a far shorter term would be appropriate. Can someone Can turn I, their uh, mic off? There's a lot of background noise happening there. Um, yeah, I'm trying I, to disturb. Do you have another question have, to follow up on that? I said I'll, I'll probably Good have morning. some. Uh, I said I might have more. Okay. I'm, I'm good for now. I'm good for others. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Bass. Supervisor Wilson. Uh, thank you. I think one of the ways we really could turn this into a different direction um, and really talk about this in temporary status would be to uh, grant this uh, a billboard a permit for a term of five years. I think that um, that would recoup um, the repair costs if that's what the applicant chooses to do. I think um, it would be within a time frame that people can remember that it would actually happen and wouldn't get lost in the in the in the things in the fade of time um and uh i think that uh it's it's probably a it's probably i think a reasonable compromise from the perspective of how long the entitlements have been uh, in existence that no longer exists uh, and and i would mention that the property value i think was about nineteen thousand dollars at least it's assessed value so i don't know what the investment is but if there was an investment it, it wasn't you know it's nineteen thousand dollars is what we have on the books and is what's being paid for taxes on it so um i do know that these um you know the sort of retail prices are on these are somewhere between fifteen hundred and two twenty five hundred dollars a month so at an average of two thousand dollars that's well, that's that's quite a bit of money uh, over over a five year period. I think um, I think it's reasonable. Uh, I'm going to make a motion that um, we uh, uh, grant a, a permit uh, for five years uh, on this uh, on this billboard, and hopefully that will uh, ameliorate and bring down the concerns for um, permanent uh, impacts uh, to the site. Uh, uh, you know, from all, from all, you know, from all involved. And so that's, uh, I'm throwing that out there as a motion. Supervisor Bone, you had your hand up. I, I'd, I'd love to see if somebody seconds that. I'll second it for discussion. Sorry. Yeah, I, and I'm just going to say, I, it, I, I, I understand everybody's, I mean, we're talking about the basis, even if there's 18 and 18 inches, the square footage on this impacts, which thanks to Mr. Wilson's um, pictures show where there's a standing support now that the, the pickle grass and everything else is growing up around it. So it's not impacting that, especially if maybe if they set the concrete um, supports down a little bit deeper and then cover them with native soil it looks like they'll grow right up to the woods, the impacts. Um, and then to tell somebody, hey, you know something, we appreciate everything you've done. We don't like you. We'll give you five more years because our argument isn't very good to stop you. We asked, we asked questions that were answered. And now we're asking more questions. I mean, the answers, I mean, I, unless I heard Steve Lazar say something different, everything that was asked and answered, you know, we wanted to know about Caltrans. We wanted to know all of these things and and we're still trying to take somebody's and the thing is i don't think it's our point to say well i think he's making enough money so let's give him five years i mean for god's sakes i believe everybody when they tell us we make too much money sometimes so i'm I, i'm just saying for us to say that these guys are they're going to make enough money in five years they should be good i mean i'm I, I just can't believe we well, can be I, so willy-nilly about somebody's personal property rights on 18 holes that are 18 inches in diameter and the view shed looks at a bunch of mid-century houses and basically a clump of trees behind it from where you can see it from public lands. So, I mean, I mean I'm not saying I love billboards, but I, I do love property rights and I do love people working. I, I know that uh, Supervisor Bass wants to say something. I, I just want to say something too. I think if you're going down that road of saying you want to give them some time and, and then cutting it from 15 to, to five, it's really, I don't know, 
doesn't sit very well with me. I mean, I, I think I, uh, I, I see this as a, a non-conforming, as was des described by um, the director and Mr. Lazar. Um, I see that there was a robust discussion addressing all of the issues that I think were very fair to bring those up in the first case. But underlying this is a basic dislike of the billboard, but there's also the fact that non-conforming legal, illegal non-conforming is allowed. So I, I just think that five years is just, uh, you know, I could see maybe going 10 um, if that is an issue. I, I thought that even the 15 was putting kind of an end date on it when it could have been open-ended. So I'd like to see more discussion of that. Um, Supervisor Bass. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> it's kind of funny, you know, uh, Supervisor Wilson is coming from his frame of view. <clears throat> Supervisor Bone is coming from his. I look at it a little bit differently. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and part of this is like, uh, and I do think that I thank the folks for the emails, but yeah, the ones that are kind of like the the uh, multiple um, blank ones do get kind of like fill up the inbox and can be done differently. But anyway, um, you know, I look at this in a way that the rest of you don't, um, and that's a lot of it is uh, I support property rights. I get that. I also understand the concerns. As someone who I'm the only one on this board who spent time as a city elected and for the city of Eureka. And this billboard merry-go-round has been going on a very long time. So when I keep saying a comprehensive plan, we have to start somewhere. And I, I, I really think we need to look at it. Um, I would like to say yes to some term on this. Maybe it is 10 years, maybe not 15, I don't know. But I'd also like to be able to somehow see if we could get um, all three of them gone at the same time. And I know the rest of you aren't, I'm off a lot of people's Christmas list today. You know, I guess this is like, they're all email, it doesn't matter anymore. But, um, you know, I, 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 I have to recognize, even though it's not within the city's jurisdiction and it's right across the street, it is the city's gateway. So I know what it was like to sit on a board and have county stomp on the city, sorry to say, for, you know, 10 years. And I know what it feels like when they don't listen to you. And so I take this, this, I'm looking at this a little differently because I want to, I want a longer discussion. Um, having said that, <clears throat> you know, I'm not thinking somebody makes too much money. You know, I think people should be able to, and if I understand correctly, um, a couple of signs on the trail that we're, we are creating, um, I think it's coming up on a future agenda where um, I think it's also the same company is uh, receiving $600,000, I think for two signs for the term of till 2043. And, um, and yes, that does have a, a payback, but if a sign falls down, you know, that money's not there. So it's kind of like, you know, some people might think that that $600,000 is almost a gift of public funds if there's not a guarantee for you know payback. So I'm not trying to say someone peach did not make money. I'm just saying we need to look at it differently. I would um, you know I would be willing to up it to my personal self for you know 10 years if we could have a conversation of how we could um, perhaps see if there's a willingness to get the other two down. And maybe there's not. Maybe there's still more conversation that can be had though. If we don't have a comprehensive plan, we're going to have this fight over and over and over. And like I said, I feel like I've been on the uh, billboard merry ground for like 20 years or so, and I have to take a step somewhere. Okay, so I, I have closed public comment and I am about to close the public hearing. Um, however, I am going to give Mr. Rose, um, because this has, this is a significant discussion and uh, just a very short, if you want to say something, Mr. Wells, and then I will close the public hearing. I appreciate that. I just want to provide a little insight because there's uh, lots of numbers being talked about here. So the county. Uh, can can you yeah, speak up a little bit louder, please, Jeff? The county is in uh, 
uh, agreement to buy another parcel I had and in such, with billboards on it and in such we had to get a uh, professional appraisal done on that and the appraisal um, basically came to the determination that the fair market value of a billboard is a 5% cap rate, which equates to 20 years. So essentially what Mr. Wilson is suggesting here is that I have a vehicle that is worth $20,000 by appraisal and the county is now asking me to sell it for $5,000. So we have an appraisal done for the county that gives a price to these and a, a, a term to these. So 20 years is uh, what the, uh, the private appraisal came up with. I just wanna share that. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, the hearing is closed. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Supervisor Wilson, and then Supervisor and to respond Bond. to that, he doesn't own the car. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the right doesn't, isn't vested. I mean, that's kind of the point. Um, he's asking for the car, but we're, and we're trying to find out the terms by which we're willing to sell the car, but it doesn't, doesn't actually own it. Um, uh, that's why we're here. If, if it was a vested right, we wouldn't be here. Like that's kind of, that's, that's, that's kind of where, I, and, and to um, Virginia's request or kind of vision, I think of really looking at non-conforming billboards, you know, so that we end this merry-go-round as she talks about, I think is, is, I think is really great. I would definitely commit to sit down uh, with her uh, and, uh, and you know, pass this and really uh, deal with um, an ordinance that so many counties up and down the state already have in order to, so that we're just not asking ourselves over and over and over again, what, you know, what we're doing for non-conforming uses and how do we, how do we transfer out of non-conforming uses? Cause that's really what we're, that's why we did the general plan process was, you know, then now we have these non-conforming things that's we, said that we don't want you know, that we don't want these things in these areas and so we're this is these are the times these are the nexus when you move it move it along out of those non-conforming uses otherwise we would have uh, made this zoning commercial zoning to protect the vested use and so we didn't do that um, so I guess that, that's that's I mean that's kind of what I have to say that I, I, I still think that um, uh, again the that 20 year uh, time frame is pretty generous considering, uh, and again, we're talking, I can't actually talk about that, that other project because it's not on the agenda. So we really shouldn't be talking about it. But in any case, we're seeing what's happening to these things every time they, they fall down and they fall down often and we do need to get a handle on it. I think this sets a good precedent actually on how we might do that. Um, and uh, so, um, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Wilson. We have uh, Supervisor Bass and Supervisor Bond. But <laughs> first of all, Director Ford had his hand up. I'd like to hear from you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, so I, I just I'm, wanted to uh, identify um, an alternative that, um, although the, you do have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, there was some concepts brought up in terms of negotiating with the applicant to address all three billboards. That really can't be done in a public hearing. And that would, if that's something that the board is interested in pursuing, that would best be done with a continuance to allow those discussions to take place. So I didn't want to let that go by too fast. Okay, thank you. But I and I just want to ask, um, when we get into legal non-conforming or illegal or whatever it is, legal non-conforming, right. Um, I, I just worry about, um, Supervisor Wilson was talking about setting precedent. What about a, a house that falls down or or any other non legal non-conforming structures in the county? That concerns me greatly. And I know it concerns a lot of others. And, and so this this discussion you know, is around the fact that this is legal non-conforming. We need to be very careful how we move forward. Um, Supervisor Bass and then Supervisor Bond. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Um, I think as instead of just legal non-conforming, it is the location it is looking it's, it's in, 
But I think it's also, instead of legal non-conforming, it is for me the bigger question of what do we want the future of the, you know, the, the um, roads to look like when people come in, you know, where else can, maybe there's other places that billboards could go that don't, you know, may not have as much traffic. You know, I think of things to do, but I'm not saying that, you know, every legal non-conforming use um, is non-conforming use is bad. I'm just saying in this instance, I know where I have experienced and what I'd like to see happen in future years, you know, it probably won't be done by the time I'm gone, but eventually I think there will be a comprehensive plan. So I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to think ahead. But what I was going to ask John uh, Ford is if you could, uh, let's see, I know you talked about, um, you know, I mean, we've got the 15 year option also, but if we were to do a comprehensive plan and actually try to retire uh, different properties, I know that there is a, a financial piece that goes along with that um, to those property owners. And I don't know if you had time to think about what that type of program would look like. Um, but if you if you wanted to share your thoughts, that would be great, because I, I think it's a bigger picture. I'm really Very, happy to. And the, the first uh, thing that we'd want to think about is making sure that we don't get into a situation where we're buying a lot of building first. And that then is really a matter of giving people an amount of time to recoup their investment back to expectations. And, and there's two approaches to that. One would be to just circumscribe everything and the amortization period to be long enough to ensure that we don't encroach on that. Or another would be to work in more of a discretionary process for each sign um, to determine what's the amount of time necessary to recoup that investment. And um, from what I understand um, from uh, County Council's office, from Ms. Duke, and she can give more information on this, but it's highly variable mm -hmm. across the state how that's pursued. And so it would allow us to uh, take a look at what our circumstances are and what we want to accomplish and, and then to develop a program that would address that. It would not be immediate, but it could be done in, I don't, I, it wouldn't be immediate, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be 15 years either. I, I, I don't want to put a number in there that I, I, I get uh, locked into. Well, I, I don't expect immediate. I'm just trying to look and make sure that there is ways for the, um, property owners to be compensated. And I know it's like, it's not like we want to, you know, uh, how do we say, not trying to put someone out of business, but to make sure they are compensated. I, I look to different industries where things change over time. And sometimes they change, you know, say like with COVID and sometimes, you know, I just I think billboards while definitely are great along the highway in some places and I enjoy them actually and I liked the cow but I, I do think that you know we we did say in our general plan uh, but we would not have new ones and granted this is not a new one but I think we said we don't want new ones because eventually we didn't want any so you know it's it's tough I mean I I want to see if we can get that billboard up there I just I'm trying to look at the future and I'm having a hard time, um, but I'm, I'm happy to hear more comments. I mean. So Supervisor Ball? Well, and I know, because I know of a couple of non legal non-conforming houses that have burnt down, they've been permitted to rebuild in the same footprint. Um, I actually owned a little house on C Street 45 years ago in that same position. So I I, I know that's it. I, I, and this comes down, we just don't want the damn billboard where it's at. And I mean, there's 13 Caltrans signs lining the road next to it, but we need those to figure out where we have to turn. So 
Um, and as far as the property, Virginia, I mean, in all honesty, you know why City of Eureka owns that property across the street. That's where you, for 11 years, you guys put your sewer waste from the, the sewer sludge from the sewage treatment plant. You bought that to actually blend that in when that big blue truck was there. And now you can't do that anymore. And then I also, again, with the City of Eureka and referral to that, they've taken two entry signs into town. They used to have the Kiwanis, meeting times, rotary signs and everything else. And they've turned them into billboards for Eureka. Just Eureka. So it, I guess it's it works for them when it works and it doesn't work for them when it doesn't work. So I'm not worried about that as much, but I just think at the end of the day, the general plan said we wouldn't allow any more billboards. It didn't say anywhere in there that any chance we get to get rid of the old ones, that's what we're gonna do. I didn't know it was implied. It sounds like it was implied that we wanted to get rid of all of them. Um, I know Supervisor Wilson said he's got rid of, or they've got rid of 13 around the bay. We're soon to get rid of two more. Mm -hmm. Perfect, because they were blocking the bay view. But this does not, from the looks of the footings and everything else, and I, I'm just having a real hard time when we tell somebody to come back with answers and they come back with answers and they says, damn, those are good answers. Okay, how about this? So we've turned five questions into 20 questions. I'm scared if they come back with good answers to the next ones, what we're gonna think of then. I mean, there I know physically and aesthetically, there's a lot of people against this. <clears throat> and I wasn't on very many people's Christmas list, so I don't have to worry about that. But I'm, I, I, I think they've met their due diligence. I think they've met what we've asked of them and now we want more and I'm just, you know, five, 10, 15, we're, we're, de we're still dealing with somebody's personal property of something that's been there for 65 years that had its run. And I don't see where it has affected tidal wetlands. I, I don't see the environmental destruction of the last 65 years in those pictures because there's all sorts of stuff growing around it. And again, right next to it, you should go out there. And I, if you were there yesterday, you have a hard time breathing with exhaust fumes. Um, uh, debris from the road comes over the edge. You're only about 24 feet from the highway that has about 7,200 vehicle trips a day by it. So I, I, I don't really think I really think we're trying to make a whole bunch to justify getting rid of it. And I'm having a hard time doing this to a private business. So you guys do what you got to do, but I just, ah. You know, um, I got to reflect on that. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact that, I mean, I, I guess it's refreshing that we're actually talking to them or a lot of people don't want them. But we have to remember when this item came before us, we got a lot of people who were in support. And don't forget that. I mean, it's this really was kind of a split there. And uh, I don't forget that. And the other thing is, uh, I, I have a hard time saying, well, we'll, we'll this we'll deal with this one because here we have an opportunity to fulfill this uh, agenda that we have um, without really due process in a way. So from my perspective, this is falls within the legal parameters that exist today. If we wanna get into the future vision as uh, Supervisor Bass uh, spoke of, we need to do that. But do we need to do it on the back of all points? Do we need to do it on the back of uh, somebody who now has a directive from Caltrans to get that sign up there or he loses his permit. So I just want to really re remind everybody what we're dealing with here. Um, Supervisor Bass. Thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chair. One, I'm actually kind of offended. I'm not trying to get rid of private business. I want to help. That's why I want to make this a comprehensive plan and figure out what we can do. Five years, I don't know if five years enough, but quite frankly, you know, for this billboard, it's 
you know, how much does it cost to put it up? I mean, we're talking future earnings and I get that. But at the same time, you know, we have to think of, I think the bigger picture. And I, I, this, I'm, I'm struggling with this. You know, I usually try to find the happy medium and I was trying to come up with a, you know, messy, miserable medium. And, you know, I was, I was hopeful that um, we could find something. And so maybe my question for John Ford is, um, is it worth you going back and having, trying to have more conversations with him about what could be suitable? And I mean, I don't know if we want to go there because the way I'm looking at this right now, it probably won't be built if, if this vote happens at this moment. And I, I'd hate to see that happen because I think five years would do better than nothing at all. But I'm also, you know, want your opinion on that. Through the chair, I, I can't speak to whether or not it would result in, in something that could be brought back to the board that would satisfy all the discussions here. Um, so I, I, I certainly can't commit to that. Um, there's only one way to find out though, and that's to have the dialogue. I mean, perhaps 10 years is, is the better number for that through the dialogue. I don't know, but I hate to keep putting him off. Uh, Supervisor Wilson. I mean, from my perspective, I think that if we move ahead with what's proposed, the applicant can submit an, a, a proposal to change that. Um, uh, if it's comprehensive and there's nothing that will that would stop them from doing that and those conversations occurring and I think they would be more robust um, if we have some parameters for which we for where we're starting that conversation um, and so I think that it's fine I, with regards to the split I think it's in, I mean in terms of like the there was people for and against the this particular billboard but what we really don't see a split on is whether people are for or against more billboards I mean and the trajectory there are many people who want no billboards and go all the way over there but there's nobody that wants more right and that speaks to the cumulative trajectory that we're supposed to be trying to represent in this in this case and I mean nobody sure there's a few people out there that would like to have more billboards but really that is just time and uh, time again. We know that's unpopular. As a matter of fact, it's in the staff report. It's stated in the staff report that people don't want more billboards. And so uh, I would say that, you know, that split is, you know, while finite in this case, it's not split in terms of the trajectory that we're trying to represent in terms of the community. Um, I, I think, I, I think, I mean, like, again, I got, all, of course, I could go into the details of all this other junk, but I, I think, I think, I think we're there. Um, okay, so we, we could have gone back and forth. I have not heard from Supervisor Madrone at all on this item. I'd like to hear your thoughts if you would please, Supervisor Madrone. Sure, no, I'm happy to share. I'm just trying to listen to everybody's concerns and comments and uh, working on the listening skills, right? Um, well, I'm certainly one of those, like many, that don't want to see more billboards. Um, I do think there's a lot more wetland values there than have been identified. I, uh, I'm i not really supportive of that. I mean, the five years, you know, for me, I would rather vote no right now and not uh, rebuild these and work with the owners of remaining billboards in high scenic view areas and wetlands uh, in a comprehensive plan like Supervisor Bass said. I very much support that idea, that concept and moving that forward. And uh, hey, I was on a city council once too. <laughs> it was a long time ago, <laughs> 35 years ago, but uh, I have been in a city position uh, in the past. And and we had issues with the county back then too, definitely very different than, than Eureka's, but uh, that's certainly been an issue. So, you know, I'm just, I'm looking for a way to move us forward on, you know, finding a way to perhaps buy these areas out, add them into the wetlands basis and the uh, 
you know, like the property across the highway have been and things like that. And, and in that way, the landowners can get some value for, for their property. Uh, but from my perspective, I'm, I'm not really supportive of rebuilding this billboard. Thank you, Supervisor Madrone. Um, Supervisor Wilson? Well, I'm gonna reach reach across there, uh, Supervisor Madrone, since you're, <laughs> since we're trying to get to three here and and understand that I too am, you know, I, I don't really come into this wanting to rebuild a billboard that doesn't have a vested right. Um, I think that that's uh, not there, but I do think that, uh, and, I, I do think that that um, we don't have three votes to do that here today. And I mean, just being really clear and direct, you know. And so from my perspective, uh, five years gets us to a place where the impacts are temporary. They're monitorable from a perspective of, you know, the, they're within a time frame that people can re remember and know and put on our calendar right now. And it will be in somebody's calendar to, to deal with it. Um, and we can and we can uh, move forward. Um, that I just I just feel like that's that's where we're at, and so that's why I'm putting that out as a compromise. And so I'm I'm asking uh, that you, that you might might come over to to help us get past this. And then with that is a is a is a is again my commitment to uh, really sit down with Supervisor Bass to talk about um, a, a real ordinance uh, that deals with non-conforming, and we'll just say it, non-conforming billboards uh, in um, and the trajectory of what that is and to codify what the process is that we're gonna do to, to move us in that direction uh, as per many other um, coastal Needs have already done. And we're just as kind of go, right? And then it would be all easy and we wouldn't have to think about it and there would have been a process and those sorts of things. But we just haven't done it. I'm really willing to sit down and do that. And so um, I just, I'm hoping that we can end this torture uh, of this one today. <laughs> so we can move on to something. Madam Chair, through the chair. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, yes, uh, super, Supervisor Madrone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, I certainly appreciate that. I agree. I don't see three votes for denial here today. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty clear. Um, but if the 10 year person comes to five, I'll come from zero to five. You know, we can get this done right now. I'm not happy about that. But really, I want to focus on the future and that plan. Um, and I have experienced this myself. I, when I bought my property in 1986, it had a non-conforming legal uh, cabin on it that was almost falling down. And I had to get a special permit to rebuild that. That required a public hearing and a fee. But before I applied for the public hearing, I went around to my neighbors and I asked every, what do you think? I would like to rebuild that cabin. Same footprint, same square footage, same place. And they all said, wow, that's great. That's an eyesore, it's a fire hazard. That'd be wonderful. So I got my permit, you know, and I know that's very different than this billboard, but you know, there are many non-conforming things in the county. And I went through that process myself and was lucky enough to get my permit to rebuild my cabin. But um, at any rate, uh, 10 to five, zero to five, let's get it done. Let's move on with our business. Well, so I, 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 you know, I have to say that I'm not really into transactional decision making. Um, I can see uh, the 10 years gives the um, the applicant a chance, and I think that the discussion that you're proposing in, in for in, in terms of the future will take some time. Um, and uh, should that come to pass, then there will there just time is definitely going to just get eaten up on this issue just we all know this we're involved um it be i just don't imagine that five years will do anything for them i mean i i just don't know and so that's what's what makes it difficult for me is like is uh you know it almost seems like just saying no to say five years whereas 10 years 15 years was already a limitation so I'm just saying to, to be somewhat generous, to say, you know what? Okay, 
we could have gone uh, higher, but we'll, we'll make it 10. I, I would feel okay with that. That's kind of where I'm at. Well, I'll test our, our rules at the board. Supervisor Bone? You don't, your mic isn't on. So I'm reading the staff report and I, I see something in the back that I don't even know has been run by the applicant of 15 years and I and I didn't see any acceptance of that. And I I agree with everybody and Virginia and everybody else. Let's 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 all have a kumbaya. No new billboards. I agree with that. But we're talking about giving a seven and a half percent bump to these guys. They've been here 65 years, and they haven't caused any. I, I want to see. Everybody says what can happen. I want to see what has happened, and nobody. And Mike was out there, and I mean, many people have been out there. What damage has been done on the environment is none. And I just, I, I, I just think that we're legal non-conforming use. We, we approve. I mean, Supervisor Madrone just came in, and he but probably. I don't think he got. I don't think he had to have the rules changed on him four times till. And then finally, I, I don't know. I back then, if they would have said, well, 1986, you can rebuild it, but you have to move out in 2001. I don't know if that would have been accepting because then he couldn't have his all his family up there. So I applaud him, but I think we're at the same point with this is I'm looking at what is informed of, and, and we haven't even talked to the applicant. And I've got a question for um, Director Ford. If we they answered all the questions we asked of them and then we deny it again, are we open to the, um, billboard um, getting sued on this for, for this. I mean, is there is there an open for litigation? I know we've got threats of litigation from all the other groups. Can these guys actually come back since they've met all the criteria we asked of them? Can we be um, subject to a lawsuit for this one billboard to deny it? And all of a sudden now we're saying, no, you can't have it. And we want you to take the other ones down too. I mean, I'm damn. Well, I will say we can be sued for anything. Nothing prevents totally people from filing lawsuits. But in terms of answering the question, I think that really is better answered by uh, county council's office. Is better answered by uh, county council's office. Okay, uh, Council Miles, do you have any thoughts on that? There is a possibility that a lawsuit could be filed. Um, like Director Ford said, there's always a possibility that, that a lawsuit could be filed. And I'm, uh, Mr. Miles, I'm not worried about locally. I'm worried about the outdoor um, sign association. When we make these precedent setting decisions, them stepping in and saying, hey, you know, this is, this could affect 80 other billboards or thousands of, I don't know. And I guess that's just speculation. I'm sorry. Supervisor Baston and Supervisor Madrone. Oh yeah, please, uh, Director Ford. I was just going to say, I think one of the things, Supervisor Bond, to be more direct, is is that the billboard has fallen down. So in order for the billboard to be considered vested to continue on as a legal billboard, it needs this special permit. Without it, it has no vesting right. So to not approve this takes away nothing. The time you get sued and are fundamentally liable is when you don't do something appropriately or you take something away from somebody that should be considered a right. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Bass. And then Supervisor Madrone. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I hear what Supervisor Supervisor Bowen said on president setting. It sounded like he was counting the entire state in him because I'm sure there have been 
thousands have been taken out of service. And there are many communities who have been doing this. Alameda did it, not that I'm saying we ever want to be like Alameda, but they did it like 40 years ago. So this is not something new that communities, I mean, there's, there's moving forward, not even talking about today's um, one, but it's, uh, I, have, I, I have a suspicion that <clears throat> all billboard, and there's probably like an organization where they could talk about this. And I just think we're not the only one who is looking to make a longer term change in billboards, you know? And so it's like, it is hard because we obviously haven't done it in the last 20 years it's been talked about. Maybe this isn't the time either, but it's not like it's um, some brand new thing that no one else has done. So I am, I guess I'm a little um, less worried about the precedent setting of that in regards to the item. Supervisor Madrell. Yes, uh, well, you know, it seems like the discussion is just repeat, we're repeating ourselves over and over and over again in order to try and win uh, with somebody else's vote or, or whatever. And, uh, and as we do that, it devolves into accusations and digs at each other and all kinds of stuff that just gets very unprofessional. So I would suggest that we ought to call the question, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Madrone. Uh, any other comments or uh, discussion of this item? Okay, um, let's go so, to, uh, yeah, go ahead, Supervisor Bond. So we're gonna vote on a proposal we made um, without any input from the applicant. We're just gonna put this on them because I'm, we, we brought this 5, 10, 15 and I haven't heard from Mr. Slack or Mr. Willis. I mean, it may be a, you know, I mean, I, I, I do they do they deserve that after all these speeches? Or? Well, we did if not, close the, the public vote. hearing. Um, so I, I'll just uh, ask Council Miles, um, given the nature of this, is it appropriate to ask Mr. Slack, who has his hand up? <clears throat> The public hearing has been closed, so I do not believe it would be appropriate to go back to the opponent at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with that, um, Ryan, if you will call the vote, please. Yeah, and I just, my my understanding of the vote or the motion is is to grant the permit for five years on this billboard. Um, that's my understanding of it. There was some additional recommendations from staff at the beginning of this hearing. And I don't know if that's included in the motion and I don't know if the rest of the staff recommendations are included. So if I could just get a little clarification, that would be helpful. Thank you, Ryan. I agree with you. There were issues about indemnification, et cetera. Um, uh, Director Ford. Thank you, Chair Fennell. Yes, I, I just basically wanted to clarify that the uh, recommendation as we understood the motion to be would basically be the alternative number one and rather than that being 15 years that's five years and so the time frames would be reduced from 15 to 5 from july 28th to july 2025 and july 2024 20, uh, and march 1st of 2025 and then that would also include the requirement to sign the indemnification agreement as a condition of approval. And that's it. Okay. Yeah. Um, Supervisor Wilson. I just want to clarify about um, do do you need? I mean, what I heard from um, from uh, Mr. Lazar was the request for modification, potential modifications to findings. And um, do you need those or do you want to bring back findings at a later date in order to modify that? Or do you need us to to offer uh, to offer something else? 
Under the circumstances at five years, I think it would be worthwhile for us to modify if we're given the opportunity to modify the findings and enhance the findings based on the discussion. Okay. Set it for five years in light of the other things that the board has articulated or to include those in the motion and then bring it back. I think that would be an excellent um, idea. Okay, and do you have language that you have prepared that you think will work in terms of modified findings that that um, I can give to uh, Mr. Sharp? Um, I, I don't right now have things that I would feel comfortable with because one of the things I'd like to do is incorporate the uh, ideas and, and comments that were made by the board today on the record mm -hmm. and and address those. And I, I didn't get that. Don't have those. I, I don't have those. Okay. So do you want to then bring back, we'll leave on this today if, if this happens. Um, and then, uh, then you will bring back findings, um, basically on consent at a later date. So, yeah, what I would, um, the way you could structure this motion is to make it a motion of intent with direction to bring back findings for the board's action on consent. Yeah, that's, that's my, that's my motion is to bring back findings with the board's motion on consent. Okay, is, are you okay with is that, that now, Ron? So we're, we're, that's just added on, correct, John? We're, we're, we're still approving alternative recommendation number one with the modified dates as, as you discussed, and then we're adding on that piece that you just discussed as well? Yes, and we will bring back modified, uh, modified resolution uh, reflecting the findings of the board to reduce the uh, approval period to five years, articulating why. Yes, uh, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I understand that. So the resolution will be coming back at a different meeting, the resolution that's attached to this. Well, we won't yeah. be doing anything with that. Well, and the final, the fi everything will come back, the final approval <laughs> date. I, and I would also recommend that this be continued to the meeting of September 29th to a date certain and we will bring it back as one package and and that will be the the final action date <clears throat> i i understand that if the motion maker and the seconder are okay with that i'm fine with it okay okay so i will uh i'll begin the roll call vote Yes. Supervisor Bass. Yes. Supervisor Bone. Oh. Supervisor Wilson. Yes. And Supervisor Fennell. No. So it passes three two. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, just for the record, I'm glad that they get to at least have that up there for five years, but just for the reasons stated, that's how I voted. So thank you. That closes the public hearing, and we now are going back into closed session. Uh, we have uh, three out, uh, standing items. How long do we think? Those three items will go. Uh, Chair Fennell, maybe 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Okay. Thank you very much, Sierra Nielsen. Okay. We'll be going into closed session and we'll be back uh, hopefully by about four o'clock. Thank you. On, I'm going to ask um, CAO Nielsen to report out on item number L3.
when she's when she's had a chance to join us and then we still need a we are we we have a quorum yeah you have a quorum and um, cao nelson is is in the in the meeting we'll just wait for her to um when she's ready. So, okay. When CEO Nielsen is um, ready to join us, we'll have uh, CEO Nielsen report out on item L3. There is nothing to okay. report. Can I go? Yes, please. There is nothing to report out on item L3. Thank you, CEO Nielsen. And then we have um, L2. And uh, L5 and uh, Councillor Billingsley. Yes, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> On item L2, the board voted unanimously one to authorize the human resources director to enter into a contract with Wendy Brown Creative Partners for an executive search for the public health officer. And number two, authorize the CAO and human resources director to enter into mutual aid agreements for regional collaboration on public health officer issues if necessary. On item L5, the board voted unanimously to authorize the human resources di director to conduct an executive search for the position of director of library services. Thank you, uh, Council Billingsley. And that's all, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.